Welcome to Cobalt Fairy YouTube channel. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube. An Unconventional Bride for the Rancher by Cassidy Hanton Chapter 1 Charlene Charlene Quinn glanced around and down from the short ladder she stood upon. Hello, Jean. You look excited about something. She continued her work. Stacking neatly folded men's shirts on the tall shelf behind the store's counter. There hadn't been a customer inside the general mercantile for an hour. But Charlene was seldom idle. If she had nothing to stack, she cleaned. If the store was clean, she worked the books. When customers entered the store, she waited on them. Helped them find exactly what they needed. Then took their money. Even now. As Jean Maple. Her employer, stood inside the store gazing up at her. She didn't pause in her work. Have you heard the news? Jean asked her. The old mill ranch has been sold. No, I hadn't heard. Charlene replied. I'm not surprised, though. It's a very nice piece of property. She heard Jean huff. Nice, yes. But the exciting part is the new owner. Charlene examined her handiwork, then nodded in satisfaction. Backing her way down the ladder, careful not to step on the hem of her skirt, she reached the wooden floor. Turning, she dusted her hands together, gazing at Jean, who stood watching her with an enigmatic smile. So, what is so intriguing about this new owner? Charlene asked. Only that he is by far the best looking man I have ever seen in my life. Jean exclaimed, with an almost girlish giggle. What am I? Called a voice from the office behind the curtain. A piece of moldy bacon? Jean waved her hands even though the speaker couldn't see the dismissive gesture. The best looking man I have ever seen that I am not married to. Much better. Charlene didn't smile as she usually did at the exchange between Jean and her husband, Harold who worked with the invoices and arranged for new orders to be shipped from the manufacturers in the store's small office. She cared little for the gleam of anticipation in Jean's eyes as the older women still watched her closely. I know that look, Jean. She said, her tone a warning. You're about to tell me he is single. Aren't you? How did you guess that? Charlene shook her head then went to the box on the counter to retrieve more shirts to add to the shelf above. I'm quite familiar with the look in your eyes when hatching your matchmaking plots. Jean huffed again, indignant. There are plenty of eligible men in this town. And you refuse to even look at them. If you are not going to think about catching a husband, then I will. Oh, so you're going to marry a second husband? Harold asked from the office. What a novel idea. I thought it was men who were supposed to marry multiple wives. Harold Maple. Mind your own affairs. Yes, ma'am. Charlene, come down that ladder this instant. I refuse to talk to your back. Charlene sighed. While she didn't exactly return down to the floor, she did turn halfway around to gaze down at Jean. Thank you for worrying about my future, Jean. But I can't be concerned with meeting new men or getting married. Mother needs me too much. Jean set her hands on her ample hips, shaking her head. She pursed her lips in a mood of consternation. I know your mother needs you. Just know there are others in this town. Including myself and Harold. Speak for yourself. Who will help in looking after her? You must think of your future dear. You are such a beautiful girl and would make some lucky man a wonderful wife. Thank you for worrying about us, Jean. Charlene said, climbing back up the ladder with her bundle of merchandise. You and Harold have done so much for us already. Aha. Uh -huh. At last, I get some credit around here. Harold Maple, for the last time. Mind your own business and stop eavesdropping. It's the height of bad manners. It's hardly eavesdropping when your voices are so loud. 
Now, Charlene did grin as she piled the neatly folded shirts on the shelf. She loved the two of them, Harold and Jean Maple, who owned the general store, and who gave her employment when she desperately needed it. In return for their generosity and the salary she received, Charlene worked long hours six days a week, to the point that Jean occasionally complained of not having enough to do. Still, Jean had her two young sons to contend with, and often told Charlene how grateful she was for the extra time Charlene's work provided her to spend with them. At ages 10 and 12, both Matt and Ben kept her busy as they grew older, expanding their horizons and making new friends with the other children around the small town of Bandera, Texas. Jean picked up the box of shirts and handed them up to Charlene, enabling her to work faster without climbing up and down the ladder. The new fellow in town is Tyler Price. Jean commented, giving her a pile of shirts. That's nice. I'm sure he will be dropping by the store. That mill ranch is a little run down, habitable. But could use some fixing up. Uh, huh. Did I mention he is single? Yep. Give it up, Jean. Harold called. Our little girl isn't interested. Charlene glanced down to see Jean glowering up at her. He is quite the catch, Missy. And plans to expand the ranch and raise cattle. You could do far worse. Are there any more shirts in that box? Charlene inquired politely. In disgust, Jean set the box down on the counter. It's time for lunch. Go on home and eat, tell your mother I said hello. I will. Charlene climbed back down, offering Jean a small grin as she headed toward the door. Back in an hour. The little bell over the door chimed musically as she went out, gently closing the door behind her. Early summer had arrived in the beautiful hill country of South Texas, along with its rising heat and humidity that tended to last from early April all the way to October. Even though the bright sunlight blasted down on her bare head as Charlene walked down the wooden sidewalk toward home, the heat level hadn't risen to the point where it was uncomfortable to be outside. The street bustled with the comings and goings of people getting to their destinations. Some walked, some rode on horseback and some drove in wagons or small buggies. Some waved and called hello as they passed her. And Charlene returned their gestures. Several matrons admonished her for not wearing her sunbonnet outdoors. Charlene promised to put it on immediately. The small house she shared with her mother stood at the end of the street. A tidy white clapboard structure with blue trim and a tiny yard. They lived rent-free, a charity gift from Harold and Jean Maple, who owned the house. She opened the gate in the white picket fence and walked up the steps to the porch. Charlene stopped at the top, closed her eyes, and took a deep breath before she turned the knob on the door. It was the same greeting as any other day. Her mother, Olivia Quinn, sat in her rocking chair near the hearth staring into the cold ashes. She had wrapped a shawl around her thin frame. Her face was gaunt as though starved. Her gray and brown hair was hanging in thin wisps to her shoulders. Charlene made certain she ate well. But nothing seemed to put weight on her mother's skinny body. Kissing Olivia's cheek, Charlene asked, Are you hungry, mother? I'll make us some beef and bacon sandwiches. Why are you wearing a shawl? Are you cold? Olivia glanced up, a tiny smile creasing her face. I like it around me dear. How are things at the store? Striding toward the small kitchen, Charlene spoke over her shoulder. Jean is playing matchmaker again. With whom? She heard the chair creak as Olivia rose stiffly from it and shambled in Charlene's wag. Her mother was not old by the years she had lived. Yet she had become an aged woman under the weight of terrible heart-wrenching grief. She hardly left the house, refused to attend church services, and performed only a few basic household chores. Charlene hadn't the heart to demand more from her mother. Some gentleman who bought the mill place. Charlene replied, retrieving plates from the cupboard. And according to Jean, he is Adonis himself. Shuffling to the table, Olivia sat down with a sigh. You should think about getting married, dear. 
Don't you start, mother. Charlene said, cutting slices from the leftover beef roast and from a loaf of bread. Jean is like a dog fussing over a bone, she won't stop. She just wants what is best for you. The Maples have been very kind to us. Making the sandwiches, Charlene felt her own grief rise. Close to her throat. And wondered what might have been if their loved ones hadn't died. Then, there won't be anyone to look after you. I will be all right, dear. No, you won't. You wouldn't need if I wasn't here to supervise. Charlene would never speak that thought aloud to her mother. And squashed her grief. I guess I'm just not ready to be married. Charlene set the plates on the table then filled two glasses of cold water from the hand pump at the sink. She handed one to Olivia, then sat down to her own lunch. Olivia nibbled at her meal, tears filling her brown eyes. I am such a burden. She whispered. Never say that, mother. Charlene insisted, her fears for Olivia growing. I like taking care of you. But you work so hard. Olivia set her sandwich down and stared at it. Nearly every day at the store. Then you come home and look after the house, the laundry, the cooking. I should help more, but I have no energy for anything. It's all right. Charlene replied, gesturing toward her uneaten lunch. Now, eat. Please. Olivia nodded and picked it up to take a small bite. What else did Jean say about the new member of our community? Not much. Just that he plans to run cattle, and she thought he might stop by the store. Olivia nodded. It is the only general store in the area. The next closest one is in San Antonio. Then I'm sure I'll be meeting him soon enough. Charlene said and took another bite of her sandwich. If Mr. Price is searching for a wife, I bet some other girl in town will catch his interest. Olivia smiled. There are none as pretty as you. Charlene waved her hand. There's more to a relationship than looks, mother. One must be interested to qualify, and I, for one, do not have that qualification. TSK, dear. I really must do something about that attitude of yours. I'm an adult. Charlene replied crisply, finishing her lunch. I can have an attitude if I want. Picking up her empty plate, she set it in the sink. Then drank her water and set the glass beside it. Turning, she found her mother had eaten most of her sandwich and nodded with satisfaction. Jean mentioned sending an apple pie home with me. She said, we can have some for dessert tonight. How does that sound? Very good. Now you run along, and I will clean up. Thank you, mother. Charlene kissed Olivia's cheek again. And strode out of the kitchen toward the door. Knowing she may come home later to clean dishes or may find them just where she left them. It all depended upon how Olivia felt at any given moment. Though Charlene admitted to herself. Her mother usually did do what she said she would do. Remembering to grab her sunbonnet before walking out the door. She donned it and tied the ribbon under her chin. Though she hadn't used up the flour the maples gave her for her lunch. She strode quickly back to the store, checking off in her mind the task she needed to accomplish that afternoon. Toying absently with her thick braid of red hair. Charlene glanced up to see an unusual sight in front of the apple tree. The Maples General Store. A buckboard wagon, drawn by two mouse-colored mules, stood outside it in the street. A gaggle of women crowded around it. Charlene slowed her pace to watch. Now what could they be staring at? She wondered aloud. It's the new feller. Charlene half turned to find Sheriff Victor Barker riding his dun gelding up beside her. A tall man with thick, iron-gray hair. And a mustache that drooped to his chin. He tipped his hat to her. Then his sharp blue eyes flicked to the crowd. Turning his head. He spat a wad of tobacco on the far side of his horse. Them gals seemed to think he'd be a good-looking feller. Me, I wouldn't know. Charlene scoffed. Handsome as as handsome does. That to be true, Miss Quinn. How's your ma doin'? Well enough, 
I suppose. She eats, but doesn't gain an ounce of weight. Still has no energy. Grief be an evil creature, young lady. And don't you forget it. You both have been through a lot. You are very kind, Sheriff. We both appreciate what you, the Maples and other folks in town have done for us. Just being neighborly. He tipped his hat again. Then nudged his horse down the street at a quiet amble. Charlene walked on, bemused by the crowd waiting outside the apple tree. Striding amid them, smiling a little, saying politely. Excuse me. From time to time, she made her way through the dozen or so women to the door. They, for the most part, were of her own age at twenty-two, some older, some younger. And not all of them were single. Ducking her head, she opened the door on the bell's little jingle. And quickly closed the door behind her. Jean, did you see? Looking up, Charlene stopped dead in her tracks. Talking to Jean and Harold he turned at the sound of her voice. His looks were beyond striking. Tall with the grace of a hunting cougar. She swallowed hard. Eyes the color of dark storm clouds pierced through her, sleek black hair hung to his shoulders from under a wide-brimmed hat. Broad shoulders beneath his brown coat appeared impossibly strong, his cheekbones high, his nose like a hawk's. Taking a step forward, Charlene almost fell down in a swoon. Chapter 2 Tyler immediately swept his hat from his head. Offering the young lady a short bow, he said. Good afternoon, miss. His heart raced. Never before had he seen a girl of such raw beauty. A creature that appeared so delicate, and yet unearthly strong. Large hazel eyes and a heart-shaped face stared into his for a long moment. Her red hair hung in a thick braid over her shoulder to her hip. And he swore her waist was so tiny he could fit both his hands around it. The girl returned a quick, polite curtsy, then walked toward them. Um, there's a... She began, half turning to point toward the door. Mrs. Maple hustled from behind the counter, beaming. And settled her arm around the girl's shoulders before she could finish her sentence. Charlene, I want you to meet someone. Guiding the girl toward him, she went on. This is Mr. Tyler Price, he is new in town. Mr. Price, this is Miss Charlene Quinn, who works for us. Tyler gently squeezed the small hand held out to him in formal greeting. His lips quirked upward. A pleasure to meet you, Miss Quinn. Likewise, Mr. Price. Mr. Price recently moved to Bandera. Mrs. Maple continued brightly. Isn't that so? Yes, ma'am. Tyler replied, unable to take his eyes off the girl, despite how rude it was. I purchased an old ranch by the Medina River. Miss Quinn nodded. The mill ranch. Yes, it is a very nice piece of land. Now if you will excuse me, I really should be working. Good day, Mr. Price. She offered a brief nod and no smile. He watched her vanish behind the curtain and into the back room. And could not help but admire her grace of movement. The gentle sway of her hips under her skirt. That is one fine-looking lady. He turned back to Mr. and Mrs. Maple, and found both eyeing him. Mr. Maple with amusement, Mrs. Maple with calculation. Ah. He said, clearing his throat. Where were we? You were in the midst of placing your order for supplies. Mr. Maple said, grinning faintly. So far I have coffee, beans, salt, sugar, flour. What else? Uh. Tyler forced himself to redirect his thoughts back to the matter at hand. And not on Miss Gwen's petite backside. Yes, do you have nails? Yes, sir. Come in ten pound sacks. One of those and a hammer. The shingles are loose on the ranch house's roof. Continuing down his mental list of everything he needed, Tyler finally felt satisfied that he had everything. Feeling a bit uncomfortable under Mrs. Maple's scrutiny. He paid for his goods. Then took what was immediately available out to his buckboard. Fetching a deep sigh. He noted the women of the town still lingered around the front of the store. 
he tried a smile. Ladies. Several giggled, covering their lips with their hands as he stowed his belongings in the wagon. Mr. Price? He turned, finding a young lady in a pink sunbonnet near his elbow. Staring up at him as though she gazed at the Lord himself. She stuck out her hand for his shake. I'm Marcia Taylor. It's good to meet you. He tipped his hat. The pleasure is all mine, Miss Taylor. Though she was pretty, as were most of these women who hoped to attract his attention, he noted not one could hold a candle to Miss Quinn. While she did not appear exactly cold toward him, nor did she appear welcoming, either. He recognized the stunned look in her eyes when she first set them on him. Tyler knew his looks generated a great deal of comment and admiration from women. Having long since grown a thick skin when it came to that aspect of himself, he did his best to ignore it. He considered it just a part of him. Like having two hands and two feet. And only when he was younger did his own handsomeness and women throwing themselves at him go to his head. However, at times like these when having women crowd around him, staring, did he start to become annoyed. He and Mr. Maple were forced to carry his sacks of goods through a pack of females who did not seem inclined to give way. Finally, Mr. Maple had had enough, to Tyler's amusement. Ladies. The shopkeeper said, his voice carrying. Now unless you are planning to go inside and buy a trinket or a bolt of cloth for my wife, you are loitering in front of my store. Please move along. With disappointed mutters, the small crowd dispersed, smiling at him over their shoulders. They wandered back down the street, talking and laughing among themselves. Tyler shook his head. Sorry about that. Did you invite them? Tyler gazed at the heavy-set Mr. Maple with brown hair and silver at his temples and grinned. No, sir. Then it's not your fault. Come on, let's get the rest of your supplies loaded. Under Mrs. Maple's watchful eye, her chestnut hair also lined with tendrils of gray, Tyler carried sacks of his goods over his shoulder to toss into the buckboard. Wishing the delightful Miss Quinn would show herself again, Tyler was not so lucky in that regard. The Maples had informed him she had worked for them for the last year and a half. And they loved her as they would their own daughter. There you are, Mr. Price. Mr. Maple said as they threw the last sack onto the pile. Tyler, please. The other man grinned as they shook hands. Harold. A right pleasure, Harold. Give my regards to your missus. I will. And to Miss Quinn. Tyler climbed into the seat of the buckboard, picked up his reins, and released the handbrake. He eyed Harold sidelong. Beautiful girl, he said, his tone neutral. Might make a man a good wife. Harold said, the grin still on his face, his hands in his pockets. Should a man be so inclined? Good to know. Tyler touched his fingers to his hat brim in a quick salute. Harold. Whistling through his teeth at the mules, he slapped their rumps with the reins. They started off down the dirt-packed main street at a quick trot. Carrying him past the bank, the assayer's office, the hotel. A huge white sprawling building. Yet, before he reached the end of town, heading toward his new home. A man on a rangy dun gelding blocked his path. Whoa! Tyler called to the mules, reining them in. He recognized the star badge on the man's leather vest. Can I help you? The sheriff reined the horse around beside his seat, sticking out his hand. Victor Barker, Mr. Price. He said as Tyler accepted his hand to shake. Thought to stop and introduce myself. Care for a beer before you head on back to your place? Only if you're buying. I am. Turning the mule team around in the middle of the street, Tyler followed Sheriff Barker back down the street to the saloon. Reining them in, he jumped down from the buckboard's high seat and tied the lead mule's bridle to the post. Following Barker into the dim and cool saloon, he breathed in the odors of sawdust and beer. Listening to the piano player pound out a song he didn't recognize. Beer, please. Barker called out as they crossed the dingy wood flooring. Leading him to a table, Barker sat down and placed his hat on the stainwood planks. 
Tyler did the same as the barmaid brought them two foaming beers and tall mugs. The sheriff dropped a few coins into her hand and watched her return to the bar. After taking a long draft of his beer, Barker said, It be a right hot day, Mr. Price. Tyler. And yes it is. I hear it isn't even as hot as it will get in these parts. Call me Vic. Barker went on, nodding his silver head. Yes, sir, you came to one of the hottest regions in Texas. Good thing I like the heat. Tyler said, drinking his beer with gulps. Bandera seems like a nice town. Good ranching community. That it is. Victor gave him a long look from rather piercing blue eyes. Where do you hail from, Tyler? Colorado, mostly. Spent a few years in West Texas, El Paso, then decided to move here. The ranch I bought came dirt cheap, as you may have heard. So, you're looking to settle down? Raise a family? Tyler sat back in his chair with a grin. Are you headed somewhere with this, Vic? Lots of nice girls in Bandera, Tyler. Victor replied, his tone bland, and sipped his beer. Why do I get the idea you're pointing me toward one or two in particular? Victor shrugged, nonchalant. I ain't. But I can give you the skinny on a few of our single misses should you be so. Well, let's say, interested. All right. Tyler leaned his arms on the table. Let's us pretend that I am indeed searching for a wife, hypothetical like. So. Tell me about Charlene Quinn. Victor nodded and drank his beer. Very good choice to start with. Lovely girl, comes from a good family. But a terrible shame. What terrible shame? About a year and a half ago, I believe it was. Victor replied, lowering his voice slightly, his eyes on Tyler's. The Quinn family ranch house caught fire. Of Mr. and Mrs. Quinn and their three children, only Mrs. and Miss Quinn survived. Oh, Lord. Yep. Victor nodded. Dan Quinn and their two boys, Dan Jr. and Russell, all died. Mrs. Quinn sits in the house at the end of town, moping. While Charlene works her fingers to the bone to support her. What happened to their ranch, their land? Bank took it. Now all the Quinn women have is each other. Tyler stared at the wooden wall of the saloon, trying to imagine losing half his family. And it brought back the tearing sense of loss when he thought of Mary. That is so sad. Yep. Sure is. I met Miss Quinn. Tyler went on not looking at Victor out of fear his penetrating gaze might decipher what lay in Tyler's head. She seems like a strong lady. That she is. Victor agreed, setting his empty mug on the table. Little gal like that, losing her dad and her brothers, making sure her mother don't want for nothing. The Maples, them that run the general store. They own that house the Quins live in, won't take a dime for rent. That is good of them. They seem like good, kind people. That they are, Tyler. That they are. Tyler eyed him over the rim of his mug. So, if I were interested, hypothetically, in finding a missus, who else can you tell me about? Victor pulled his pocket watch from his vest and squinted myopically down at it. Look at the time, Tyler. We done shouted all my time away. You sat right there and finish your beer and have a safe trip back to your place. Rising, Victor settled his hat on his head and then patted him on the shoulder as he walked from their table. He strode from the saloon, leaving Tyler to chuckle into his beer. Now that was a pointed discussion, you old geezer. He muttered. Finishing, Tyler stood up and put his hat back on. Then headed out into the blinding sunlight after the dim interior of the saloon. Squinting. He untied his mule from the post. Then climbed up into the buckboard seat. Taking a moment to look toward the apple tree store. He caught a rapid glimpse of Miss Quinn helping to load packages into a buggy. And an old woman with a stooped back directing her. After the goods were loaded, Miss Quinn helped the old woman into the seat. Then waved as the buggy, pulled by a gray horse, rolled down the street. 
Tyler thought he saw her glance toward him. Hesitate for a moment, then vanish back inside the store. Tyler bowed in her direction. Miss Quinn. He murmured. He could not get the image of Charlene Quinn's face out of his mind. Tyler had met her once. And she was nothing to him. Still, that heart-shaped face, those huge hazel eyes haunted his every waking step. Nor, did he think, his thoughts of her stemmed from two different men dropping very obvious hints about Miss Quinn as a possible wife. I'm not interested in getting married. He said, hammering nails into the shingles on the roof of what was now his home. I just moved here for heaven's sake. This house isn't fit for a bride yet. Despite his insistence that he didn't want or need a wife at the moment, or any desire to put on his courting plumage, Charlene still haunted him. Taking a moment, kneeling on the roof, he gazed out over the Medina River which flowed nearby. He had bought this 500-acre property with the intention of someday marrying and starting a family, hoping to build it into a successful cattle ranch in this beautiful land. Do I want to get to know her now? Part of him did indeed want to see her again. After all, he merely had to close his eyes to see her again. Yet, this house's roof leaked, the floors needed work. And he had only bits and pieces of furniture to fill it with. At the moment, his bed was a straw pallet. Turning his head, he looked over the big barn, the sheds, and the corral which currently held only two horses and two mules. The ranch came with about a hundred head of cattle that had been roaming free and wild over the property since its prior owners had passed on. They needed branding, the young carted off to market, fences fixed and strengthened. The barn needed repairs, a garden planted, and a smokehouse built. All this and no one to share it with. Tyler, startled by what had just emerged from his own mouth, shook his head. I don't need a woman. A memory of Mary drifted into his mind. Sweet, loving, beautiful Mary. He had been prepared to marry, settled down with Mary as his wife, raise little Tyler's and Mary's. But it was not to be. He had left his old life far behind and came here in the hopes of starting his life over. Tyler had a ranch now, money in the bank. And a past he wanted to forget. Tyler chuckled to himself as he tossed the hammer up and down in his hand. I don't think she much liked me anyway. She sure didn't act like the rest of the girls in town. And he was smart enough to know that was part of what drew him to Charlene. After that first shock of seeing him, she behaved as though he was just another customer. Offering him politeness and no more. While the others fawned over him, she didn't even come out of the back room. I like her. Tyler admitted to himself. She's different. Dropping the hammer, he ran his hands through his oily hair. Slicked with sweat from the merciless heat and humidity. He worked shirtless, sweat trickling in streams down his chest and back. Reaching for a pitcher of water, he drank some of the lukewarm liquid. Then poured the rest over his face and head. It failed to cool him by much. Knowing how easily the humidity can kill a man. He worked for only a few more hours. Then picked up his hammer, pitcher and shirt and climbed down the ladder to the ground. He stood in the shade of the house for a moment, relishing the cooler air on his wet flesh. Then dropped everything on the front porch, but he picked up his rifle. Heading to the river for a quick dunking and wash. Tyler kept a sharp watch for rattlesnakes, water moccasins and copperheads, all venomous snakes that lived in this area of Texas. Though he was only a few miles from Bandera. He was a long way from help if he got himself snake bit. Whistling under his breath. He strode amid a grove of young mesquite trees. Their sharp thorns reaching for him. The Medina River flowed smoothly past him, just a few feet under the top of its banks though he had not witnessed it for himself. He had been told of the heavy rains earlier in the spring that made the river rise to the point it almost flooded the area. Knowing of a small pool where frogs and turtles liked to linger, as well as the serpents that dined on them, Tyler headed that way, thinking of bathing there. He stopped dead. A young Indian boy, perhaps thirteen or fourteen years old, stared at him, half in and half out of the pool. His dark eyes helped fear. Yet he did not move as Tyler slowly approached, holding his rifle at the ready. 
The boy watched him whirly, yet he did not reach for the long knife at his waist. Glancing around for the boy's people, Tyler found no one except him. Like Tyler, his torso was bare save an armband of leather and beadwork, and a long necklace of beads that hung down his chest. His fringed leggings lay in the water, and Tyler observed the unnatural angle of his right one. His leg was broken. Setting his rifle aside, Tyler held out both hands to the boy, showing his palms and his nonviolent intent. I am not gonna hurt you, son. He said, his voice low. Can you understand me? The boy merely stared at him. No doubt, he recognized Tyler's unarmed body language but did not speak English. Nor did Tyler speak Comanche. Lowering his body to a squatting position, Tyler edged closer and pointed at the boy's right leg. Broken? He made a snapping gesture with his hands. The boy nodded. Tyler edged closer, keeping his hands open, then mind pulling the boy from the water. The kid nodded again. All right. He said, stepping to the Indian's shoulders and put his hands under them. I'm just gonna pull you from the water. The kid wasn't very big and weighed perhaps 120 pounds. Tyler easily dragged him from the pool and rested his back against a big rock. I don't know how you got separated from your people. He said, pointing at the boy's leg for permission to examine it, received it. But I bet they are worried about you. Pulling his knife from his belt, Tyler cut the deerskin legging from the boy. Hearing him hiss with pain. What he saw stopped him cold. He rubbed his face in consternation, gazing at the white bone that stuck up through the Indian's torn flesh. That's not something I can fix, kid. He said, glancing at the boy's face. I have to get you to a doctor. Cutting the rest of the legging off, Tyler then sliced it into strips. Hunting around the edge of the river, he found two stout mesquite branches that were fairly straight and about the same length. Indicating with his hands, the boy was to hold the splints in place. Tyler then tied the wood to his leg with the leather. Now that should keep the bone from hurting you too badly while I get you to town. As the kid now gazed at him with some semblance of trust, Tyler bent down and picked the kid up in his arms. He paused at his rifle and jerked his chin at it. The Indian picked up the gun and carried it as Tyler strode quickly to the house, trying to avoid scraping the boy on the mesquite thorns. He set the kid down on the porch, took his rifle, and ran into the house for a shirt and blankets. Returning, now decently covered, he trotted to the corral and haltered the mules. Leading them to the buckboard, he harnessed them, then drove the wagon toward the barn. Old bales of straw, sitting there for countless years, made for a fairly decent cushion against the bumps on the road. He threw the blankets over the straw, then picked the Indian up and placed him gently in the buckboard. Climbing into the high seat, he turned long enough to send the boy a reassuring wink. They'll get you fixed up in no time. The boy actually smiled as though having understood him. Tyler whistled at the mules, sending them into a trot down his lane and onto the road that led toward town. Keeping an eye on the kid, he knew that despite the straw bed, the jolts and rocking of the buckboard hurt the Indian terribly. But there was no other option. Tyler had to get him to town and a doctor. Early evening had fallen by the time he reached Bandera, piano music and raucous laughter emerging from the saloon. Not knowing where the doctor's office was or where he lived, Tyler guided the mules toward the saloon to perhaps ask for directions. Until he saw Miss Quinn walking across the packed dirt street. Miss Quinn. She glanced up, instantly recognizing him. Mr. Price. She replied as he reined in the mules to a stop beside her. What might I do for you? Where's the doctor? She frowned her heart-shaped face and huge hazel eyes inside her bonnet puckering in an endearing fashion as her lips turned downward. Are you ill, sir? Injured? Not me. He replied, impatient. Him. Tyler jerked his head over his shoulder at the buckboard. Miss Quinn strode to the wagon and peered inside. Then gasped. Instantly, she hiked her skirts and climbed up to the seat beside him. My house. She snapped, pointing. 
that way. Yes, ma'am. Tyler slapped the reins on the mule's rumps to get them going again, urging them into a brisk trot. We'll get him into my house. Miss Quinn explained, turning to gaze at the boy in the buckboard. Then, I'll fetch the doctor without telling him who his patient is. Tyler glanced at her. Why the deceit? He will refuse to treat him in his own office. She said. But in my home, he might be persuaded to do so. His leg is shattered. Tyler said. Miss Quinn nodded. I saw it. Poor boy. Where did you find him? On my property, by the river. His people must be looking for him. I'm sure they are. As Miss Quinn directed him to her home just on the edge of town, Tyler had to admire her pluck and her ability to take charge. As well as her compassion for an injured human, even if that human was a Comanche. He liked her more as she bossed and bullied him into carrying the boy carefully into her home. Making sure he didn't accidentally bump the boy's leg into the wall. An emaciated woman, whom Tyler assumed was Mrs. Quinn, stood up from her rocker as Tyler carried the injured boy inside her house. She gazed on in astonishment, her mouth open, as Miss Quinn followed. Pointing down the short hall. The room on the right. Miss Quinn ordered. He can use my bed. As Tyler obeyed the direct command, he heard Mrs. Quinn ask. What is going on? An injured boy, mother. Miss Quinn answered. I hope you are willing to help him. But he's a Comanche. I don't care if he's a man from the moon. Miss Quinn snapped. He needs our help. Tyler set the boy on the narrow bed he now knew was in Miss Quinn's room. It was neatly made and covered in a quilt, with soft pillows for the kid's head. She stood in the doorway looking on, then nodded. I'll go get the doctor. She said, gazing up at Tyler. Will you stay with him? Sure. Miss Quinn gave him a quick smile. Then vanished down the short hall. Yet he heard her crisp orders to her mother. Boil water, and fix him some tea, mother. I'll be back with the doctor. Tyler heard the door slam on her mother's protest. But, Charlene. Taking a small chair, Tyler sat down in it, finding the Comanche's dark eyes on his face. He tried to make gestures with his hands and arms for the kid to not worry. Uncertain if he got his message across. Yet, the boy nodded and closed his eyes. Knowing it was a bit too warm to cover the boy with a quilt, Tyler simply rose to pour water from a pitcher into a cup and held it to the kid's lips. He drank thirstily. Tyler set the cup aside and found Mrs. Quinn in the doorway, hesitant, fearful, her gaunt face with her two big brown eyes trying to smile. She held out a steaming mug toward Tyler. I made him some dandelion root tea. She said, her voice soft. It may help. Tyler accepted it. Thank you, Mrs. Quinn. By the way, I am Tyler Price. I fear I don't know his name, however. Mrs. Quinn bobbed her head. Mr. Price. You are a kind man to bring him here. Tyler grinned. Well, ma'am, it was your daughter who insisted. She was rather forceful. That is my Charlene. Mrs. Quinn gazed at the young Comanche. She always insists on doing what is right, no matter the cost. Tyler handed the mug to the Indian, indicating he was to drink it. The boy obeyed, sipping the hot liquid until the mug was empty. He slumped back on the pillow, handing the cup back, then closed his eyes. Tyler suspected he hadn't fallen asleep. Though he gave a good imitation of it. Within a short time, Tyler heard the front door slam, and Miss Quinn's voice rise. Mother? Mr. Price? Mrs. Quinn scurried down the hall as though caught doing something terrible while Tyler followed. Miss Gwynne strode quickly toward them, a short, bespectacled man in a derby hat following behind her. This way, Dr. McFadden. Miss Quinn said firmly. I hope you brought laudanum for the patient. Of course, I did, Miss Quinn. The doctor replied, 
with a bit of asperity in his tone. I always carry it. Entering her bedroom, Tyler having backed up against the hallway wall to permit them to pass him, Miss Gwynne gestured toward the Indian boy lying on her bed. Your patient. Dr. McFadden entered the room, and stopped, gawping, gasping, as the boy gazed at him with calm dark eyes. What is the meaning of this? McFadden spluttered, indignant, outraged. I will not treat these. Indians. Chapter 3 Dr. McFadden turned to leave the room. Mr. Price, as though anticipating this, deliberately blocked his exit, gazing down at him from his taller height. I will pay double your normal rate, sir. He said, his tone amiable. I don't care about the money. The little man snapped. It's the principle. These people are our enemies. What has this boy ever done to you? Charlene retorted. He has harmed no one that you know. But the Comanche have raided farms and ranches for years. Not in the last several. She replied, her arms across her chest, imperious. We have peace now, Dr. McFadden. That boy is suffering and needs your help. You will be paid for your services here. But, Charlene stepped toward him, lowering her voice. You will treat this boy, McFadden. Or I will inform your wife of the harlots you dally with every Saturday night. The little doctor's face paled. His jaw dropped. His eyes widened behind his spectacles. Double the rates you say? Yes, sir. Tyler replied and chuckled. I will pay it. McFadden straightened his clothes, reasserting his dignity, adjusting his spectacles. He removed his derby and placed it on a nearby table. Very well then. I will need linen for bandages and hot water, please. Dr. McFadden opened his black bag as Olivia went to the other room to fetch the hot water from the stove. Charlene picked out old linen from the cupboard, sitting in a chair to cut it into strips. Watching the little man pour a dollop of laudanum into a cup. He glanced at her. This might go down better with a little alcohol. Charlene nodded. I have wine in the kitchen. Mr. Price, would you mind fetching it? It's in the cabinet above the stove. Yes, ma'am. Focusing on cutting the cloth and keeping a sharp eye on McFadden, Charlene tried to ignore Mr. Price's striking good looks and the power of his masculine personality as he left the room. She told herself that it wasn't just his attractiveness that drew her toward him. There was simply a magnetism about him, something that pulled one's attention to him. And once there, one could not look away. Dr. McFadden examined the boy's leg, untying the splint that kept the limb steady. He carefully set aside the mesquite branches and tossed the leather wrappings aside. He muttered under his breath peering closely, but Charlene could not understand what it was he said. Mr. Price returned with a bottle of red wine that Charlene liked to sip sometimes in her evenings. At the same time, her mother returned with the hot water. The doctor poured wine into the cup with the laudanum, A. Eh? Did a small amount of hot water, then encouraged the boy to drink it. The Comanche made a mood of disgust, his nose wrinkled, at the first taste. Charlene observed Mr. Price gesture to him that he should drink it, smiling, and found to her astonishment the Indian obeyed him. You are very good with him, Mr. Price. She said, rolling her strips of linen to make it easier for Dr. McFadden to bind his leg. Mr. Price poured water into the cup, handing it to the kid to wash the foul taste from his mouth. I've had a little experience in communicating with people who can't hear or speak he explained, setting the now empty cup aside. Now we wait for him to get drowsy. Dr. McFadden said, pulling out his pocket watch for a quick peek. He eyed Charlene sidelong with no little resentment, but she felt no guilt at all for blackmailing him into doing what is right. Though she did feel a great deal of gratitude for Mr. Price offering to pay the doctor's fee. For she could not. Her mother fetched a chair from the kitchen to plant in the doorway and sat down in it, wrapping her shawl closely about her shoulders despite the warmth in the room. Is there anything more I can do? She asked, 
her voice small. He will need looking after. Dr. McFadden replied, peeling back one of the Indian's closed eyelids. He must stay here for a time. He peered at Olivia over the rim of his spectacles. Are you up for it, Mrs. Quinn? Olivia licked her lips nervously, glancing between Charlene and the doctor. Yes. She said. Yes, I think so. I will show you how to dose him with laudanum for his pain. Dr. McFadden continued. Standing and striding to the end of the bed to pick up the boy's ankle. Mr. Price? Is that your name? I need your assistance please to set the bone. Take a firm grip on his knee, please. Charlene, and even Olivia, stood up to step closer to the action, watching avidly as the doctor prepared to set the Indian's broken leg. Miss Quinn. McFadden ordered. Please go to the other side of the bed and hold him down. He may still feel the pain and thrash about. Charlene obediently hurried around the doctor's back to the far side of the bed and pushed down on the Comanche's shoulders. Dr. McFadden gazed around at his two assistants. Ready? The boy cried out in pain as the doctor set his broken leg. Trying to rise though his eyes remained closed. Charlene kept him pinned easily, despite how strong he was. Within minutes it was over, the Indian relaxing into sleep while the doctor cleaned the wound in his flesh with iodine. Mr. Price then held the mesquite branches steady while Dr. McFadden bound the leg expertly. The bone straightened even beneath his copper skin once more. Closing his bag and picking up his hat, McFadden stood up. Mrs. Quinn, give him a spoonful of this laudanum morning and night for his pain. He handed her a brown bottle, lowering his face to peer over his spectacles at her. Slowly decrease the dosage over the next few days. Feed and water him well and he should recover in a few weeks. Her eyes large, Olivia hastily moved the chair out of his path, allowing the doctor to stiffly move out of the room. I will, thank you, doctor. Charlene thought it prudent to offer her own thanks. I greatly appreciate this, Dr. McFadden. She said, following him and her mother down the short hallway. McFadden half turned to send her another resentful glance then replaced his derby atop his head. He did not reply and made his way out the door. Mr. Price left in his wake. Standing near the window with the dusk settling over the land, Charlene watched as Mr. Price pulled bills from his pocket and gave much of it to the doctor. Dr. McFadden nodded curtly to him, accepted the money, then strode quickly down the porch steps as though wanting away from the house as fast as possible. Mr. Price came back in eyeing Charlene and Olivia almost apologetically. He gave Charlene a rueful grin. You sure know how to twist our good doctor into a knot, ma'am. Charlene waved her hand, dismissively. He shouldn't be dallying with loose women, either, Mr. Price. Charlene. Olivia gasped, clutching her shawl over her narrow shoulders. How do you know such things? Never you mind mother. Charlene replied. Let's just say I do and leave it at that. Plucking Olivia's hand from her shawl, Charlene held it. Thank you for being willing to help this boy. Olivia shunted her face away and gazed down, a small smile on her lips. Yes, well, someone needs to care for him. And you work so hard already, dear. Charlene glanced at Mr. Price when he cleared his throat. I want you to have this, Miss Quinn. He held out money to her, his dark gray eyes earnest. Charlene shook her head. We. I, cannot accept that, Mr. Price. She said, her tone stiff. Feeling a mixture of anger and shame that he should regard them as needy. Thank you. It's not charity if that's what you're worried about. Mr. Price replied, still holding it out. I brought the Indian here, he's my responsibility and I want to help pay for his keep. That's all. Still, Charlene hesitated. Having the boy under their roof, eating their food, would indeed add to her burdens when she had so many already. The cash would buy the extra food he would be eating when Charlene and Olivia had so little to share. Tentative, she reached out to accept the money. 
she held it up to him before pocketing it. This will be for him, then, Mr. Price. Not my mother or I. I ask nothing else, ma'am. His wide-brimmed hat in his hands, Mr. Price continued to stand in their living room, gazing down at her as though he wished to say something else. Charlene felt something pass between them, an acknowledgement of a shared experience perhaps. Or the beginning of a friendship. The moment vanished, and Mr. Price offered Charlene and Olivia a grave nod. Thank you for your kindness in caring for the boy. He said at last. I do appreciate your kindness and willingness to help him. May I return to, uh, visit him, ma'am? This time Olivia spoke up. Of course, you can, young man. Her voice holding a confidence Charlene had not heard in a long time. Drop by any time. Mr. Price's lips turned upward, and Charlene suspected his grin wasn't just because he had received permission to visit. I'll be heading back home now. He settled his hat on his head and turned toward the open door. Ladies. Good night, Mr. Price. Though she hadn't informed anyone about the injured Comanche in her bedroom, Charlene discovered half the town knew about it anyway. Leaving her mother to bring the Indian food, water, hot tea and dose him with laudanum. She went to the apple tree to work as usual. Walking in the door, she found Jean standing in the middle of the store. Her fists on her hips. Just what are you about, young lady? She demanded. Whatever do you mean? You know what I'm talking about. Jean trailed after her as Charlene removed her bonnet and hung it up on a hook in the back room. Harold gave her a sympathetic look and returned to reading his paper. You took in an injured Comanche. Town tongues are busy, I see. Charlene replied, tying her apron around her waist. I heard about it from three different people in less than an hour. Jean went on, watching Charlene take a cloth to begin dusting the shelves. What were you thinking? Why does Christian charity in aiding someone else require thought? Charlene continued to dust, her back to her employer. She heard Jean sigh. How will your mother handle the care he needs? Charlene paused to turn and grinned. You won't believe it. She was up before me this morning, cooking breakfast and spoon-feeding him. He had such an expression of astonishment on his face. Jean huffed, her countenance turning thoughtful. This might be good for Olivia, she said slowly. Give her new purpose. I hope so. Charlene returned to her dusting. Oh, by the way. She pulled the money Mr. Price had given her from her dress pocket. I will need to buy extra food from you. For the Indian. Jean eyed it as though she held a snake in her hand. Where did you get that? Mr. Price. He insisted on paying the boy's way. Accepting the money, Jean counted it. There's enough here to feed him for a month. I will collect together what you need and have Harold take it to your house. Thank you for adding to my already busy schedule. Harold called from the back room. Jean shook her head as Charlene grinned. This store is far too small. She complained. Now our suppliers are sending wagon loads. And Harold will be occupied unloading them into the back room. My back aches already. And I will be ordering more in the office. Which leaves you to wait on the customers, Charlene. Happy to. Charlene answered, resuming her dusting. The front door opened, its bell chiming. Two matrons entered, dark blue bonnets on their heads, their gowns also of a dark hue. The Winston sisters. Both were widowed, living together in a house in the center of town, and also the center of all of Bandera's gossip. They offered Charlene twin stares as she set aside her cloth and approached them with a smile. May I help you, ladies? Miss Harriet Winston said, you have a guest, Miss Quinn? Miss Darla Winston nudged her sister with her elbow. Don't be rude, Harriet. Yes, Miss Quinn, we would like three yards of that dark green cloth right there, if you don't mind. And thread to match it. Thank you. 
Charlene took down the requested bolt of cloth and laid it out on the counter to measure it. Jean left the store for the back office. As the widows advanced on the counter, she glanced up at Miss Harriet. Yes, my mother and I took in an Indian in dire need of medical assistance. Miss Harriet gasped. Is that not a dangerous thing to do? After all, he is a savage. He has a broken leg, Miss Harriet. Charlene replied, cutting the cloth with scissors. Hardly dangerous. But what will happen when he is healed? He might turn on you and your helpless mother. I suppose we will worry about that if and when it happens. Charlene folded the cloth neatly and fetched a spool of matching thread from a drawer. After wrapping the goods in paper, she handed the package to Miss Darla. May I get you anything else, ladies? After taking their coins, she watched with amusement as the matrons left the store, whispering, their heads together. Throughout the day, she endured question after question. Townspeople coming in to buy something as an excuse to inquire about the Comanche. She answered them all patiently yet forced her eyes not to roll. Yes, he has a broken leg. No, he is not dangerous to the community. Yes, I'm sure he will return to his people soon. Yes, it was my Christian duty. Yes, Dr. McFadden was very kind to enlist his aid. During a lull in the waves of customers, Harold came in from the storeroom, grinning broadly, his clothes covered in dust. Your Comanche friend is certainly good for our business. I am almost out of coffee and flour. And I just unloaded a shipment. I almost feared the town would condemn me for it. Charlene admitted, wiping her hands on her apron. And shun the store. Nonsense. Harold snorted. These folks are basically very kind-hearted. Your broken-legged Indian is a novelty, not an excuse for the town to turn on you. You and your mother are highly regarded in Bandera, girl. People understand your kindness. He pulled out his pocket watch. It's time for your lunch. He said. I'll mind the place. Can you handle it? Jean called from the back room. I was running this place before I met you, woman. Grinning, Charlene went to the office to fetch her bonnet and remove her apron. I'll be back soon, Jean. Jean nodded, scribbling out an order on paper. Give your mother my love, dear. Tying her bonnet's ribbons under her chin, Charlene opened the front door. Dodging a pair of cowboys in tall hats and leather chaps who entered the apple tree just as she exited. With her appetite gnawing in her stomach, she walked hurriedly down the sidewalk, her head down. Hoping no one else felt the need to stop her and ask nosy questions about the injured Indian. The savage sun beat down on her head, making her glad she had remembered her bonnet. Perspiration already beating on her forehead. Though she had been born and raised in this part of Texas. She still wondered if she would ever get used to its terrible heat. How can anyone ever get used to it? She muttered. Not really paying much attention to what was going on around her. Charlene all but strode headlong into a man who had stopped in front of her. Seeing only his boots and legs from under her bonnet. She lifted her face and stopped before she tripped over him. Oh, excuse me. She recognized him instantly. Harvey Johnson, Bandera's local drunk, who worked performing odd jobs around the town. And spent his money in the saloon. Charlene knew he lived in a tiny shanty when he wasn't sleeping off a bender in the town's jail, and she raised a faint smile. Mr. Johnson. She did not receive one in return. Instead, he glared down at her as though he hated the very sight of her. Despite that they had quite often exchanged pleasantries. Nor was he currently intoxicated and did not smell of whiskey or beer. A little alarmed when he said nothing and continued to leer at her with rage, Charlene tried again. Mr. Johnson, how are you? Damn engine lover. He snarled, his brown teeth bared in a grimace. I'll show you how I am. That was when he pulled the knife from behind his back. Chapter 4 Fanning himself with his hat, Aaron Dawson sat in the questionable coolness of the saloon. Occasionally taking a drink from his tall glass of beer. 
Like everything else in the godforsaken country, it had warmed considerably and tasted foul. Gazing idly out the window, he watched as passers-by on horseback or buggies. Some fools on foot, strode or rode down the dusty street outside. Let's go back north, suggested his brother Franklin, adjusting his spectacles on his damp nose. Where it's cooler. How can anyone live down here? Asked George, also a brother and the second to the youngest in the family. This heat is stifling. Aaron glanced at them and took another drink from his glass. Benji isn't in the north. He replied, still fanning himself. His dark red hair, long, oily and slick with sweat, dripped small rivulets down the sides of his face. Not even the air moving across his skin cooled him. He's in Texas, and that's where we stay until we spring him from jail. Why couldn't he have been busted in a nice place like Colorado? George muttered, shooting an uneasy glance toward Aaron. Aaron restrained himself from backhanding George across his measly face. Always a complainer, George never failed to get under Aaron's skin and create a savage itch. As he often did, Aaron wished he could simply dump George somewhere and ride off, to never see him again. But he was blood, and the Dawson family never abandoned their own. Pipe down, George. Elmer said, his tone soft. He always spoke quietly, never raised his voice, yet even Aaron tread carefully when Elmer's voice grew almost inaudible. The less voice he spoke with, the more dangerous he became. If you were in prison, we'd ride through hell to get you out. George smacked his cards down on the table, irritated. I know. This heat is making me crazy. It doesn't even cool off at night here. This is getting to all of us. Frank admitted, picking up George's card hand and inspecting them. Once we have Benji back with us, we'll go back north. Right, Aaron? Aaron merely nodded. Texas is a big place. We still don't know what prison the federal marshals took him to. Just how many prisons are here? Elmer asked. Three or four? At least. If we find where they are. Elmer went on. Maybe we can ride to each one. That'll take years, idiot. George snapped. Benji will have died of old age before we get him out. Elmer merely stared at him until George looked away, mumbling under his breath. He took all the cards back and shuffled them. Refusing to look at any of his brothers. I. Am just saying. Aaron heard him mutter. Maybe that bounty hunter knows where he is. Aaron said, gazing out the window again. What was his name? Tyler Price. Franklin answered, inspecting the cards George dealt him. But he's long gone. Do you know where he went? Aaron turned his head toward his brother. No. Just that he packed up one day and left town. Franklin adjusted his spectacles when they slid down his nose again, slicked with his sweat. Benji made him a rich man. Someone probably knows where he went. Aaron said thoughtfully. He had friends back there in El Paso. Maybe he told his pal the sheriff where he was headed. Is El Paso cooler than here? George asked, pushing a few matchsticks across the table as his wager. The Amazon jungle is cooler than here. Franklin scoffed. How would you know? You've never been to the Amazon jungle in your life. I know more than you, Dimwit, that's for sure. Where is the Amazon jungle, anyway? South America. Franklin snapped. And if you ask me where that is, I'll bust you a good one. You think you know more than the rest of us because you read all them books. George sneered. Four eyes. I do know more than you, stupid. Knock it off. Aaron told them, not raising his voice. You two sound like five-year-olds. Like Elmer, Aaron's temper had earned him their fear and respect. None of his brothers wanted to see him angry, as there was little he wouldn't do in a rage. Franklin still bore the puckered scar in his left shoulder from Aaron's knife. And he never forgot how he nearly bled to death.
Aaron was sorry afterward, of course, but he had gotten his point across. Never make Aaron angry. Here's what we'll do. Aaron said, pulling a thin cigar from his vest pocket and lighting it with a match scraped across his boot. The next couple of days, we scope out the bank. Once we know everything there is to know, we hit it, then skin out. Back west to El Paso. I like that idea. George replied, squinting at his cards. We're almost out of money. We wouldn't be if you didn't gamble it all away at poker every night. Franklin growled. I don't always lose. George replied easily. He smirked and set his hand on the table. Like now. Full house. Thus, three days later, shortly after the bank opened, George sat in his saddle, holding the reins to all four horses while Aaron led Franklin and Elmer into the bank, kerchiefs tied over their lower faces, their hats pulled down over their eyes. At this time of day, there were no customers to control. And only the bank manager and a single employee were inside. Not many people strolled by on the street outside, either. As most sensible people remained indoors. He pointed his gun at the frightened teller's head. Tell your boss to open the safe. He ordered. Now. Elmer pushed his way through to the back, his rifle cocked and aimed as the manager raised his hands over his head. Don't shoot. The man pleaded, sweat running down his face. Jerking the business end of his gun toward the safe, Elmer said. Open it. Franklin carried a canvas sack in behind him as the manager spun the combination lock on the safe, then swung open the heavy door. As Elmer and Aaron kept their victims at gunpoint, Franklin stuffed the bundles of cash into the sack, working fast before any customers wandered in. Got it. He called out. Elmer reversed his rifle and bashed the butt against the manager's head. The man fell to the floor, bleeding from the gash in his scalp. Aaron swiftly forced the teller into the back, his pistol held to the man's neck, and also knocked him out cold. Let's go. He said. Before anyone comes in. Closing the door to the bank behind them. Aaron liked to think that making the place appear normal when a customer walked into the bank gave them a slight head start. He and his brothers mounted their horses, Franklin stuffing the money into his saddlebags. Then at a smooth trot, not drawing unwanted attention to themselves by galloping away in a rush. They rode down the dusty street. However, once they rode out of sight of the town, Aaron spurred his mount into a fast canter. With so many similar bank heists behind them, he seldom had to give his brothers orders anymore. They would ride as hard as they dared without exhausting the horses, rest near water and graze. Then ride on again. Aaron led the way westward, often glancing behind him for evidence of someone following them. They hadn't ridden for an hour when he looked back and discovered a tall plume of dust not far to their rear. They're on to us, boys. He said. That's a posse back there, and it's a big one. Chapter 5 Charlene gaped at the knife in shock. Mr. Johnson. She began, taking a step back her hands raised. Put the knife down. Please. Rather than heed her conciliatory words and tone, Harvey Johnson advanced on her. Flicking the knife's handle backward and thus setting the blade into a slashing rather than stabbing mode. Injun lover. He repeated, the feral light in his eyes never fading. Saliva slipped his lips, his grimace still in place. Risking a lightning glance around. Charlene saw no one in the vicinity who could help her. Any other time there's fifty people out here. The Winston widows gawped from across and down the street, in front of the bank, staring at the scene. Charlene took another step back and screamed. Help! Get the sheriff! From her peripheral vision, she saw Johnson lunge forward. His knife swinging around in a fast arc, cutting through the air toward her throat. Twisting. Charlene ducked in the same motion, spinning out of range. As fast as she was, Johnson pounced, slashing his blade toward her again. She danced into the street, never taking her eyes from the glittering knife. Help! She yelled again. 
Johnson grew frustrated at his inability to cut down one frail girl, for he rumbled in his throat, his eyes narrowed. Still lunging at her with wild swings of his blade. Why isn't anyone helping me? Charlene ducked another stroke from the madman in front of her, then spun out of reach. Dodging his knife with the agility she never knew she possessed. Concentrating on Johnson and where his hand was. She never heard the sound of galloping hooves until they were right on top of her. Charlene caught sight of a big bay horse that slammed chest first into Johnson. Knocking him several feet back from Charlene. The knife flew from his hand as he rolled over and over in the dirt. Whether by the rider's intent or the horse couldn't stop in time, she never was quite sure. What she did see, however, were big hoofs cracking across Johnson's chest and ribs as the horse stumbled over his body. Johnson choked on a scream, grunting. Cursing as the bay wheeled around to trot back to Charlene. Are you hurt? Barely hearing anyone speak, Charlene breathed hard. Unable to cease staring at Johnson as he curled into a ball in the street. Adrenaline still raced through her, her heart beating fast in her chest. People ran from stores, the bank, the saloon. Gathering in a circle in the middle of the street, some shouting for the sheriff. The rider slid down from his saddle, standing over Charlene. Are you hurt? He repeated. Charlene stared up into the concerned face of Mr. Price. I. I don't think so. Perhaps, you should sit down. The Winston widows thrust their way through the crowd, pushing anyone who didn't get out of their way in time. Come sit down, dear. Miss Harriet ordered, taking Charlene by the arm, leading her to a bench on the sidewalk. We saw everything. Miss Darla said. That dreadful man attacked you. We'll tell the sheriff so. He's a menace, is that Johnson? Sitting down on a bench, a window to either side of her and Mr. Price looming over her, Charlene shivered despite the heat. He tried to kill me. Yes, dear, we saw it. But we could not reach you in time, dear. Thank God for this young man. Trembling uncontrollably, Charlene tried to relay her gratitude to Mr. Price. But nothing emerged from her mouth. She glanced past him as Sheriff Parker cantered up to the crowd on his dun gelding, swinging down from his saddle even before the dun stopped moving. What the hell is going on here? He demanded, dropping his mount's reins to the ground. He pushed his way through the gathered townsfolk, staring down at Johnson, who still lay curled in a fetal position. Miss Harriet stood up and marched imperiously to him, the crowd now parting respectfully for her. That drunken maniac tried to kill our Miss Quinn. She grated, pointing back toward Charlene. With that knife there. My sister and I saw everything. Barker looked from Charlene to the knife and to Johnson on the ground. That true, Miss Quinn? Still unable to talk, Charlene nodded, her arms wrapped around her torso to still her shakes. Miss Darla stood up, glaring fiercely. She is shaken up badly. Sheriff. If it hadn't been for that young man, Johnson would have killed her. Now we are going to take her back to the store. Once she has calmed down, you may speak with her then. Miss Harriet agreed with a snort and stalked back through the now quiet crowd to Charlene. Tie your horse up, young man, and come with us. Charlene caught a quick glimpse of Mr. Price tipping his hat to them, then picking up the reins to his bay. Behind her, as the widows helped her toward the apple tree with one on each of her arms. Charlene heard Barker ordering the people to disperse and two men to carry Johnson to the jailhouse. And someone fetched the doctor, Barker snapped. Mr. Price held open the door, its bell chiming. As the two old women helped Charlene across the store's threshold. Both Jean and Harold dropped what they were doing the instant they saw Charlene's face and the two widows. Good Lord, what happened? Jean asked, rushing to Charlene. Mr. Maple, get her a chair. Ordered Miss Harriet. Mrs. Maple, fetch her some sherry. Or brandy. Brandy is better. If she hadn't felt so queasy and frightened and shaky, Charlene might have chuckled at the sight of the Maples hurrying to obey the two old ladies. Mr. Price closed the door behind them. 
then stood with his back to it as though on guard. I'm all right. Charlene tried to tell the widows. Really? Unless pale gray is your usual color child? Miss Harriet replied, her tone dry. You are far from all right. I, just, I don't feel well. It's the shock, dear. Said Miss Darla. Here comes Mr. Maple with a chair. Now sit down and catch your breath. Charlene obediently sat on the chair, grateful for it. For she didn't think she could have stood on her feet much longer. Why did that lunatic attack you? Miss Harriet asked as Harold hovered over her shoulder. Let us wait for the Sheriff Harriet. Miss Darla told her sister. That way she doesn't have to tell her story twice. Jean arrived with a small glass and a bottle of brandy from the back. Her hands trembled slightly, the neck of the bottle clicking against the rim of the glass. Miss Harriet watched her impatiently for a moment, then took both from her. Let me do it. She poured brandy from the bottle with the expertise of a bartender, then handed the glass to Charlene. Drink it child. All of it. Obedient, Charlene drank it down in a few gulps, grimacing at the taste. She had never liked brandy. Yet, within moments, her trembling subsided, and her stomach calmed. She nodded, handing the empty glass to Jean, who wrung her hands as she stood watching her. The door opened, smacking Mr. Price in the back. He stepped aside to permit Sheriff Barker in, who swept off his big hat in the presence of the ladies. Tyler. He said with a quick nod. If you wouldn't mind, lock that door. I don't think we need visitors right now. As the tall, silver-haired sheriff approached, Charlene gazed up at him, trying to smile. She heard the door lock snick closed as Mr. Price locked it. Then he crossed the floor to stand beside Harold. Now, Miss Quinn. Sheriff Barker asked, his demeanor friendly yet stern. Please tell me what happened. When Miss Harriet opened her mouth, he held up his hand to silence her. I need it from her. Then I will ask you too, Miss Harriet and Miss Darla, for your statements. Miss Quinn? Charlene nodded. I was walking home for lunch, Sheriff. She said, her voice trembling only slightly. Mr. Johnson blocked my way, called me an engine lover. He pulled the knife, attacked me. Swallowing hard, she took a deep, shaky breath, her eyes to the side. Remembering those desperate moments when Johnson slashed at her with the knife. Trying to cut her throat open. I couldn't do anything except try to dodge him. She went on. Just avoided the knife. I yelled for help, but no one came. We couldn't get to them in time. Miss Darla stated. We saw it all. He was trying to cut her, but she moved faster than he did. Miss Darla beamed with pride, gazing down at Charlene. She was a sight to behold, she was. You both witnessed Harvey Johnson attack her? Barker asked. We certainly did. Miss Harry had swelled up like an indignant bullfrog. I hope you send that maniac to jail for life. Sheriff Barker glanced at Mr. Price. And you stopped it? Mr. Price nodded, his stunning eyes on Charlene. I need a few things from the store here, Vic. He said. I rode down the street, saw what was happening. I put my horse into a gallop and knocked him away from her. Sheriff Barker sighed, slapping his hat against his thigh. It's fairly clear what happened then. I found the knife in the street. Doc McFadden is looking at him now, seems he may have a few busted ribs. He'll spend some time in jail, Miss Quinn. You have no worry that he'll be out to hassle you again. Thank you, Sheriff. She whispered. Sheriff Barker glanced around at the semicircle around him. This is an explanation, not an excuse. He said, his voice stern. Old Johnson used to be a soldier in the cavalry. He'd seen some awful things the Comanche had done in years past and lost his wife to a Comanche attack. Like I said, it explains why he hates them Indians. That boy never did him any harm. 
Harold thundered. Why take his anger out on Charlene? Sheriff Barker held up his hands, palms out, in a placating gesture. I done told you it was an explanation, not an excuse. What he did to Miss Gwen is inexcusable. Her trembling returned on the thought of what might have happened to her if Mr. Price had not needed to come to town that afternoon. She tried to smile at him, but when he didn't return it, she thought perhaps her mouth didn't work quite right. Her stomach churned the brandy into a sickening sway, making her believe she might throw up. She started to stand. I think I will go home now. Miss Harriet nodded. We, my sister and I, will accompany you. Mrs. Maple, will you permit Miss Gwynne to have the rest of the day off? Of course. Jean took Charlene's hand. Go home and lie down. I will come by the house and check on you later. Harold still needs to carry your goods. So I will fix supper for you and your mother tonight. This time Charlene managed a wan smile. You are too kind. Jean huffed. A man attacking a young girl on the street in broad daylight. What is this world coming to? Once again, Charlene found her arms held by the Winston widows as they marched her toward the door. Mr. Price unlocked it and held it open for them, giving all three of them a short bow as they passed. She would have liked to have paused to thank him, now that she had discovered her voice. But the two determined ladies took her outside before she could even try. The crowd had dispersed, but many townspeople still stood on the sidewalks, watching her and her bodyguards emerge from the store. No few stepped up to ask if she was all right or if there was anything they could do. The widows brushed her past them imperiously, politely asking them to step aside. Though Charlene had no doubt they would have simply marched over anyone who did not. Olivia, an empty plate in her hand, gaped in shock as Charlene and her escorts entered the house. Charlene! What happened? That maniac drunk Johnson tried to harm her, Olivia. Miss Henrietta said, helping Charlene to the sofa. I imagine the boy is in her room? Olivia stared, uncomprehending for a long moment. Um, yes, he is. I just gave him some food. She lifted the empty plate as proof, apparently still unable to realize that Charlene had been moments from death. If Charlene read her expression correctly. Yet, she still found a polite smile for their guests. Harriet, would you ladies like some tea? The widows seated themselves in armchairs, across from where Charlene sat, who wished wholeheartedly that they would go away and leave her to lie down. Yes, Olivia. Darla replied. That would be lovely. Still, the tea that Olivia poured tasted good, and did as much to halt her shivers and shakes as the brandy had. And she had no need to say a word as to what had happened. Both widows explained in graphic detail what had transpired with Johnson and his knife. Olivia let her tea grow cold as she listened in growing horror. Harriet reminding her time and again how she had come within a hair of losing her daughter. Trying not to show her growing alarm, Charlene patted her mother's hand. I'm fine, mother. Just a little shaken up. Olivia's brown eyes filled with tears. I almost lost you. She whispered. What would I do if I lost you, too? For the first time, Miss Harriet and Miss Darla seemed to realize just what their extravagant detail had done to Olivia's fragile emotions. As though ashamed of themselves, they glanced at one another over their cups, suddenly refusing to speak or look at Olivia for long moments. Perhaps we exaggerated the situation, Olivia. Miss Harriet admitted, at last, sipping her tea without looking up. Charlene is fine, and the miscreant Johnson is in jail. Where he will remain for some time. It's all because of that boy in there. We should never have taken him in. Her mother seemed prepared to break down and sob into her hands. Charlene squeezed her wrist. Never regret a good work mother. She said sternly. I. Do not, and will not, regret helping him. Ever. Charlene is quite right, Olivia. Miss Darla said firmly. Doing one's Christian duty is never to be second-guessed. Please put that from your mind. Olivia nodded, 
wiping her eyes with a napkin. All right. She whispered. Miss Harriet set her cup on the table and stood. I think Charlene needs to rest, don't you? Come, Darla. We must return home. Charlene also stood, walking the widows to the door. Thank you so much, Miss Harriet, Miss Darla. Miss Darla patted her cheek, smiling. We will see you tomorrow, child. She watched them stroll down the street, their heads together as they gossiped about the day's events. No doubt, they would tell and retell this story to anyone who would listen until the end of their days. Charlene smiled a little as she closed the door. Turning, she found her mother weeping silently. Tears flowing down her cheeks and dropping onto her lap. Anguished, Charlene rushed to her. Mother. Sitting back down on the sofa, she took her mother into her arms to rock her back and forth as though she were a small child. Olivia clung to her, her sobs growing louder, her tears wetting Charlene's bodice. Feeling her own eyes sting, she blinked several times to clear her vision. Letting her mother cry herself out. When at last, she lifted her head to wipe her wet face, Olivia tried to smile. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have cried all over you. Hush. Charlene swept her mother's hair back from her face. It's all right mother. Do you want to lie down for a while? Olivia nodded. Will you look in on our guest? Certainly. Charlene walked with her mother to her bedroom and watched her lie on the bed. Covering her with a light sheet, she kissed Olivia's brow. Jean will be fixing us supper tonight. Smiling, Olivia closed her eyes. Stepping lightly as she left, Charlene didn't close the door, as that would make the bedroom too stifling, and went to her own room. The Comanche boy was asleep. Moving softly so she wouldn't wake him, she sat in the chair beside his bed. She nearly died because of this Indian. The knowledge driven home to her now that she was finally alone and could think. I would do it again. I would blackmail McFadden, and let this boy stay here to recover. Even if it cost me my life. It was, and is, the right thing to do. She sat with him for the afternoon, two hours perhaps, and watched him wake up. She observed his face creased with pain as he stirred. Waking fully with a yawn, then realizing he was not alone. The boy stared at her for a long moment, and Charlene wondered if perhaps he didn't recognize her. Then the weariness in his countenance slowly seeped away, and he smiled shyly. Charlene returned it. She pointed to herself. Charlene. She then pointed to him. The boy seemed puzzled, for he cocked his head, his sleek black hair sliding over his shoulders. She tried again and turned her index finger toward her chest. Charlene. And once again with the gesture, she politely asked for his name. A wide grin crossed his face. He tapped his chest. Tosahui. Tosahui. She repeated slowly, nodding. It's a pleasure having you here, Tosahui. He imitated her nod, still grinning, although she knew he had no idea what she said. At least I have a name I can call you that isn't hey, you. Her mother appeared in the doorway, looking wan and pale. But the smile she offered them was genuine, not feigned. Mother, this is Dosahui. Charlene pointed toward her. Olivia. The Comanche boy grinned, nodding. Olivia. Charlene. How wonderful. Her mother clapped her hands. Are you hungry, Tosihui? She made a gesture of picking up food and putting it in her mouth, then pointed to Tosahui. He nodded, and rubbed his stomach, grinning hugely. Charlene chuckled. I will accept that as a yes. Sit with him mother, while I get him some food. Olivia took her chair as Charlene vacated it, talking to the Indian with both words and gestures in an effort to communicate. Leaving them alone, she went to the kitchen to fry Tosahui some ham and potatoes with onions. The smell of the cooking food reminding her at last that she had not had lunch. Her own stomach rumbling, she added bread and butter, then took the plate of hot food into the bedroom. She handed Tosahui his plate, then observed him wolf the food down with his fingers. Are you sure you fed him today mother? 
she asked dryly. Twice, dear. He's a growing boy, remember, and recovering. He's going to have quite the appetite for a long time. Hearing a knock at the door, Charlene went to answer it. Jean and Harold stood on the porch, his arms filled with a huge box of enough food to last them a month. Even with Tosa Hui's appetite. She opened the door for them, inviting them inside. Jean gave her a hug. How are you, Charlene? You are looking much better than you did earlier. Thank you, I am doing better. Come in. Mother, we have visitors. Olivia emerged from the bedroom, smiling when she saw who had come. Jean, Harold. Embracing them both, she invited them to sit down in the living room. I was just in with Tosa Hui. He is well on his way to recovery. That is his name? Jean glanced at Harold. He speaks English? Olivia sat down as Charlene took the box into the kitchen to put their supplies away in the pantry. And the perishables down into the root cellar where they would remain good despite the summer heat. She half listened as Olivia explained how they had come to learn the boy's name. My, my. Jean said, marveling. It's best you have the extra goods, then, with such an enormous appetite to fill. Our own two boys eat like young horses. Harold said. They have only one to feed. Charlene froze for a moment, fearing the reference to the Maple's sons would upset Olivia. Who had lost her own sons as well as her beloved husband in the fire. But her mother merely laughed. A sound Charlene had not heard since before her father and brothers died. Yes, boys do need to eat a great deal. She said. Warmth filled Charlene. Tosa Hui was indeed a blessing in their home. For his presence and his need for care had brought Olivia out of her shell and gave her a new reason for living. She hoped and prayed that this new zeal would not depart once he healed and returned to his Comanche people. But going home is not the same as death. She murmured. He can return for a visit if he wishes. Sticking her head out of the kitchen, she asked. Jean and Harold, are you staying for supper? Jean stood up. Yes, since you asked. And I will prepare it. Please offer your guest a piece of my delicious apple pie. Taking a knife, Charlene cut a wedge of pie from the dish and put it on a plate. Then poured a glass of milk to take to Tosa Hui. She found him drowsing, but he woke when she entered. Charlene. He said, his grin wide. I brought you some dessert. She said, putting the plate in his hands, and setting the milk where he could reach it. Jean's apple pie is renowned around Bandera. He gobbled the pie down, licking his fingers, and drank the milk with enthusiasm. Chuckling at how cheerful he was despite his obvious pain, she rose. Taking the dishes from him, she said. I'll bring you your laudanum. He nodded as though he understood, setting his head back on the pillows. Setting the plate and glass in the sink, she eyed the meat pie Jean was concocting. I need to take the boy his laudanum, then I'll help you. No, you won't. Jean eyed her sternly. You will bring the boy his laudanum, then you will pour everyone a glass of wine. After that, you will sit down. Charlene sighed. Yes, ma'am. Now that's what I like to hear. Tosa Hui took his laudanum laced wine with reluctance but obediently swallowed it down. Charlene took a moment to stroke her hand over his cheek. As though he were her son, yet he had been under her roof for only 24 hours. How fond will I be of him after 24 days? Leaving him to sleep. She kept the window wide open to catch the evening breeze, then returned to the kitchen. Are you sure I cannot help? Jean pointed with a knife at the door. Wine. Then go. Charlene poured four small glasses of her red wine, left one for Jean on the counter. And took the other three out to the living room where her mother and Harold chatted. I have been exiled from the kitchen. She began. From the bedroom down the hall, she heard the sound of a thump the scrape of a chair across wood, and a soft cry. Instantly, Charlene bolted for the hallway and the door of the room. Though it was dusk, there was still enough daylight for her to see by, 
and she saw it easily. Tosuhui lay on the bed, gasping for a breath, his dark eyes glassy, as a shadow leapt through the window to vanish. Chapter 6 Tyler watched as Miss Quinn, escorted by the two old biddies, left the apple tree store. He eyed Victor sidelong and lifted his brow. There? You buying? This time. Both he and Victor made their farewells to Mr. and Mrs. Maple, then followed the women out onto the wooden sidewalk. He observed the trio headed toward the Quinn residence and wished he could have been the one to escort her home. He recalled the horror that leapt in his throat when he saw Miss Quinn under attack by a lunatic with a knife. Keeping them in sight for as long as possible, Tyler walked with Victor to the saloon. It wasn't much cooler inside than out, but at least the sun no longer beat down on his head. He lifted his fingers to the barmaid, who immediately nodded and drew two foaming beers. Setting his head on the table, he dropped into the chair with a sigh. So, what'll happen? He asked. Victor watched the beer arrive with keen eyes. So, what will happen? Tyler scowled. With this Johnson fellow. Oh, him. Victor waited until the barmaid set the beers down on the table and Tyler paid for them. Then picked up his to take a long drink. He wiped foam from his mustache with a happy sigh. I got one piece of cow dung off the street for a while. Then his happy mood passed, he frowned sadly into his beer. Now I gots to feed him. That's no fun. What'll happen to him? Tyler drank his beer before the heat got to it and made it nasty. When the circuit judge comes around, he'll be judged guilty and may be sent to prison for a while. Victor answered. Attempted murder, that's a bad on out here in Texas. He deserves it. Tyler said, heat in his voice. He almost killed her, Vic. If she hadn't moved faster than he did. Yep. That's one lucky gal. Lucky? Tyler stared at his friend. Vic, you didn't see her. She moved like, I don't know, greased lightning. Even luckier. Baffled, Tyler scratched his head. How can one little girl evade a knife like that? Victor stared into his beer. I dunno, Tyler. He said slowly. She was the younger of them three kids, the boys that died. Maybe she learned to play rough with him, got agile, fast, I don't know. But she's alive and he's in jail. That's all that matters. You knew the family? Yep. I did. Good people. Victor nodded wisely. Hardworking, good Christians. I ain't a bit surprised that Miss Quinn took in that injured Comanche. Not at all. No sir. I found him on my property. Tyler said, drinking his beer, reflectively. Brought him to town. Had no idea what I'd be bringing down on that girl's head by leaving him with her. Victor scowled, pointing his finger at Tyler. Now, don't you be getting all guilty over it. This ain't no one's fault except old Johnson's. He should have known better. But he never has been right in the head. Will someone else, who isn't right in the head, decide that killing Miss Quinn is like killing the boy? Victor looked away. Lord, I hope not. He muttered. That's helpful. Tyler snapped. What do you want me to do? Put round-the-clock surveillance on the Quins? Vic demanded. It'll do for a start. Victor muttered what sounded like swear words under his breath and drank his beer. After today, no one will be that stupid. You hope. Hope is all I got. I ain't got any deputies. In companionable silence, they drank their beers, sweat trickling down Tyler's back. Had I known it was so hot here, I might not have bought property. You said you like the heat. Now, I don't. Better get used to it, son. Victor advised. All we got out here is heat, prickly pear and javelinas. Feeling wary and hot, Tyler rode back to his ranch at a slow pace to spare his horse in the late afternoon heat. 
He had hoped an excuse might come up that would enable him to pay a call on Miss Quinn. But none did. Returning to his ranch, he pondered the events of that afternoon and how he had come to look in a new light at the girl with the huge hazel eyes. Still stunned by her incredible speed and agility in avoiding the slashing knife that could easily have slit her throat. He smiled with no little satisfaction at the thought of his horse striking Johnson and sending him flying. Nor did he feel any guilt at spurring his horse. Reining him at the last second so the bay could not jump the man on the ground as his instincts tried to tell him to do. Forcing him to trample Johnson instead. Serves you right for attacking a tiny, defenseless woman. He muttered under his breath. Reaching home, he unsaddled his weary gelding, curried the sweat from his hide as best he could. Then turned him loose in the corral. Leaning on the split rail fence, he watched his stock roll the sweat from their skins in the dirt and thought of his cattle roaming the hills. And all the work ahead of him. Gonna be a long, hot summer. He said aloud, turning toward the house. The daylight edged away from the coming dusk as Tyler pumped cool water from the well and dumped the bucket over his head. It made him shiver after the intense heat, but it felt oh, so good. Dripping, not feeling hungry. He sat on the porch to watch the shadows fall long before him. He didn't know when he fell asleep. Waking suddenly in the near absolute dark, he knew instantly he was not alone. Reaching for his rifle, he cocked it, and held it in his lap, but remained where he was. He listened hard and heard nothing. No crickets, no birds settling into the trees for the night, no buzzing insects. His instincts on high alert, he waited, patient, knowing that whoever was out there would come to him. They did. Shadows emerged, darker than the night behind them, from the thickets of mesquite and thick cedar trees. Five of them, on foot, walking slowly, cautiously toward him. One raised his hand in the air, palm toward Tyler, in a gesture of peace. Though the motion assuaged his instincts, he remained alert, careful. He, too, raised his hand, his empty palm toward his visitors. With the nearly full moon and the stars shining down on the clearing in front of the house, he saw them fairly easily. Five Indian warriors, their rifles cradled in their arms and not pointed toward him, walked across the open. He rose from his chair and strolled down the porch steps to greet them. Hoping at least one of them spoke English, Tyler offered them sober nods. Observing the lack of war paint on their face. S. Welcome to my home. The one in front made an obscure hand gesture, a slashing movement sideways. Thinking it best to repeat it, Tyler did. He then waited to see what would happen. He suspected that if these people wanted him dead, they would have shot him on his porch while he slept. I have come seeking my son. The leader stated. We have tracked him here but cannot follow him. Tyler nodded. A boy of about thirteen years? The Comanche lifted a brow. You have seen him? I found a Comanche boy in the river with a broken leg. Tyler replied. I took him into the town to be healed. He is fine, he has not been harmed, and is staying with some kind people. The Indian turned and spoke to his companions in his own language for a time, apparently answering their questions, discussing the situation. At last, he turned back to Tyler. I would see him. Will you take me to this village of white men? In the morning, yes. The Indian spoke again with his friends, then nodded to Tyler. Then, I will return at dawn. He made the slashing gesture again. And then he and his companions returned the way they came and vanished into the dark. Though he wasn't concerned about them coming back to kill him. Tyler dragged his pallet out onto the porch to sleep. It was far cooler outside than in, and he truly did not want the Comanche sneaking up on him. With his rifle close at hand, he lay down without a blanket and continued his interrupted sleep. Tyler woke as the first light of dawn broke over the cedar and mesquite trees. Discovering the Indian he had spoken to the night before on his horse. Watching him with calm dark eyes. Like many Indians, he rode bareback with a simple bridle. Symbols of strength and speed painted on the mount's chestnut hide. Wondering how long he had stood there, waiting for Tyler to wake up, Tyler had no clue. Yawning, 
he rose from his pallet, then stretched. Waving at the Comanche, he said, Be with you in a few minutes. Taking his rifle into the house with him, he made himself a quick breakfast of biscuits and leftover bacon and put more in a small cloth sack. After changing his shirt for something that didn't look like he slept in it, Tyler went back outside. The Indian still stood where he was, mounted on his horse in the middle of Tyler's yard. He held out the sack to him. Breakfast? The Indian peered in, then accepted the food, nodding gravely. He tapped his chest. Wintinta. A pleasure, Wintinta. I am Tyler. Tyler. As Wintinta ate the breakfast Tyler offered him, still aboard his mount, Tyler saddled his bay horse. Tying his rifle's scabbard to his saddle, he shoved his rifle in it, then mounted up. The Comanche turned his chestnut to follow. Quickly catching up as Tyler nudged his horse into a trot down his lane toward the road. What is your son's name? Tyler asked. Tosahui. His leg was broken pretty bad. Tyler went on. I couldn't fix him up myself, so I paid the doctor in town to set his leg. He might be able to go home with you, but he's probably still hurting. Wintinta, a tall, broad-shouldered man who wore leggings similar to the boy in no shirt, nodded. He cannot ride with a broken leg. The doctor said it so he should be fine in a few weeks. Not having much experience with Indians. Tyler ride the man sidelong, observing his black hair trailing down the sides of his head in braids. The eagle feather tied into it. How did you happen to lose your son? He went hunting and did not return. Winton replied. We feared that perhaps he drowned in the river when we lost sight of his tracks. With the new day not yet truly hot, the air felt soft against Tyler's skin as they trotted and cantered down the road toward Bandera. Keeping his fingers crossed that the townspeople would not overreact to the presence of a Comanche warrior riding down the main street, Tyler ignored the sharp stares he and his companion engendered as they entered the town. Leading the way to the Quinn's home, he glanced at Wind and his neutral expression, noting how the Comanche paid no heed at all to the folks who paused to gawk. Though they stared, talking amongst themselves, pointing. No one seemed intent on shooting Wint into on sight. Misgiving leapt down Tyler's throat as they approached the Quinn residence. Victor's done gelding stood tied up out front, and he knew immediately that Victor most likely did not happen by for a social visit. Dismounting in front of the house, he tied his bay to a post while Wint into tied his further down. Climbing the front steps, Tyler knocked on the door. He heard quick footsteps cross the floor toward them, and then Miss Gwen opened it. Her quick glance took in Tyler and Wintinta, her surprise short. Mr. Price, she said, holding the door wide. Come in. He slid his hat off his head. This is Wintinta, Miss Quinn. It's his son you are hosting here. Miss Quinn offered a tight smile. You are Tosahui's father? Well, he will be happy to see you. Her tense manner and Victor's presence told Tyler that something was very wrong. Did something happen, Miss Quinn? He asked. She took a deep breath, her fists clenched over her skirts. Tosahui is fine. She began, her hazel eyes fixed on Wintinta. However, someone came in through the window last night, tried to hurt him. We frightened whoever it was off. But please, come, see for yourself that he is well. Tyler tried to gauge Wintinta's reaction to the news that someone in Bandera tried to kill his son. But no expression at all crossed the Comanche's face as he followed Miss Quinn. Tyler falling in behind. She led them down the short hall and stood to the side to permit Wintinta to enter. Tyler stood in the doorway, watching as the boy greeted his father with joy and excitement. As father and son conversed in Comanche, Miss Quinn jerked her head for Tyler to come with her. I asked Sheriff Barker to come. She said, her voice low. He's in the kitchen with my mother. Victor was indeed in the kitchen, finishing up what smelled like a bacon, eggs, fried potato and bread breakfast. He wiped up egg yolk with a hunk of bread and stuffed it into his mouth, catching sight of Tyler. 
What are you doing here, Tyler? He asked, his mouth full. I brought the kids pa. He replied. Are you here professionally or just to eat these ladies out of house and home? Both. Victor wiped his mouth on a napkin. Miss Quinn tell you what happened? Mrs. Quinn pulled out a chair. Please sit, Mr. Price. Would you care for some breakfast? We have plenty. I don't mind if I do. Tyler sat his hat on the back of the chair and sat down at the table. Miss Quinn also sat, though she perched on the edge of it and didn't relax comfortably. I heard noises coming from Tosahui's room. She began, clicking her thumbnails together, last night. I went in and saw him jump back out the window, he must have heard me coming. He tried to kill the boy? Tyler asked out she nodded. Strangling him. There are bruises around his throat. But with Johnson still in jail. Victor said, sitting back in his chair with a deep sigh. We have no clue who it was. Are you going to try the surveillance now? Tyler asked, a trace of bitterness in his tone. Sure. Victor replied easily, his blue eyes hard on Tyler. Once I deputize you. Mrs. Quinn brought a laden plate to Tyler and set it in front of him. There you are, Mr. Price. Charlene, be a dear and go ask Tosahoy's father if he wants breakfast. Miss Quinn obediently rose from her chair and left the kitchen, leaving Tyler to dig into his tasty food and watch Mrs. Quinn unobtrusively. From what he had heard about her, she was so sunk in her grief after losing her husband and sons that she barely functioned. And now she busily cooked, cared for the Comanche boy, and bossed her daughter around. He glanced at Victor. All right. He said. Do it, deputize me. I'll bunk outside the house of a night. Miss Quinn ushered Wintenta into the kitchen, urging him to sit at the table with Tyler and Victor. That won't be necessary, Mr. Price. She said firmly. We can look after ourselves in Tosahui. Victor stood up, greeting Wintenda with a clasp of their forearm to forearm. I'm Sheriff Barker, and I'm doing everything I can to protect your boy. These are good people, and he is in the right hands. The big Comanche sat down, nodding his thanks as Mrs. Quinn set a full plate in front of him. Perhaps he should return to his people where he needs no such protection. Victor also sat back down, scowling. Now, you know he ain't fit to go any place, chief. You try, and his leg is like to fall apart again. Tyler observed with interest that Winton to ate his food with a knife and fork, as though quite familiar with how the white folks use them. You know English quite well, he said, still eating his own. How'd you learn it? I went to the mission school when I was young. Winton to answered. Learned some of your white man's ways, taught by the preacher there, then went home to my people. Miss Quinn stood by her mother, watching Tyler and Winton to eat. We will protect Dosahui, sir. She said. But the sheriff is right. You could cause too much harm to him if you were to move him now. Winton to regarded her for a moment, his expression neutral. Perhaps I and some of my people may camp here, watch over him. Victor shook his head even before Winton to finished speaking. Now, I'm not a man to deny a father his son, chief. He said sternly. But that would only aggravate the situation. Now if the Quinn ladies will agree to letting Tyler here sleep outside the boy's window. And if I made nightly walks past the house, I think our little problem will take care of itself. Tyler nodded. If folks see that this house is guarded, whoever tried to hurt Tosahui will think twice before trying again. Winton to continue to eat as he thought, Tyler caught Miss Quinn's eye and said, Well, Miss Quinn? Might you abide me bedding down outside your house? I wasn't asked. Mrs. Quinn piped up. But I for one will not worry so much about the boy if you did. It was only pure luck Charlene heard something and interfered. At last. Miss Quinn nodded. I will agree also. But what about your work on your property, Mr. Price? He shrugged. I'll ride home in the morning and do what I need to do, 
then come back here in the evening. Winton to glanced around at all of them. I am grateful for all that you have done for Tosahui. Nor will I forget it. I am obligated to you. Victor placed his hands on the table in preparation for rising. Now that's all settled, I have a prisoner to feed. Mrs. and Miss Quinn, should you see anyone lurking around who don't belong here, you let me know. We will, Miss Quinn replied with a slight smile. Miss Quinn escorted him from the kitchen to the front door, seeing him out. Mrs. Quinn picked up plates from the table. Wintenta, please feel free to stop by and visit Tosahoy any time you wish. He has been a delight to have in our home. You are most gracious, madam. You can also camp on my property until your boy is healed. Tyler added. But if you take any cattle, let me know. Wintenta inclined his head. We will not butcher any of your cattle without your permission. Miss Quinn rushed back into the kitchen, her thick red braid flopping over her shoulder to her hip. Her porcelain face tight with worry. I think you gentlemen should come quick. Something happened to the sheriff. Chapter 7 Aaron Dawson dug his spurs hard in his bay horse's hide. Run. He yelled. At a dead run across the dusty land choked with piles of rock, prickly pear and thickets of oak, mesquite and cedar trees. Aaron led his brothers into the blazing heat of nearly noon. The merciless sun turned their mounts sweat into lather. The beasts laboring to run hard over the harsh plains of central Texas. Glancing back, Aaron observed with trepidation that the plume of dust had grown larger. The posse still hard on their trail. Damn it! He muttered. How'd they know which way we went? Someone must have been watching us. Franklin hollered, riding close to his horse's flank. Pointed us out. Our dust ain't helping, neither. George pointed out. They could spot us ten miles out, it's so dry. Just like we saw them. Aaron replied, scanning the region they rode into. These horses can't keep up the pace. Not for long. Neither can the posses. Franklin answered. Aaron shot him a fierce glare. You don't know that. We'll have to find a place and lay an ambush. Are you crazy? George yelled. There must be twenty of them back there. You want to roll over and die, you go ahead. Aaron snarled. Me, I'm gonna fight. Lashing his exhausted horse with his reins as well as spurring for all he was worth, Aaron raced across the desert-like landscape. Dodging large clumps of prickly pear and frightening small deer into flight. If he didn't find a place to make a stand, he knew his mount would die under him. Crashing to the dusty ground. Fear that he would never permit his brothers to see niggled at the back of his mind. Without their horses, they would either join Benji in prison or hang. I'll do neither. I'll go down fighting. His horse's stumbling grew more frequent. Threatening to toss Aaron over its neck. He started to lean down and pull his rifle from its scabbard. Prepared to turn the beast around and charge their pursuers. His gun blazing. Then he saw it. A tall cluster of rocks at least fifty feet in height stood dead ahead. A place they might climb and shoot down on the posse from above. While it wasn't exactly the situation he might have desired. For he knew that he could not kill them all this way. He hoped that he might convince them to hunt other prey elsewhere. To the rocks. He yelled. Put the horses behind them. Reining around to the far side of the rock tower, Aaron dismounted before his horse even stopped galloping. He yanked his rifle free, quickly wrapping his reins around a rock. The climb proved treacherous, with stones all but rolling out from under their boots. But he and his brothers made it to the top. Lying on their bellies, hidden behind the red and gray stones, Aaron and his brothers aimed down their rifle sights, waiting for the posse to come into range. Don't let them get around behind us. Aaron ordered. If that happens, then they get to the horses. That's not gonna happen. George said, his tone grim as he lay beside his older brother. They'll learn the cost of chasing the Dawson gang. Peering down his sight, Aaron relaxed, breathing in slowly, 
waiting for his first victim to gallop within range. Within moments, the posse, twenty or so strong as George had said, rode hard toward the rock tower. A huge plume of dust kicked up behind them. Centering his sight on the leader, a gold star on his chest. Aaron squeezed his trigger. His shot knocked the lawman off his horse. Shouts and yells of alarm resounded across the distance as his brother's rifle sparked. Two more men and a horse crashed to the ground as the posse, slammed into one another in their haste to ride away, and out of gun range. Aaron's next shot took another man in the back. For he saw the man jerk in the saddle, but he did not fall. Within seconds, the posse had retreated well out of range of their rifles, leaving behind their dead. Peering through the swirling dust cloud and over the distance, Aaron watched them regroup, some dismounting to help the wounded. While he felt glad they retreated, he also knew that the posse stopping rather than continue to flee meant they were determined to catch him and his brothers. Why ain't they running? George asked. They should be running. Because they know that our horses are exhausted and they can surround us. Aaron replied grimly. We got to skin out right now before they get organized. But our horses can't go no further. Elmer cuffed George upside his head. Just do as you're told, boy. I ain't no boy. George retorted as he slipped backward down the slope before turning. And quit hitting me, Elmer. Lunging down the side of the tower. Trying not to break a leg or an ankle on the rocks that tried to roll out from under him, Aaron hit level ground. Untying his blowing horse, he threw himself into his saddle as his brothers scrambled into theirs. From the fast glance over his shoulder, he saw the posse racing around both sides of the rock formation, trying to cut them off. Leaving his reins on his bay's neck, Aaron fired his rifle at their pursuers. His brothers also fired their guns, two horses belonging to the posse tumbled tails over noses. Their riders thrown into the dirt. The rest fell back, slowing their mounts. Turning back to see to the injured. Woohoo! George screamed in triumph. We're free. Aaron ground his teeth. We aren't in the clear yet, stupid. He barked. They'll be out for blood now, and nothing will stop them this time. They'll be after us again within an hour. Franklin said, his tone grim, dust covering the lenses of his spectacles. Their horses are better than ours. It won't take them long to catch up. Aaron slowed his gasping mount, thinking to spare them as much as possible until they could find fresh horses. Isn't there a town around here? He asked. Elmer jerked his thumb over his shoulder, scowling. We just left it. Frustrated, Aaron stood in his stirrups, trying to see what may lie ahead of them. Surely. There are some ranches where we might steal fresh horses around here. To the north lay a line of low hills. Aaron reined his spent horse in that direction, keeping the animal in a swift trot. Always glancing over his shoulder for signs the chase had begun again. He saw nothing but knew he soon would. Maybe we can see something from up there. He said, pointing to the hills. The heat bore down on him like the weight of an anvil sweat stinging his eyes as it poured down his face and torso. Thirst blistered his throat. Picking up his canteen from his saddle horn, he tipped his head back to let a trickle of warm water flow down it. Shaking it to determine how much remained within it. He then replaced the cap. Not enough water. He grumbled. None of us have enough. Elmer said, taking a quick drink from his own. We didn't think to refill them in town. Swearing under his breath at their lack of foresight before riding out into the vast Texas landscape with money. But nothing to keep them alive in a posse on their trail. Aaron spurred his bay up the slope of the hill. Forcing it up over the rocky ground littered with mesquite and prickly pear. He risked a glance below. Damn it, he muttered. There they are. The dust cloud followed them toward the hills, moving slower than they had been yet inexorably catching up to the Dawson gang. He could truly not estimate how many there were, but if he discounted the ones dead, injured or unhorsed. That left about a dozen gunmen to their four. What are we gonna do, Aaron? George asked, 
staring helplessly at the cloud. Our horses are dead on their feet. We ride until they are dead. Move out. Blood flecked his spurs as Aaron forced the bay up and up to the crest of the hill, then cantered down the far side. Turning west again, he cantered along the ravine between the hills, always watching over his shoulder, fearing to see horsemen ride over the top behind them. His brothers loped on his heels, their faces tight and grim. I don't want to hang. George moaned, his terror of the posse clear. They're gonna hang us for sure. Stop whining. Aaron snarled at him, wishing his brother rode within striking distance of his fist. They'll shoot us deader in dog meat before they hang us. I don't want to get shot, neither. Just tried, you moron. On the plains to either side of them, Aaron noticed cattle grazing, too far away to be useful, but their presence told him a ranch might be nearby. Cattle ranches had horses. Keep an eye out for the ranch. He ordered his brothers. It might be close. Behind them, the posse topped the hills, the savage sun winking on the metal of their rifles. In a wave of horse flesh, they rode down into the ravine, closer than ever if Aaron was any judge of distance. Desperate, he gazed around for any kind of cover and saw none. Fear rose from his stomach into his chest, though he kept his face grim, never letting his fear be seen. Elmer suddenly pointed. Is that a house? He yelled. Aaron peered through the mirages that danced over the ground, seeing only dark humps that may or may not be a human habitation. Ride hard, boys. Aaron ordered. If we don't get there quick, we're dead meat. Chapter 8 Mr. Price and Winton to bolted out of the house, Charlene on their heels. Stay with Tosahui, mother. She called over her shoulder as she hiked her skirts and ran as fast as she could. But, she could never keep up with the long, athletic legs of the two men. Up ahead in the street, Sheriff Parker laid on his face, his dunk gelding standing over him. Men and women ran into the packed dirt street toward the fallen sheriff. After taking a moment to watch Parker ride away, Charlene had turned to the house. From the corner of her eye, she saw him topple from his mount. I didn't hear a gunshot. What could have happened? Tyler and Winton to reached him at the same time several townsfolk did. By the time Charlene arrived, a ring of strong backs had surrounded the man on the ground. Many yelling for someone to get Dr. McFadden. She pushed her way through the mass until she reached the front and joined Mr. Price and Winton to at Sheriff Barker's side. What happened? She asked, bending over Mr. Price's shoulder as he rolled the sheriff onto his back. He was plugged with a rock replied a stout woman in the crowd. I saw it. Hit him square on the side of his head. Charlene frowned. Did you see who threw it? It was one of the Miller boys. The woman stated firmly. All three were there, but it was the oldest that threw the rock. Mr. Price's voice drew her attention back to Sheriff Barker. Vic? Come on, Vic. Talk to me now. Blood trickled in a thin stream down Barker's temple, his eyes rolling back in his head as he fought to regain consciousness. Dang it, Tyler, cork it and leave me be. Can't do that, Vic. Mr. Price replied amiably. You're blocking traffic. Charlene tried to close her ears to the string of swear words that Sheriff flung at Tyler, blushing furiously. Turning her head away as though that would halt the flow. She found several women in bonnets and dresses with eyes wide and mouths in round us of shock. No few men looked embarrassed. Jean and Harold both stood nearby, gaping, Jean fanning her face with her hand. Her countenance horrified, blushing as furiously as Charlene. Now you need to cease that cussing Vic. Tyler warned him. As you're embarrassing all these fine people. Barker blinked dirt from his eyes, his jaw slack gaping up at the ring of faces staring down at him. Now, I'll be a mangy dog. He muttered. Help me up. Tyler reached his hand down to clasp the sheriff's and pulled him to his feet. Both Tyler and Winton to kept their hands on his shoulders as he swayed, his hands to his head, in case he collapsed again. What happened? He asked. 
my head hurts like someone took an axe to it. According to this lady here, Mr. Price replied, gesturing toward the stout matron. A kid threw a rock at you. Sheriff Barker peered at the woman. Which kid? The oldest Miller boy, Sheriff. She replied, pointing down the street. I saw him throw it and knock you off your horse. Then they ran that way. I reckon them boys are gonna keep old Johnson company for a day or two. He said, his voice hard. Gazing around at the small crowd, he shook off Tyler's and went into his helping hands and scowled, wiping at the blood on his left temple. Y'all go on now. He demanded, his voice raised. Show's over. Be about your business. With mutters and murmurs, and plenty of head shaking, the townsfolk did as he ordered and dispersed, eventually leaving only Charlene, Tyler, Winton and Sheriff Barker remaining in the middle of the street. Barker picked up the reins to his horse. A familiar figure wearing a black coat and a derby hat, clutching a black bag, hurried toward them. Sheriff Barker's frown deepened, his mustache quivering as Dr. McFadden arrived at a panting halt beside him. What are you about, Doc? Barker asked almost rudely. I heard my services were needed. Dr. McFadden replied, his scowl matching the sheriff's. Had I known it was you, you old coot. I would never have bothered. Well, I don't need you, Doc. Sheriff Barker snapped, slapping the dust from his clothes with his hat, then settled it back on his head. It's just a dang knock on the head. And as hard as your head is, Barker, you sure don't need me. Dr. McFadden tipped his hat to Charlene with politeness. But his eyes remained cold when he looked at her. Charlene knew he would never forgive her for blackmailing him into setting to Sahoy's broken leg. She found she didn't truly care, either. Striding briskly back the way he had come, Dr. McFadden turned a corner and vanished. Tyler and Winton to stood back as Barker mounted his horse, then tipped his hat to Charlene. Much obliged for the assist, boys. Barker said. I'm off to run down those rascals and teach them what happens to boys who throw rocks. Ma'am. Setting his horse into a trot, he rode in the direction the woman pointed toward. Charlene glanced at the apple tree store, realizing she was already late for her work. I must go, gentlemen. She said to Tyler and went into. Mother will care for Tosahui, but I'm running late. Tyler lifted his hat briefly from his head in respect. Then I expect I will head for my ranch. I'll return at sundown, Miss Quinn. Thank you for your willingness to watch over Tosahui. Charlene said, mesmerized by his storm gray eyes. And my mother and me. It is my pleasure, ma'am. Offering them both a quick smile, Charlene made her way toward the general store. Thinking about Tyler, his kindness, as well as fascinated by his extraordinary good looks. Though she refused to count herself among the gaggle of women who followed him around. Staring at him, she understood what pulled them to him. For she. Herself was drawn to his personality, his warmth, and his strength as well as his attractiveness. Opening the door to the apple tree general mercantile, she reached to untie her bonnet only to discover she hadn't put it on before rushing to Sheriff Barker's aid. Jean stood behind the counter as the Winston widows examined rolls of lace and ribbons. All three glanced up at the sound of the door chime. I'm so sorry I'm late Jean. She said hurrying forward to fetch her apron from the office behind the curtain. I wanted to make sure Sheriff Barker was all right. Of course, you did, dear. Jean replied, pulling another roll of lace from a drawer to show the sisters. How are you, child? Miss Harriet asked with a piercing glance at Charlene as she passed the trio. You forgot your bonnet again. Miss Darla said imperiously. That sun is too strong for a lady with your skin color to be without a bonnet. I am quite well, thank you. Charlene replied, tying her apron as she returned from the office. Yes, I'll remember it, Miss Darla. How is your mother? Miss Harriet inquired as Charlene began her cleaning chores. Charlene wasn't fooled. 
She knew the two ladies had come to the store not in search of lace or ribbons, but for fresh gossip. Setting her broom to the floor, she swept, wondering why they weren't pestering Sheriff Barker for word of his troubles less than a half hour passed. Then she chided herself for being uncharitable, for the two ladies had been very kind to her and her mother. She is well, also, Miss Harriet. She answered, giving them a small smile. Still looking after the Indian boy. I heard that Comanche in town was his father. Miss Darla said, her bright eyes reminding Charlene of a curious bird. That is true. Charlene focused on sweeping the almost non-existent dirt from the wood floor. Mr. Price brought him. A very kind man, Mr. Price. Jean added, tossing Charlene a significant glance. Just the kind of man we need in this town. Charlene tried hard to ignore the very pointed hint in Jean's comment yet found that notion more difficult than she liked. Mr. Price intrigued her. And not just because he saved her life the previous day. He was inarguably a fascinating man. I'm sure. Was all she murmured. Miss Harriet and Miss Darla finally decided on what lace they liked best. Making Charlene suspect they had run out of excuses for staying in the store. Hoping for more juicy tidbits of information they could spread around Bandera. After Jean cut the lengths they needed, she graciously accepted their coins in payment. Remember your bonnet, dear. Miss Darla said as she patted Charlene's cheek in passing. Yes, ma'am. To give your mother our love. Miss Harriet opened the door, eyeing Charlene. Yes, ma'am. The widows swept out of the apple tree like grand dames. Their heads held high and proud. Charlene watched them go, crossing the storefront window before disappearing from sight. Did they get what they wanted, Jean? She asked, resuming her cleaning. If you're asking if they found the gossip they desired. Jean replied, her tone dry. Then I suppose they did. She glanced at Charlene with a grin. Your notoriety is good for our business. Here, here, said Harold from the office. Aren't you supposed to be unloading a wagon? Jean demanded, her fist on her hip as she glared at the curtain. Woman, you work me harder than a peddler's mule. At least a peddler's mule works. Now get out there before it gets too hot. Charlene heard the scrape of a chair against wood at the same time a loud pain sigh drifted out from behind the curtain. She chuckled to herself, always entertained by the bickering between her employers. Perhaps you should stand over him with a buggy whip. She suggested, sweeping what little dirt she found into a pan. Jean huffed. Then he'll complain that I'm a slave driver. You are. Came Harold's voice, slightly further away as he ambled toward the storeroom. Jean untied her apron. I'm going back to the house for a spell. Neither Ben nor Matt had much appetite this morning. And I fear they may be coming down with something. You are in charge, Charlene. I hope it's nothing serious. Charlene said, taking her broom to the back. Jean headed toward the front door. Their school teacher mentioned other children remaining at home due to colds. I'm sure it's just that. Alone with her thoughts, except when customers came in, Charlene went about her work. She could not seem to get Tyler off her mind, yet she could also admit to herself that she didn't try very hard. His gray eyes seemed to follow her everywhere, his sweet, uncomplicated smile and handsome face gave her the happy shivers. Funny. She muttered to herself as she closed and locked up the shop at the end of the day. I never knew what a happy shiver was until today. Upon returning home, Charlene discovered Tyler had already arrived, his horse stabled at the livery as he told her later. Olivia had prepared a roast chicken with carrots and potatoes with gravy and insisted he join them. Mrs. Quinn He protested, his dark brown hat in his hand, shifting from foot to foot. I had thought to eat at the hotel, ma'am, not to burden you with the likes of feeding me. Nonsense. Olivia snorted. Thanks to you, we have more than enough to go around. And if you are going to be here on a daily basis for a while, you may call me Olivia, 
and my daughter Charlene. Why, thank you, ma'am, Tyler replied. A small grin curving his mouth. I'd be pleased if you'd both call me Tyler. Busy setting the table for three, Charlene found the familiarity of using first names more comfortable than she thought she might. Tyler was a man she could feel at ease with, and it was clear by her mother's behavior that she, too, liked having him around. How well did Tosahoy do today, mother? Olivia waved her hands, pleased. He is such a nice boy, Charlene. We sat and talked for hours, and I never understood a single word he said. Tyler chuckled. If I may, ladies, I'd like to look in on him. You go right ahead, Tyler. Olivia replied, busy cutting bread from a loaf. I'll be bringing his supper into him directly. For a moment, Charlene and Tyler stared at one another, sharing a warm moment, an understanding, of the changes wrought in Olivia by having To Sahoy under their roof. Where once she had been deep within herself in a shell created by her grief. She had discovered a new purpose. She devoted herself to the Comanche boy as she might have her own child. Tyler sent her a rapid wink and a swift upward curving of his lips and left the kitchen doorway to walk to Tosahoy's room. Another happy shiver crept down Charlene's spine, a warmth in her heart that hadn't been there in a very long time gave her something to think about. Perhaps Tosahoy didn't bring new hope to just mother. He brought it to me, also. Despite Olivia's protests, Tyler helped clean up after supper, putting dishes away after Charlene dried them. The only men in her life had been her father and brothers. And they never helped with housework. Thus Tyler's presence in the kitchen baffled her. But she liked it. She enjoyed his nearness and his warm smile. The evening felt far too hot for a fire, thus, with Tosahui asleep in the house. The three sat companionably on the porch as dusk fell away under the onslaught of full night. Crickets chirped in the shrubbery while fireflies flashed in the dark. A few blocks away, piano music drifted from the saloon on the light breeze. People still walked or rode through town at this early hour. Perhaps going to the saloon for beer or whiskey and a card game. Tomorrow is Sunday, Olivia said. Will you escort Charlene to services in the morning, Tyler? Sure will, ma'am. Tyler replied. What about you? Would I not escort the both of you? No, no, Olivia replied quickly. Just Charlene. The words that would insist Olivia come with them to church rose to Charlene's throat, then died there. Her mother hadn't attended services since the funerals of her father and brothers. Though Olivia had made significant progress toward her old self, Charlene suspected she wasn't quite ready to face that or the town's congregation. I will still be happy to do so. Tyler continued. I haven't been to church myself in a long while. Then, it is good that you go. What prompted you to move to Bandera, Tyler? Charlene asked. Where did you move from? For a long moment, Tyler stared out over the dark street without answering. Charlene thought she had crossed some sort of invisible boundary, though her question seemed innocent enough. Tyler, at last, drew a deep breath and offered her a lopsided smile. Let's just say I needed a new direction in my life. He replied. A fresh start. I had been through this area several years ago and liked it, so I thought this would be the place to begin again. You made a very good choice. Olivia commented as though not noticing his previous hesitation. Bandera is a lovely town. Tyler rose. I'm off to make a bed outside the boys' window, ladies. I'll be off before first light. Sleep well. Watching him stride down the porch steps and around to the back of the house, Charlene could not help but wonder if he was hiding something. A man with no past who comes to town and buys a ranch yet refuses to speak made her slightly suspicious of him. What if he is running from the law, a wanted criminal? Chapter 9 Lashing his exhausted horse with his reins, Aaron Dawson forced it across the desolate landscape pockmarked with prickly pear and mesquite. The ranch house grew large in his sight, amidst a collection of a barn, a small bunkhouse, sheds, corrals and horses. His brothers, cursing, also flogged their mounts mercilessly. 
driving ever onward toward the habitation. Three young girls played in the yard outside the house as they bore down on the property. Aaron recognizing their only chance to get out of this manhunt alive. The children, innocent and trusting, smiled and pointed at the visitors. Aaron suspected they didn't get many guests way out here in this incredibly remote location. Hauling sharply on his reins, his horse's rear quarters sliding under it as it came to a frantic rearing halt, he threw himself out of his saddle. His brothers also curbed their mounts just feet from the little girls. At the same instant, a man and a woman came out onto the porch, perhaps drawn outside by the sounds of hooves. Hello. The tallest girl began as Aaron strode toward her, yanking his gun from its holster. He seized her around her waist lifting her, pointing his pistol at her head, his lips drawn back from his teeth. Grab them. He barked, his eyes on the parents, who suddenly realized the peril their daughters were in. Don't hurt my babies, screamed the mother, lifting her skirts to run down the steps at the same moment Elmer and Franklin both grabbed the now panicked child. The father, his face a mask of fear and anger, also started toward Aaron and his brothers. Don't move. Aaron ordered. I'll kill her. Both parents froze on the steps, the mother holding her hands to her lower face, her blue eyes bulging from their sockets. The ranch owner, too, appeared close to panic. His hands clenched into fists as he stared at his daughters in the hands of Aaron and his brothers. Guns pointed at their heads. What do you want? The man cried, his voice shaking. Don't hurt them. They're just children. The girls themselves had begun to cry and scream. The child in Aaron's arms struggled to escape him. She kicked and pounded his arm with her small hands, her voice high in a piercing shriek. Stop yelling. He yelled, half turning to glare at the other two. Quiet down now or we'll shoot you. Elmer and Franklin snapped at the kids in their hands, ordered them to quiet down while George pointed his rifle at the parents. As the girls obeyed, ceasing their screams even if they continued to cry, Aaron saw the posse approaching. He jerked his pistol toward them, turning his eyes on the father. Get out there! He snapped. Tell that posse to back off, or we'll kill everyone here, starting with these kids. Go now. All right. He said, his hands rising over his head. Just don't hurt my wife and daughters. No one will get hurt unless you don't do what I say. Now you yell loud and clear to them boys out there. Loud so I can hear you. Hurry it up. Trotting, his hands in the air, the man ran out of his yard toward the approaching riders. Stop. He yelled out, his voice carrying across the distance. They have my family hostage. Dust swirled in a huge cloud around the band of men as they reined in their horses to a stop and gathered into a tight bunch. Aaron watched closely as the father walked toward them, pointing back over his shoulder. Though he was now a fair distance away, Aaron heard him shout clearly to the posse. They say they'll kill my family if you don't back off. The father repeated, waving his hands toward the house. Do as they say. Please. One of the posse stood up in his stirrups, calling over the distance. That you, Aaron Dawson? You killing women and children now? I won't if you ride back the way you came. Aaron yelled back. Now, you boys turn around and head out. Right now. These fine children will travel with us for a while. If you're not chasing us, we'll let them go, unharmed. Why should we trust a rotten, murdering scoundrel like you? You got no choice, mister. Aaron shot back. You come any closer, or follow after us, we kill them. If we die, so do these helpless girls. The posse leader sat back down in his saddle, conferring with his men. The rancher, his hands still up, turned his head back and forth between Aaron and his brothers. And the band of men. Aaron glanced around to make certain no ranch hands thought to sneak up. And get the drop on them noting the wary stance of Elmer and Franklin, of George with his rifle still aimed at the weeping mother. All right, shouted the leader. We'll back off. Let the children go. 
not until we have fresh horses, and are miles from here. Aaron yelled. Papa here will find them safe before the coyotes do. He laughed harshly. Now, turn them horses around and ride hard. We'll find you again, Dawson. The leader warned him. We'll shoot you dead on sight. You and your brothers. Not bothering to reply, Aaron watched with satisfaction as the dozen or so riders reined their horses around and rode away at a gallop. Not trusting that they wouldn't simply hide, waiting for him to drop his guard. Aaron motioned to the father. Get back here, Papa. He ordered. Obediently, the rancher returned, his eyes flicking nervously among his brothers and his daughters. Tell your wife to come here. George, you find a high spot and watch that posse. I want to make sure they're skinning out and not hiding. The man motioned to his wife at the same time George lowered his rifle and ran to a nearby cedar tree. Its branches low and thick, its needles shading a good portion of the yard. He set his rifle at the tree's trunk, then climbed like a squirrel into its branches. Peering in the direction the posse rode in. Maggie, do what he says. The father told her when his wife hesitated. At last, she finished walking down the steps and strode fearfully toward Aaron. What do you want from us? She demanded, obviously trying to appear unafraid. I want four fresh horses, good ones, from that corral. Aaron replied, Papa, you take ours and saddle them with our gear. Elmer there will make sure you don't pick out something that'll go lame after a mile. Elmer, you make sure he gives us good ones. Elmer nodded, taking the now quiet child with him as the rancher picked up the reins to their blowing and lathered horses. Leading them to the hitching rail near the corral, he tied them and began loosening cinches under Elmer's watchful eye. Aaron turned toward George in the tree. What you see up there? He called. They're riding away Aaron. George returned, his voice carrying clearly. Back toward them hills we crossed. Stay up there and make sure they don't split up or just stay in the hills. From up there, you should see their dust from a long way. Turning his attention back to the rancher, Aaron observed him leading horses from the corral. Elmer saying something to him. But he was too far away to hear what he said. Even at this distance, the horses the man chose appeared to be sound. With stout legs and broad chests for stamina. He stripped their exhausted mounts of their saddles, throwing them on the backs of the new ones, then cinched them up. About thirty minutes later, the rancher, followed by Elmer, led the newly saddled and bridled horses back to Aaron and Franklin. George shinnied back down the tree. They're gone, Aaron. He reported. Just like you told them to. Good. Aaron stared at the rancher, motioning him with his gun to step away from the horses and move toward his wife. Now, mister, you give us an hour before you follow after us. I see you tacking after us any closer, and we'll shoot these girls. Got it? Leave them here, I beg you. The rancher asked, his voice quavering. The posse is gone, you don't need them as hostages anymore. Maybe not. Aaron replied as Elmer handed him the reins to a horse. But I think I'll hang on to them a bit longer, make sure you behave yourself. I wouldn't want you thinking you can run us down and shoot us in the back. I wouldn't. Aaron smirked. Not while I have your little ones you won't. And you'll let them go? He asked, his arm around his wife. You'll release them unharmed? Aaron nodded. I don't kill children. But I will if I have to, know that. Do what I say, or they, you and your pretty wife will all die. George, keep your rifle on them. George obeyed, cocking his gun and training it on the rancher. Aaron turned and hefted the girl he carried into his saddle, Elmer and Franklin doing the same. He mounted up behind her, holstering his revolver. Once all his brothers had swung into their saddles, he said. One hour. Then follow our trail and fetch your girls back. Setting his spurs to the horse, he galloped away.
glancing over his shoulder to make sure the rancher didn't run to the house for a rifle to try to shoot them in their backs before they rode into the concealing thickets of mesquite and cedar. Only after the ranch house was well out of sight did he begin to breathe easier. We got lucky there, Aaron. Franklin said from his right. If these little girls weren't right there when we needed them. We'd be dead now. Aaron answered. I know. I hate hiding behind children. Elmer said, his voice soft, speaking from behind him. Are you going to kill us? Asked the girl Aaron held, turning her head toward him. No, sweetie. Don't call me that. She said, her tone fierce. You're a bad man. Aaron chuckled. I'm at that. But I still don't kill little girls. Riding at a swift canter, Aaron led his brothers west through the harsh landscape, always keeping a sharp watch behind them. After a few miles, he spotted a pile of boulders next to a short hill surrounded by prickly pear. A tall thatch of cedar trees clustered at its base. He reined in and slid down from his saddle. Pulling the girl down, he stood her on her feet. She gazed up at him with large blue eyes as he spoke. Now, you girls get up there. He told them as Elmer and Franklin also dismounted to lower their hostages to the ground. You have plenty of shade to wait till your papa comes. From up there, you can see him coming, and let him know where you are. The girl, Erin guessed her age to be around eight, took her sisters by their hands and hurried with them to the rock formation. He watched them wriggle through the prickly pear and climb up. Then seat themselves in the shade. The littlest child began to cry again as Aaron and his brothers remounted. Will they be safe? Elmer asked as they trotted away, casting worried glances over his shoulder as the girls and the hill fell behind. Their pa will find them. Aaron replied. We left a trail a blind man could follow. Unless the coyotes find them first. Elmer replied grimly. Chapter 10 Freshly washed, his long black hair brushed back and tucked under his hat, his dusty boots newly shined, Tyler stood on the Quinn's front porch. Olivia had told him that Charlene would be out soon, ready for him to escort her to church services. He gazed out over Bandera as he waited, observing the townsfolk headed toward the church and its tolling bell. Sorry for making you wait. Turning, he found Charlene emerging from the front door instantly sweeping his hat from his head. For a moment, words he might have replied stuck in his throat. Her large hazel eyes smiled up at him, her red hair hanging loose to flow like a silken river down her back. Charlene wore a white gown trimmed in pink lace and had pinned a small hat with pale pink flowers atop her head. Uh, that's quite all right. He stammered, his voice loosened at last. May I say you are the most beautiful young lady I think I have ever laid eyes on. Charlene lowered her eyes, flushing a color that matched her flowers exactly. Thank you, Tyler. That is very kind of you to say. Not kind, ma'am. Honest. Putting his hat back on his head, Tyler extended his arm to her. Perhaps we should head to church? Of course. Having long since learned to ignore the attention he received from women, Tyler felt no little shock when he observed the lightning glances of jealousy and ire that were shot toward Charlene. Strolling to the church amid the other people, Charlene's hand resting lightly on his arm. Several of the young females who tended to follow him when he was in town glared at her. Then swiftly altered their nasty expressions when they caught his eye. Concerned for her, Tyler glanced down into Charlene's face, hoping she hadn't noticed. She gave him a small quirky grin her eyes sparkling in the sun. I expect I'm not very popular these days. I apologize if this bothers you. She waved her free hand airily. Don't be absurd. If they wish to vent their spleens, they know where to find me. Tyler chuckled. I expect they'll keep their opinions to themselves, Charlene. You can be rather formidable when you want to be. Ambling into the church. Tyler removed his hat and sat down with her in a pew. The two widow biddies that helped her home the day she was attacked waved to them cheerily, and Charlene waved back. Sweetest whole things. 
she murmured to him. But they are such terrible gossips. I expect every town has to have a few of them. He replied, glancing around at the almost filled church. The Maple family, sitting across the aisle from them, also waved to them, their young boys gazing curiously. Returning the warm gestures, Tyler asked, Would you like to ride out with me today? Maybe pay a visit to my ranch? Charlene lowered her hand, her body growing still. She didn't answer immediately, making Tyler fear she would say no. He held his breath, willing her to say yes. At last, she nodded, giving him a swift glance and a smile. I would like that. Very much. Good. After service, I'll get a horse from the livery stable. Only half listening to the preacher, Tyler stole many glances at Charlene. Where she was concerned, his willpower vanished. And he could not stop himself from admiring her exceptional loveliness as well as her fire and strength of personality. Slender as a willow branch, but tougher than an old oak root, Charlene captivated him. Brought forth feelings from deep within him he had not felt for a long time. Once the service was over, he and Charlene, again subjected to the hot stares of her rivals, stood outside the church with the Maples and Victor. Mrs. Maple held an almost constant secret smile over her features as they chatted, her sons dashing off to play with their friends. Yet, Victor's scowl might have turned the bright, hot sunshine to dark thunderclouds. I can't find the Miller boys anywhere. He complained, a purple and black bruise covering the left side of his head and face. Their ma ain't seen them for days. Harold nodded, offering a slight shrug. What did you expect? After their father took off, Mrs. Miller is trying to raise them alone. She can't control them. Yep. Victor agreed. Them boys are like a pack of coyotes, always starting trouble for someone. They'll come back eventually. Mrs. Maple said. They have no other place to go. Maybe they took off for the hills. Victor touched the side of his head, wincing. Best thing for this town if they don't. Mrs. Maple huffed. Sheriff, they are still only boys. They can be redeemed. Huh. Victor's skeptical expression told Tyler what he thought of that notion. He glanced at Tyler. You up for a beer anytime soon? I'm taking Charlene out for a ride this afternoon. Tyler replied, observing Mrs. Maple's smile widen. Maybe after. Dang foolish to be riding in this heat. Me, I'm gonna take a nap. This sun is frying my brains. Ladies. Tipping his hat, Victor hooked his thumbs in his belt and ambled off down the dusty street. Mrs. Maple gave Charlene a quick hug. You two have fun. We will, Charlene answered, taking Tyler's arm once more. You are not concerned about riding with me without an escort? Tyler asked, curious, as he walked her back to her house. He found it interesting that neither the Maples nor Victor were the least bit worried about Charlene's safety while alone with him. She peered up at him, a small mysterious smile playing around her mouth. Were you planning to commit violence upon my person? Shocked, Tyler blurted, No, of course not. I expect I have no need for a chaperone, then. Tyler grinned, shaking his head. You are a remarkable lady, Charlene. No, she replied. I think I'm a decent judge of character. Leaving her at her house to change her clothes and inform her mother where they were going, Tyler strode to the livery stable where he passed the livery owner six bits to rent a horse for Charlene. After saddling both his own bay and the small gray mare the stableman led out to him. Tyler then rode back to her house. He discovered both Charlene and Olivia awaiting him on the porch. Charlene now garbed in a dark gray skirt, divided for riding, and a white sunbonnet. She had braided her hair into a long rope that fell to her hip, her small, slender body still fascinating him. Olivia offered him a shy smile. Once again amazing Tyler with her trust in him. How is Tosahui faring? Tyler asked as he dismounted, holding the reins to both horses. Healing fast. Olivia replied cheerfully. 
he doesn't need laudanum for the pain anymore. When I see his father, Tyler said as Charlene walked down the steps of the porch. I will let him know. Now don't you be late for supper. Olivia warned. I'm planning a nice pot roast. Never, mother. Charlene replied, rubbing the gray mare's nose. I'd be a fool to be late for that. Tyler added. He held the horse's bridle as Charlene swung expertly into her saddle. Handing the reins to her, he said. I reckon I don't have to worry about your riding skills. Charlene grinned. I learned to ride not long after I learned to walk. My father insisted on it. Tyler vaulted into his own saddle and tipped his hat to Olivia. Ma'am. Charlene nudged her gray into a trot, Tyler following, heading out toward the edge of town. Riding up beside her, he said. I heard about what happened to your father and brothers. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Charlene replied, giving him a small smile. It was very hard. Losing them, the ranch, everything. My mother, well, it's been difficult for her as you can imagine. No, I can't imagine. Tyler said. I can't imagine what you both have gone through at all. Neither of us will ever be the same again, I suppose. She gazed over at him, her smile fading. Mother used to be such a confident woman, strong, proud of her family, the ranch. She loved my father so much, adored my brothers. What happened broke her into pieces, Tyler. I reckon she's stronger than you think. He commented. Look at what she's doing for the boy. That is a minor miracle in itself. She gazed out over the rocky hills covered in mesquite and cedar, patches of prickly pear dotting the landscape. In the distance, he noticed a few head of cattle grazing amidst the thorny bushes. I'm so grateful for you bringing Tosahui to us. Tyler grinned. Actually, I brought him to town. You took him in. I suppose that is correct. Charlene said, laughing. Tyler liked her laughter, hearing it, observing how her humor lit up her face and her eyes. He liked her, enjoyed her company, relished the sound of her voice when she spoke. I don't suppose there's much I don't like about her. Among all the women who flung themselves at him for his good looks. Never had he found among them one like Charlene. You're different than other girls. He said as her laughter died away. Charlene eyed him askance. How so? Well, for one, the way I appear hasn't turned you into a blathering fool. I left my blathering fool days behind after I turned ten. She replied with a grin. As for your looks, yes, I admire them. Yet, there are more important things about people than their attractiveness. Some people care only about that. Charlene nodded. I know. But I'd prefer to search for a person's honesty, compassion, integrity, and intelligence over what they might look like. Perhaps that is what I like about you. He said. You see beyond my face. Most other girls couldn't care less if I had anything at all in my head or heart. And that makes them foolish. Tyler scarcely felt the sun beating down on his body, or the sweat trickling down under his shirt during the hour or so that they rode. Yet, when they traveled close by the Medina River and the shade trees along its banks, he suggested they pause for water and rest. Charlene agreed with a smile. I am a bit parched. She admitted, reining her horse to follow his bay. Dismounting at the water's edge, Tyler waded in, leading his horse, pleasantly surprised when Charlene waded in as well. She bent, her skirts wet, as she scooped water to her mouth with the palm of her hand. Both horses drank thirstily. Tyler only noticed how dry his own throat was after he sucked his own drink down. Now that tastes mighty good. He said, throwing the cool water over his face and head. Mind if we sit in the shade for a while? Charlene asked, leading her horse from the river. I was about to suggest it myself. Tying their horses to the lower branches of the cedar, Tyler and Charlene sat on the moist, cool ground, watching the river flow smoothly past. This land is so beautiful. 
Charlene commented, gazing across the Medina to the green hills on the far side. Much prettier than West Texas. Tyler replied with a chuckle. But this place has nothing on Colorado for beauty. She turned her head to look at him. You're from Colorado? He nodded. Mostly. I was born in Missouri, went west when I was 18 to make my fortune. Haven't made it yet, however. Charlene went back to gazing out over the land. Do you still have family? Nope. Parents passed away from the flu a few years before that. Tyler said. No brothers or sisters. Charlene was silent for a time. So, you know what it means to lose someone? Yes, ma'am, Tyler replied. I do. She smiled, even though she didn't look at him. It's nice to have someone understand what real loss is Tyler. His memory tripped over Mary, and for a long moment he, too, remained silent. I expect that's quite true. Grief, real grief that breaks your heart, isn't something that just anyone can share with you. Maybe one day you'll tell me about yours. Charlene turned her head, gazing deep into his eyes. You understand me in a way no one, not even my mother, can. Someday, I'd like to understand you. I think you already do, Charlene. Maybe. But you are also still very much a mystery. Now Tyler gazed out over the river running deep and wide in front of them. I'm a simple man with simple wants. Nothing very mysterious about that. Charlene stood up, dusted off her skirts, and bent to examine her still wet hem. I think we should start writing back. Mother will be annoyed if we're late. I wouldn't want your mother angry on my account. Tyler said, rising also. Leading their horses out from under the small grove of trees. Tyler once again held the gray mare's bridle as Charlene put her foot in the stirrup to mount. Instantly, she cried out at the same time he heard the gunshots. The gray mare reared, her front knees knocking Tyler in the chest, throwing him violently to the ground. Charlene, too, fell flat on her back, the horse snorted in panic before lunging forward. Chapter 11 Without the posse on their tails, the Dawson gang rode easily westward, sparing their mounts, stopping to sleep in their bedrolls beside a fire every night. George's rifle dropped a yearling calf as they rode across a rancher's property. After butchering it, the Dawson brothers roasted chunks of beef over the fire, eating until they could eat no more. Four days later, Aaron led them into the town of El Paso near the border with Mexico. Like many border towns, Mexicans as well as Americans drank in the saloons, bartered in the shops, talked in groups on street corners or rode through the town. Their huge sombreros on their head and the wide saddle horns on their saddles marked the vaqueros, the Mexican cowboys. That hotel there, Aaron said, pointing, looks good. It's right next to a saloon. George better not gamble away all our money. Franklin groused as they reined in at the indicated hotel. He can gamble away his share. Aaron replied, dismounting. Then he can get himself evicted from the hotel and starve. I don't always lose. George complained. I win sometimes. Not often enough. Franklin snapped. After dumping their saddlebags in their rooms, Aaron led his brothers down the street to find the livery stable at the end of town. Aaron eyed the sheriff's office as they rode by. Tomorrow, we'll pay a call on our old pal in there. He said. What if he has papers on us? George asked. He might throw us in jail. Of course, he has papers on us. Franklin snapped in an undertone. Every sheriff and federal marshal in the western United States knows about us. Then how? We catch him by surprise. Aaron, growled, glaring at his brother. Now, pipe down about it. George sulked. I was just asking. After leaving their mounts in the care of the livery stable, they ambled back up the street with the heat in El Paso almost as bad as it was further east. Yet, this was the desert without the humidity of San Antonio. And even George stopped complaining about it. 
The dry air cooled the sweat from their bodies almost immediately. Inside the dimness of the saloon, Aaron led his brothers to a table near an open window. Thankful for the light breeze that dried the sweat on his head and face as he dropped his hat on the back of his chair. Drinking their beers, Aaron glanced around the other occupants of the place. No one paid them any heed at all save the barmaid that served them and the ladies of the night who eyed them with speculation. We might need to rest our horses a day or so. Aaron said, his voice quiet. Once we have our answers from our friend, we'll have to ride hard and fast again. This time, Elmer suggested, let's skin out at night. That way, no one will know which way we went. Aaron nodded. Good plan. We'll have our chat late, then ride out, leaving the sheriff tied up. By the time he's found, we'll be long gone. So that gives me time to play some cards. George added, watching a game in progress at a table nearby. You'll get your share, Aaron said, his tone light. And no more. Nothing for food, beer, or your hotel. Got it? George nodded, still petulant. I got it. Nor will I share my winnings with you all. You're not likely to win. Franklin replied with a grin. So, we got nothing to worry about. Two nights later, as the hours fled toward dawn and the town of El Paso slept, Aaron and his brothers led their saddled horses, saddlebags stuffed with supplies, down the empty street. The temperature had dropped until the night air felt comfortable. And Aaron enjoyed the night breeze rifling through his hair. During their stay, they learned that Sheriff Lynn Potter slept in a back room of his office and the jail. Tying their horses to the hitching rail, Aaron made a shushing gesture, his finger to his lips. As though his brothers were about to speak or make a noise. He gently tested the handle of the darkened office and found it unlocked. Elmer carried lengths of stout rope in his hands as they slipped like shadows into the sheriff's office, closing the door silently behind them. Aaron's eyes had long since adjusted to the dark, and he saw well enough to not trip over any furniture as he led the way toward the back. Len Potter's snores informed him of exactly where he was, Aaron paused at the door to peer in. The sheriff lay on a cot, dressed only in his trousers and a white undershirt. His rifle leaned against a table next to his bed, and his revolver sat in its holster on his belt on the floor beside him. Expecting that the sheriff would have his arms nearby, Aaron had taken that into account when making his plans. He and his brothers fanned out, their boots making no noise on the wood floor, surrounding the cot and the man sleeping on it. Hefting a heavy towel, Aaron gave the signal to pounce. Lunging on top of the sheriff, Aaron covered his face with the towel at the same instant his brothers seized his arms and legs. Elmer half sitting on his chest. Potter woke instantly, fighting, but blinded, his limbs held down. He stood no chance against the four of them. Roll him over. Aaron ordered, his voice low. Tie him up, hands behind his back. The towel, and Aaron's strong hand over the struggling man's mouth. Effectively gagged him. Rolling him onto his side, Elmer forced Potter's hands behind his back, tied them. Then also bound his thighs and ankles together. Aaron leaned forward to speak in Potter's ear. I'm gonna take the towel off, and we'll sit you in a chair. You yell out, you're dead. All we want is some answers. Got it? Potter nodded under the towel. Aaron withdrew it, to find the sheriff glaring up at them. Elmer and Franklin lifted him with their hands under his arms as George pulled a chair over. Sitting him into it, Elmer quickly tied him to it. Showing Potter his gun, Aaron said. Like I told you. Answer our questions and no one dies. But you yell out, I'll put a bullet in your head. Who the hell are you? Potter demanded. Where did the federal marshals imprison our brother? Even in the dark, the sheriff's expression appeared confused, his brows lowered over his eyes. I reckon I ought to know who your brother is. Benjamin Dawson. Comprehension flooded Potter's face. I should have known. You're the Dawson gang. So where is Benji? Aaron asked. What prison? Potter shook his head. I have no idea, truly. 
The marshals kept their mouths shut after his trial. Told no one where they were taking him. I thought he should have hanged after what he did to that little gal. That was an accident. Elmer snapped. He didn't mean to kill her. Jury looked at it differently. Potter retorted. He was found guilty of murder. That don't matter. Aaron went on, waving at Elmer to be quiet. Why wouldn't the marshal say where they were taking him? Potter curled his lip. I expect just so you boys can't go breaking him out. Aaron nodded. That makes sense. So now, for my second question. Where is Tyler Price? What do you want him for? Potter demanded. He don't know where your brother is any more than I do. You don't know that for sure. Aaron replied. Where'd he go? East, I think. Potter replied, shrugging. San Antonio, maybe. He said something once about moving to Old Mexico and live out his days on a beach somewhere. So, he might have gone south, crossed the border. Then I expect we'll cross the border then, too. Aaron said, rolling the towel. It's only a few miles from here, and we'll be safe from the likes of you. You know the Mexicans don't want your kind in their territory. Potter sneered. They'll hang you just as fast as we will. They gotta catch us first. Aaron shoved the towel into Potter's mouth, then tied it into a rough knot behind his head. That'll keep you quiet. He said. No need to kill you, since there's nothing you can do to stop us from going south. I'm sure you'll be found in the morning. Muffled sounds emerged from Potter's mouth, but they weren't loud enough to carry to the street outside. Leaving him there to fume and stew, tied to the chair, Aaron led his brothers out of the office. Shutting the door behind him. The street was still empty and silent as they untied their horses from the rail and mounted up. Walking their horses to the edge of town, they then broke into a trot once out of earshot. The moon sank toward the west, the stars wheeling in the heavens above them. So which way we going, Aaron? George asked. East or south? East. Aaron replied. There's no way Price would have gone to Old Mexico. He might have, Aaron. Elmer said. I remember the rumors about him liking to live down that way. Aaron shook his head. We'll head for San Antonio first. We'll find him there. And when we do, we'll make him pay for what he did to Benji. That boy will die hard. Chapter 12 her arm burning as though it had been lit on fire, Charlene struggled to sit up, gasping, her head spinning. Winded from her fall, struggling to draw in a breath, she clutched her left arm with her right hand. Looking down, she discovered her sleeve soaked in blood. She remembered hearing the gunfire before the pain hit and the mare bolted. I've been shot. Looking around, she found Tyler lying on the ground, either dead or unconscious. He lay so still. Panic leapt down her throat. Oh, no. She moaned. Tyler. Staggering awkwardly to her feet, tripping over the hem of her dress, she fell to her knees beside him. Tyler? Mud and bits of grass clung to his shirt over his left shoulder, more on the side of his head. Clearly, when her mare reared and bolted, her hoofs trampled him. Stepping on his torso, striking his head. Holding her bloody fingers to his throat, she found his pulse, beating slow but strong. Thank God. She breathed, some relief spreading through her. Despite the agony that ripped through her when she moved her left arm, Charlene needed it in order to tear a strip from the hem of her skirt to bind her arm with. Awkward, using her teeth. She tightened the cloth over her upper arm and tied a small knot. Only then did she remember that she had been shot at and those who did the shooting might come looking for them. Standing, holding her breath in near panic, she gazed around the banks of the river, the hills, and saw nothing. No one marched toward her with rifle leveled, no more gunshots exploded, she didn't fall over dead with a bullet in her heart. Breathing slightly easier, she bent once more to Tyler. Shaking his uninjured right shoulder, 
Charlene tried to rouse him into consciousness, patting his cheek, calling his name. Tyler. Tyler, you have to wake up. Beginning to panic again when he didn't, she feared his head injury might be worse than it appeared. What if I can't wake him up? What then? Charlene stood up, striding to the river. Standing in the water, she let her skirt soak in it, then lifted the heavy cloth in her hands. Taking it back to him, she wrung her saturated dress over his face. That did the trick. Tyler, spluttering and snorting, raised his hands to his head, trying to ward off more water dropping into his nose and mouth. Charlene knelt beside him again, her hands grasping at his. Tyler, thank God. She cried, near tears. I was so afraid you wouldn't wake up. Tyler groaned, his right fist at his temple. That fool mare. He gritted, his jaw clenched as he fought to get up. He fell back down with another groan. My head feels like it's cracked wide open. My shoulder. She got you there, too. Charlene said, sniffing back her tears. Is it broken? Don't think so. Tyler grimaced as he tried again to get up, crying out in agony as much as Charlene did. But with her help, he stumbled to his feet. Where's the mare? He asked, trying to look around. We'll find her. Charlene replied, helping him to stand with his right arm across her neck. Can you get on your horse? Tyler, almost tripping over his own feet, leaned against the bay's saddle. A thin trickle of blood used down from the scrape in his scalp. You get up on him. Absolutely not. She snapped. She pointed imperiously at the horse, anger replacing her previous panic and fear. I am not as bad off as you. Now get on that horse, mister, this instant. He grinned, a weak grin, but there nonetheless, his gray eyes sparkling with amusement. Do you ever lose any arguments? Haven't yet. One day. He nodded wisely. One day. Charlene pointed her finger again, a silent and implacable demand for obedience. Grasping the saddle horn with his good right hand, Tyler put his foot in the stirrup and dragged himself aboard. Gasping for a breath. Sweat running in rivers down his face. His hair lank and oily, he closed his eyes and breathed raggedly. My hat. He whispered. Please. Charlene picked it up near where he had fallen, then handed it up to him. Tyler set it on his head, his legs dangling to either side of the horse. Taking the bay's reins, Charlene started walking, her wet and heavy skirts dragging at her. Her arm continued to burn, but a quick glance showed her the bleeding had mostly stopped. There. Tyler pointed. Your horse. Sure enough, the mare hadn't fled very far, and grazed on a patch of grass. Her reins tangled in a thicket of prickly pear. Leaving the bay to stand quiet, Charlene approached her, half fearing the horse would bolt again. Stepping closer, she discovered a bloody furrow in the horse's gray flank. The mare eyed her with some suspicion as Charlene untangled the reins, then turned her back toward Tyler. She didn't spook. Charlene said, her tone grim. She was shot. Damn. She all right to ride? I hope so because I didn't bring my walking shoes. Charlene glanced up in confusion as Tyler choked on his laughter, holding his right hand to his damaged arm. You need to quit making me laugh, Miss Quinn. With the bay's reins in her left hand, the grays in her right, Charlene swung into the saddle, biting off words she wasn't supposed to know a searing pain lanced both up and down from her wound. Taking a moment to simply sit, hoping the worst of it would pass. She breathed deeply for a few minutes. When she could speak, she said, I will certainly try to refrain from causing you amusement in the near future. Unbelievably, Tyler chuckled again, wincing and grimacing. Did you really say all that? You have quite the way with words. Nudging the mare into a quiet walk, Charlene led the bay by his reins, noticing Tyler kept both hands on his saddle horn. No doubt. He feared he might pass out and fall, or simply fall. I suppose so. 
she replied. My parents insisted I read a great deal all through my youth. I enjoy reading, Tyler said. But I hardly have the time. A great failing for us all, Charlene agreed. When I have any time, I am usually too tired. Glancing at the sun as it started its descent into the west, casting its yellow gold beams over the hill country. A hunting hawk called out, high overhead, its mate answering a distance away. Hawks mate for life. Charlene said, trying to spot them in the sky. Did you know that? On the bay beside her, Tyler nodded, a brief bob of his head. Yeah, I knew it. Hard to believe that some animals can have the same inclinations as people. Not all that hard to believe, Charlene. Tyler said. There is so much about the world around us we may never understand. True, I suppose. She offered him a wry grin. I can still find it fascinating though, right? Since I do, I suppose I can extend that interest to you. Now it was her turn to chuckle. Thank you, kind sir. Liking Tyler more and more, finding him so comfortable to be with. Charlene almost forgot she had met him only a few days past. It seemed that she had known him for most of her life. And though she was certain he had his faults, she couldn't come up with a single one thus far. Keeping a watchful eye on him in case he lost consciousness, Charlene asked, Can you move your left arm? Gingerly, wincing. Tyler did. I don't think it's busted. He said, his tone low. Just badly squashed. He glanced at her, his hair hanging half over his face. How's your arm? Still have a bullet in it? I don't think so. She answered, also flexing it. I think it just grazed me. Then, I reckon we both got lucky today. She watched him, biting her lower lip. Tyler. She said slowly. Who would have shot at me? He lifted his good shoulder in a shrug. Charlene, I have been wondering that myself. We were both down, both vulnerable, yet whoever it was chose not to come close and finish the job. Why? Maybe it was just to scare us. Me. He slowly shook his head. There was more than one rifle. One hit you. One hit the horse, others went wide. Forgive me for saying so, but whoever did it were not good marksmen and took off immediately. I did look around for anyone who might be around with a gun. Charlene replied. I saw no one at all. Then they had horses. None of this makes any sense at all. Charlene snapped, frustrated and in despair. When they find us alive, they'll try again. Tyler's smoky gray eyes on hers informed her that notion had occurred to him as well. You're going to have to be real careful from now on, Charlene. I suppose it's a good thing I agreed to have you guard Tosahui. I expect it will be a while before I'm up to any guarding. Maybe Vic can lock you up in jail. Outraged, indignant, Charlene whirled on him. Never. You'll be protected. I'll be fine. Ah. Tyler tried to move his arm into a comfortable position, grimacing. I didn't think you'd go for it, anyway. You should never have mentioned it in the first place. Why not? It's a good idea. Charlene lifted her nose in the air. It was boorish and uncouth for you to have suggested I be arrested for simply being a victim. He laughed, then bent over, gasping. Please, stop. I beg you. Making me laugh kills me. Serves you right. When he lifted his head, she gave him a small smile to let him know she didn't truly mean what she said. Thank you for thinking of my well-being. Any time, ma'am. Dusk had fallen as they finally rode into Bandera, the usual pedestrians, riders, and drivers mostly gone from the street and sidewalks. A few cowboys rode through town, and several horses stood tied to hitching rails outside the saloon. The usual piano music rose from it, and Charlene scented beer and whiskey on the breeze as they rode past. Tyler? 
Miss Quinn? Charlene turned her head at Sheriff Barker's query, observing Tyler from the corner of his eye do the same. Barker strode from the sidewalk into the street to confront them, his drooping mustache quivering. Even in the near dark, Charlene noticed the anger in his blue eyes. What in our nation happened? He demanded, striding to stand between their two horses. Someone shot at us, Vic. Tyler answered. Grazed her arm, hit the horse. Me, I got trampled. Charlene blushed to the roots of her hair as Barker's loud swearing blistered the atmosphere around them. Now who in damnation would be shooting at you two? Wish we knew. Tyler replied, his voice exhausted. Look, Vic, I need to go to the hotel or someplace. Charlene needs the doctor. I can speak for myself, Tyler. Charlene gazed down at the bristling sheriff. He will stay at our house where my mother and I can look after him. I don't believe I need the doctor's care. So if you would kindly escort us to my house. As I will need your assistance with Tyler, it would be greatly appreciated. Barker glanced from her face to Tyler's, baffled. Did she just give me an order? It would seem so. He answered. And I think you should obey it, too, Vic. If you know what's good for you. Muttering what sounded like more swear words under his breath, Sheriff Barker marched down the street ahead of them, leading the way to Charlene's house. Olivia stood on the porch, her shawl clutched around her body as though cold. Clearly watching for them. And from what Charlene could see of her face, she was worried out of her mind. Charlene. Olivia gasped, running down the steps to open the small gate to the yard. What in God's name happened? I was so scared something had happened. Something did mother. Charlene replied, feeling her own pain and exhaustion rise to overwhelm her. But just know we're both all right. While Sheriff Barker helped Tyler down from his bay, Charlene slid down from her saddle. She rubbed the mare's silky neck under her mane for a moment. Appreciating that she hadn't run all the way home to the livery stable. Come in, dear. Olivia implored, into the house. You, too, Sheriff and Tyler. Get inside. Charlene half smiled at her mother's ability to take charge of them. And recognized that without Dosahui in their life, such a drastic change would never have come about. Lamps lit the interior of the snug house, and the inviting smells of roasting beef made Charlene's mouth water. Olivia guided Charlene to an armchair and bullied Sheriff Barker to sit Tyler on the sofa. Now, Sheriff. She ordered, untying the knot to Charlene's makeshift bandage. Run to the kitchen, there's a pot of hot water on the stove. Pour it into a bucket with cold and bring it and wash rags here. Charlene laughed silently at Barker's outraged countenance, his blue eyes hot, his jaw slack. If I wanted to be ordered around by a woman. He stated firmly, scowling at Olivia in a fierce way that no doubt intimidated folks in the past. I'd have married my own. Olivia merely pointed in the direction of the kitchen and snapped her fingers. Charlene met Tyler's grin with her own as Barker sullenly obeyed her, stalking toward the kitchen and muttering under his breath. Though Olivia peeled her sleeve away with gentle movements. Charlene couldn't control her wincing, nor her low cry of pain. Hold still. Doing her best not to move, biting her lip, Charlene stared at Tyler as her mother probed the wound on her arm. It looks like a deep gash. Olivia murmured. I'll know more when I clean it. Sheriff, where's my warm water? Coming, coming, you old biddy. Sheriff Barker carried a basin of warm water into the room and set it on the floor at Olivia's side. He handed her the cloth, then stood back, his arms folded, to watch. Olivia scowled, her brows furrowed. What are you doing just standing there? She demanded. Go have a look at Tyler. Make sure he remains among the living. Barker raised his hand as though to start arguing with her, but Olivia stared him down. Charlene watched in fascination as the two locked eyes, a contest of wills in her living room. Olivia won when Sheriff Barker slumped his shoulders, lowering his hand. 
Rolling his eyes, he grumbled his way over to Tyler to start helping him out of his shirt. Charlene could not halt the cry of pain as her mother gently washed her arm, cleaning away the dried blood, opening the wound back up to ooze again. As she worked, Olivia hummed soothingly under her breath. A melody that had comforted Charlene when she was a young child. It calmed her frazzled nerves and enabled her to relax somewhat. Sheriff. Olivia said, frowning at the now clean wound. Come here, please. Come here, go there, do you ever see sparking orders woman? She ignored his complaint as she gestured toward Charlene's arm. Do you think we need to stitch that? Sheriff Parker ran his fingers down his mustache, peering at the wound. He shook his head. No, I wouldn't. Just bind it tight, like. I'll cut bandages. Rising, Olivia hustled into the other room as Sheriff Barker stood once more over Tyler. I reckon your head needs clean Tyler. He said. I'll leave that to the missus. But not much can be done about that. He gestured toward Tyler's chest. Except give it time. Charlene gazed at the incredible black and blue bruising that extended from Tyler's left collarbone. And traveled down his shoulder to his chest and ribs. An exact print of the horses she rose starkly in the center. My God. She whispered, staring. Too bad he can't keep that as a souvenir. Barker chuckled. It'll go away as he heals. I'm lucky nothing is broken. Tyler said, peering down at it and running his hand over its face. Even so, you'll be pretty darn useless as a watchdog over these folks and the boy. Sheriff Barker groused as though it were all Tyler's fault, but Tyler merely nodded with a half smile. I know. He said, his eyes on Charlene. What do we do about it? Sheriff. Charlene ordered tersely. Bring his pallet from outside into Tosahui's room and set it on the floor. They can bunk together for now. I'll still sleep here on the couch. If Tyler has his rifle, he can still protect us. Sheriff Barker set his hands on his hips, scowling dangerously. Now why is it I have two of y'all barking orders at me now? When did I ever hear a please? Charlene waved her right hand dismissively. You're a public servant. Now serve. Charlene thought Barker's eyes would pop out of his skull and roll down his cheeks. He opened his mouth to protest, his eyes blazing when Olivia stepped into the room behind him. A giggle rose to her throat and hung there, but she maintained her stern expression as best she could. Laughing would only negate her command. Just do it, Sheriff. She commanded with her hands full of linen. She sat down and turned her attention to Charlene and Tyler as she sorted it out to begin cutting, ignoring Barker's presence. When you are able, she said calmly. You must go see Tosahui. He's worried and wants to make sure you're both all right. Yes, of course. Charlene replied, stifling a grin, her eyes on Tyler's. He, too, snickered at Barker's predicament who stood behind Olivia like a bantam rooster glaring at the back of her head. Olivia turned to see him. Why are you still here? Go. Shoo. Stip-legged, Sheriff Barker walked to the door and went through it, giving the door a satisfactory slam on his way out. Despite her pain, Charlene lapsed into helpless giggles, holding her ribcage with her healthy right arm. Tyler, unable to laugh, grinned. The man needs to learn who is in charge around here. Olivia said with a sniff. And it's certainly not him. Mother. Charlene said when she could speak. You shouldn't push him around like that. He's the sheriff. Bah. She snorted. He's a man first. Within a few minutes, Barker opened the door again, carrying Tyler's straw pallet with him. Without a word. He marched into the room, passed them by, and vanished down the short hallway. He returned on the run, his revolver in his hand, heading for the door. There's someone out there. He snapped as he raced by. Chapter 13 Tyler rose instantly, not bothering with his shirt. His pain and handicap forgotten, 
he followed on Victor's heels. Tyler, no. Charlene cried, forcing him to glance back. I have to help him, he said. Don't worry. I'll be all right. Ducking through the door, Tyler hurried as fast as he could to his horse and yanked his rifle from its scabbard. The running hurt him too badly, he strode quickly around the side of the house. The lamps inside illuminating the small yard through the windows. Socking the rifle into his gut, he cocked it, then paused to listen. The sound of running feet came to his ears, Victor's voice raised in anger, no doubt cursing, a short distance away. Yet, another sound came to him, one that was much closer. Sliding into the shadows, his rifle held with its barrel pointed upward, Tyler edged around the corner of the house, still listening intently. The faint noise came again. Tilting his head, Tyler caught what sounded like a boy's sob. At first, he thought it was Tosahui but dismissed it immediately. Where he stood, there was no way he could hear Tosahui, even through the window. In addition, this sound came near his feet. Creeping closer, he lowered his gun and followed it around the corner of the house. Hold it right there. He demanded, his voice harsh. Instantly, chaos erupted. Two shadows leapt from the ground in a flurry of arms and legs. Something hard struck Tyler behind his knees, knocking him flat to the ground. His rifle under him, his chest and shoulder screaming for mercy. He groaned, rolling over, catching up his gun, struggling to his feet. But he was far too late. Whoever was lurking behind the house had hurtled the short fence, dodged a neighbor's barking dog, and vanished into the night all before he stood up. Damn it, he spat, wiping grass from his mouth. Switching his rifle to his left hand, he rubbed his aching arm and chest. Limping back to the front of the house, he wearily climbed the porch steps and walked inside to the lights and the worried expressions of Charlene and Olivia. While he was out, Olivia had begun wrapping Charlene's arm. And appeared to be about half done. What happened? Charlene asked, relief clear in her voice. Where's the sheriff? Tyler set his rifle in the corner, then sat down, waving his right hand in the direction of town. Vic's off chasing someone. He replied, leaning his head wearily against the sofa's back. There were two still back there, but they knocked me down and ran off. Do you know who they were? Charlene asked as Olivia continued wrapping her upper arm. Oddly, Tyler replied with a faint frown. I think they were young. Boys. What makes you say that? I thought I heard crying. Tyler answered. Soft sobs that I thought at first might be Tosahui. But it couldn't have been. Charlene shook her head. I think if it had been him, we would have heard him from here. Besides, he hasn't cried once since he's been under our roof. Tough boy. Olivia added, nodding. Nothing but sweet smiles in spite of his terrible pain. I agree. Tyler said, closing his eyes. He felt utterly wretched and worn out, his pain worsening since his latest fall to the ground. Craving nothing except sleep, he wondered how rude it would be if he went to his pallet. Just then, Victor opened the door and came in, his silver mustache quivering. Damn it, he outran me. He snapped. Lost him outside of town. There were two more still creeping about at the back of the house. Charlene told him as he sat on the sofa beside Tyler with a snort. They ran off. I think they were kids, Vic. Tyler added, his eyes still closed. He really needed to lie down and wondered if there was any laudanum left. Kids, eh? Victor's voice sounded thoughtful. Maybe they were out to play a fool prank. There. Tyler opened his eyes in time to see Olivia tie a neat knot in Charlene's bandage, and stand up. Tyler, I'll have a look at your head now. Sheriff, would you mind fetching fresh hot water? He scowled again, but before he could speak, Olivia added. After which I'll serve up the roast. You're invited to stay, of course, Sheriff. His glower immediately faded, and he went without protest into the kitchen, 
carrying the basin. Olivia took his place next to Tyler, her fingers parting his hair as she peered intently at the injury to his head. His eyes met Charlene's and offered her a tiny grin. She smiled while me back. It doesn't look too bad. Olivia murmured. Lucky for you. It could have been so much worse. I have a hard head. Tyler admitted wryly. Victor returned with a fresh basin of warm water and a clean cloth, setting it beside Olivia. He offered her a sardonic bow and sarcasm. Anything else, my queen? Yes, Olivia replied, busy washing Tyler's crusty wound. Sit yourself down and keep quiet. Tyler grinned, occasionally wincing under Olivia's ministrations, as Victor sat in the other armchair, sulking. His expression slowly altered to thoughtfulness, his fingers stroking his mustache. Kids, eh? Victor said again, staring into the cold fireplace. Not too many boys around here give in to this sort of mischief. I agree. Said Charlene. Most children are home eating their suppers and doing chores this time of the evening. Under the eyes of their parents. Exactly. Victor replied. And why you folks? You ladies are respected in this town, not usually the targets of boyish pranks. However, Olivia added, rinsing the cloth in the basin. We are the only ones in town with a Comanche in their house. Could it be that this Johnson fellow you have in your jail has friends? Tyler asked, Olivia dabbing once more at his scalp. Pals who might want to hassle the ladies because of the kit? Victor shook his grizzled head. I don't know. He might, as I scarce know the man. He's too drunk to chat much during his stays in my jail. He's not drunk now. Charlene pointed out. Maybe you could ask him about it in the morning. That I can do. Finishing with Tyler, Olivia stood up, the basin in her hands. I'll set the table and serve up supper. Charlene rose to her feet as well. I can help mother. You should sit back down, girl. Olivia replied sternly, heading to the kitchen. Ignoring her order, Charlene followed behind her and both women vanished into the other room. Tyler watched them go, then discovered Victor staring at him, his blue eyes penetrating. She's a good girl, ain't she? Victor asked, his expression suddenly neutral. That she is. Tyler agreed with a small grin. Dealt with getting shot and me hurt with guts. She's a tough one. Been through a lot. Victor nodded. Some people roll over and die. Some get tough. Like her. His eyes suddenly bored into Tyler. You like her then? Of course, I like her. Tyler replied, annoyed. So do most people. That ain't what I meant, and you know it. Tyler lay his head back and groaned, staring at the ceiling. This is not a good time for matchmaking, you old coot. I think the world of that girl and her ma. Victor went on. I reckon you'd be good for both of them. Just know that I'll still be keeping an eye on you, make sure you don't do him wrong. Tyler raised his hand in a dismissive wave. What will you do? Shoot me? I ain't above doing just that. I see how that girl looks at you, and you at her. You do right by her, Tyler, I mean it. You're worse than some old bitty woman, sticking her nose where it don't belong. I'm just giving you fair warning. Warning received. From the corner of his eye, Tyler saw Charlene take a full plate from the kitchen into Tosahoe's room, then return a few minutes later. She waved her right hand at them when she came out. Though her face appeared wan and pale, Tyler felt glad that she was on her feet in spite of what she went through that day. One tough gal. Come in, gentlemen. She said. Before it gets cold. His left shoulder screamed with pain as he struggled to get to his feet. Victor watching him with concern. He picked up his shirt to don it but needed Victor's help to get it on and buttoned. Criminy. 
he muttered, tucking the tails awkwardly and untidily into his jeans. Though the roast beef, potatoes, and buttered beans smelled delicious, Tyler had little appetite. His head pounded, his shoulder throbbed, and he felt nauseous. He ate as much as he could observing that Charlene, too, ate only a little. Her mother eyed them both with concern while Victor downed his dinner with the voracious hunger of a starved wolf. You two need a good night's rest. Olivia commented. And a dose of laudanum. Charlene nodded. After I help you with the dishes. I can handle the dishes, dear. Olivia said, rising. You lie down on the couch, and I'll bring you the medicine. Without an argument, Charlene stood shakily and aimed a lopsided smile at Tyler and Victor. Good night, gentlemen. Sleep well, ma'am. Tyler replied, watching her leave the kitchen. Victor also stood up. I'll take the horses to the livery, boy. He said. Get some sleep. Ma'am, that was a right delicious meal. I'm much obliged. You're welcome, Sheriff. I'll pass by the house through the night, keep an eye on things. With that, Victor departed, Tyler listening to the front door open and close. He watched Olivia pour a small amount of wine into glasses, then drop laudanum into each one. He hoped his stomach, still churning somewhat, would accept it. And that he wouldn't wretch it all back up. Here. Olivia told him, handing him a glass. Drink it down, then get some sleep, Tyler. Yes, ma'am. Olivia took the other glass to Charlene as Tyler swallowed the nasty concoction yet praved its pain-killing and drowsy effects. Standing, his knees quivering under him, he set the glass on the counter, then walked out of the kitchen and into the living room. Olivia bent over Charlene, who lay on the couch, as Tyler picked up his rifle to take with him. Leaving them, he made his slow way into Tosa Hui's room. The command she woke as he entered and gave Tyler a quick smile. We're bunkmates for a time, kid. Tyler said dropping the gun beside his bed on the floor. He blew out the lamp, then lay down on his pallet, fully dressed. With the laudanum taking effect quickly, his head spun like a wicked tornado. Closing his eyes, he breathed deeply, and within minutes, he slept. Heading toward the kitchen the next morning, yawning, Tyler heard Charlene's voice speaking emphatically. The odors of bacon frying and brewed coffee made his belly rumble in appreciation. I have to go into work, mother. Charlene was saying. I'm fine. You certainly are not fine. Olivia replied. I know Jean and Harold will give you a day to rest. Of course, they will. Charlene said as he entered the doorway. That's not the point. I am obligated to work. Both women noticed him standing there and cut off their argument. Tyler felt his face heat under their scrutiny. As though he was a little boy caught eavesdropping. Er, sorry to interrupt. He said. Not at all. Olivia replied. Please help me convince my stubborn daughter to remain at home today. Well, ma'am. He stammered. I couldn't do that. If Charlene feels she can handle her work, then she knows what's best. Charlene grinned in triumph as Olivia snorted. I thought you could talk sense into her. Sit down, Tyler, and eat some breakfast. I'm going to take this into Tosa Hui. Picking up a full plate of hot bacon, fried eggs, and bread, Olivia stalked from the kitchen, still annoyed. Tyler glanced at Charlene and shrugged, rubbing his aching left shoulder with his right hand. I just hope you'll be careful. You don't want to start your arm bleeding again. I'm sure Jean and Harold will assure me the easy tasks. Charlene replied with a tiny grin. She had apparently washed and clad herself in a fresh dress of pale green, which set off her hazel eyes. Fingering her braid, she stepped closer to him, gazing up. How are you feeling? Like I've been trampled by a runaway horse, he replied, grinning. At least your sense of humor is still intact. What will you be doing this day? 
I need to ride on back to my ranch. He replied, leaning against the door jam. You should stay here. You're hurt worse than I am. I have stock that needs feed and water. Tyler said. And I'm not that bad off. Charlie nodded at last. Will you come back this evening? Count on it. Tyler gave her a quick wink and briefly touched her nose with his finger. Charlene caught his hand, gave it a brief squeeze, then let it go. I don't want to be late. She whispered. Standing aside, Tyler permitted her to pass by him and watch the sway of her hips, admiring her grace when she walked. Taking a deep breath, wincing at the stab of pain in his chest, he turned to sit down at the table as Olivia came back. Without speaking, she filled a plate with food, set it in front of him, then left the kitchen. Without the nausea, Tyler found the breakfast delicious and ate his fill. Olivia returned by the time he finished, and he wiped his mouth on a napkin. Thank you, ma'am, for the hospitality. He said, wondering if she would give him an argument about riding to his place. I do hope you'll come back this evening, Tyler. Olivia replied with a small smile. It's rather nice having you around the house. Her words startled him. You knew I was headed out? If I can't keep Charlene here, I certainly can't keep you. It's far more difficult to keep a man resting when he should. He chuckled. I will be back, ma'am. Just be careful is all I ask. Yes, ma'am. Still early in the day, the heat had already begun to rise as he strode down the sidewalk toward the livery stable and his horse. He passed the Apple Tree Mercantile store and fought an inner battle with himself to not go in and check on Charlene. She's a big girl, and sensible. If she needs to go home to rest, she will. He also saw Victor riding toward him on his tall dun, spitting a wad of tobacco on the street. Reining in, Victor scowled down at Tyler. Got word this morning. He said without a greeting. Three horses got stolen from a farm just outside town yesterday morning. Tyler squinted up at him. You think it might be related to whoever shot at us? Could be. I find it right peculiar that horses are stolen not long before you and Miss Gwyn went riding. So, someone here in town takes a dislike to either me or Charlene, steals some horses in order to follow and shoot us? That's a stretch, Vic, even for your limited imagination. Makes sense if the parties involved are townsfolk and have no horses of their own. That would mean their vendetta is quite powerful. Tyler replied slowly. Who might hate either her or me that much? I haven't been around long enough to make enemies, and you said it yourself. The Quins are well liked and respected. I don't have all the answers. Victor said, lifting his reins. But I aim to find him. He touched his fingers to his hat brim, then rode on past Tyler. Confused as to what may have caused such enmity toward himself or Charlene, Tyler walked on down the street, nodding absently and greeting to those folks he passed. Maybe someone has it in for me for buying the mill place, had wanted it for themselves. Though that idea was possible, it still made little sense to Tyler. He bought it when no one else wanted it. Reclaiming his horse from the stable, he mounted up with a few grimaces and choice oaths under his breath. Walking the bay the few miles to his home may be slower, but his body could not handle trotting or cantering just then. He saw no sign of Wintenta and his companions as he rode into his yard. The mules in the corral expressing their unhappiness with him with loud praise. Tying the bay to the hitching post, he unsaddled him, curried the sweat from his hide, then turned him loose with the others. After feeding them and filling the water trough, he went to the house feeling more exhausted than he should. Most of the food he had in his kitchen had gone bad during his absence. Not hungry anyway, the house is hot as an oven, he found a place in the back under a thatch of cedar trees with deep shade and soft loamy soil beneath them. Getting himself comfortable, he pillowed his head on his arm and went to sleep. When he woke up, his bunkhouse was on fire. Chapter 14 why are we riding so far north? George asked, cantering to Aaron's left flank. 
San Anto named in this direction. No. Aaron replied with more patience than he usually had. We need to skirt those towns where we're known. Do you want another Pasianos? No. George replied. But we don't need to ride this far from the towns, do we? I ain't taking any chances. Aaron said with a sharp glance at him. You're just whining because we haven't been to a town where you can gamble. I'm just tired of being in the saddle is all. George said, sulking. I want to drink beer and sleep in a bed for a change. We'll strike east again soon. Franklin told him. I think there's a small village up this way. Might have a saloon and a hotel. Aaron half turned in his saddle. What's its name? Had we been there before? Franklin shook his head. Nope. Not likely we're known, neither. It might be good to stop for the night. Aaron said, turning back around. I wouldn't mind a beer myself. The small town that arose in their path did indeed have a hotel, and a saloon attached to it. Thinking of a meal that didn't come from a saddlebag, Aaron reined in at the hotel and dismounted. Tying his horse to the hitching post, he led his brothers inside. The lobby felt cool and dim compared to the blazing heat of the outdoors, and their presence earned them a smile from the man behind the counter. Welcome, gentlemen. He said grandly. Rooms? That and meals. Aaron answered, pulling some cash from his pocket. Do y'all have business here in town? The manager asked, sliding the guest register across to him. Aaron shook his head. Just passing through on our way to San Antonio. As usual, Aaron signed a different name than his own, paid for a room and his meals, then left each of his brothers to do the same. Supper is served in thirty minutes, good sirs. The manager said as Aaron headed for the stairs to the room assigned him. Like most hotels, it was small and clean, with a narrow bed, a bureau, a table, and a chair. His window looked down into the hot, dusty street below, and Aaron leaned on the sill to gaze down. Only a few people rode or walked through it, women carrying parasols to protect their skin from the sun's brutal rays. Just another sleepy burg with nothing at all going on. Aaron suspected he'd die of boredom if he was forced to live in a place like this. The dinner served by the hotel that night was hot fried chicken, dumplings, gravy, fresh bread, and peas. Aaron ate two helpings, glad to be eating something besides dried meat and hard cornbread, his brothers devouring theirs just as eagerly. None of them spoke much, even though there were few other diners around them. Still behind his counter, the manager waved to them in a friendly fashion as they filed through the open doorway to the saloon. Inside, they found the place only half full of patrons, a few cowboys drinking beer and playing poker, what appeared to be a pair of farmers discussing the weather and businessmen in ties, their black frock coats over the backs of their chairs. Aaron selected a table in the corner where he could watch the entire room, his brothers taking the other chairs. A girl came to take their orders for beer all around and brought them in tall foaming mugs. The place felt stifling hot in spite of a relatively cool breeze that entered through the open windows. George took a long pull at his beer and smacked his lips in satisfaction. Didn't I tell you this was a good idea? Aaron shrugged. I suppose. Though no one had spared them a second glance, the hairs on the back of Aaron's neck stood up. He felt a prickling sensation, as though something with tiny sharp claws crawled over his skin. That feeling was very familiar to him, and he never failed to heed it. They were being watched. Finish your beers. He said quietly, his head lowered. Then we ride. George gaped. We just got here. Glaring under his hat, Aaron's eyes bored holes in his brother's face. George shut his mouth and glanced aside, drinking his beer in gulps. Something's wrong? Aaron muttered. Elmer nodded. I feel it. This is what we're gonna do. Aaron said, his voice lowered. After we drink our beers, we mosey back to our rooms, grab our gear. We open a window at the back and jump down. We're on the second floor. Franklin replied, 
his brows furrowed. We got to. Aaron said, his eyes flicking around the room from under his hat, hoping to spot whoever was watching them. They'll think we're in our rooms. Then we grab our horses and skin out. I don't see anyone in here watching us. Elmer said in an undertone. Where are they? Aaron glanced out the window. Without making it obvious, he tried to observe the street and anyone on it. Unfortunately, he saw nothing. I don't know. But they're there, waiting for us. If we just grab our gear and walk out the front door, they'll be on us. But we're not known here. George complained, a whine in his voice. We never been here before. That don't mean they don't have wanted posters on us. Elmer growled, glowering at George. We obviously were recognized. The hotel feller was awful friendly. Franklin observed. A little too friendly. Aaron agreed, drinking his beer. We're getting too famous, boys. That means we can't stop in towns no more. George complained bitterly. I hate being a saddle tramp. At least you'll be alive. Aaron snapped. Once we spring Benchy, we'll go south, into old Mexico. They don't know us there. Do they have saloons in old Mexico? George asked, hope in his eyes. I'm sure they do. Aaron replied with a quick resigned shake of his head. Mexicans drink. The bad feeling in his gut grew, the strange, crawling sensation on his flesh increased as Aaron finished his beer. Let's go. He said. Walk casual-like, wave and smile. Striding out of the saloon and back into the hotel lobby, Aaron offered the manager, still behind the counter, a quick nod and a wave as he passed him and went up the stairs. His brothers followed behind him in single file, none of the people still eating their evening meal paying them any attention at all. Inside his room, Aaron slung his saddlebags over his shoulder, then peered out through the window. As before, very few townsfolk occupied the street, a gust of wind stirred the dust into a small whirlwind before dissipating. Then Aaron looked up to the roofs across the street. A man with a rifle crouched under cover of a chimney, half hidden. Aaron saw him only because he happened to remove his hat to wipe sweat from his brow then replace it. Guns firing at us from above. Not good. Aaron grimaced in anger and frustration. Their horses stood tied up out front, in full view of the riflemen concealed on the rooftops. Meeting his brothers in the hallway, Aaron told them what he saw. We can't get through that. Elmer said, his eyes wide. We won't get far without our horses. We won't get far at all. George whined, pacing in a circle. What'll we do, Aaron? Just pipe down and let me think. Aaron snapped. Give me a minute. Striding quickly to the window at the end of the hall, facing the back of the hotel, he gazed out and down. No helpful horses stood there waiting for their riders. He looked up and down the alley, seeing nothing useful save the drop from that window would land them in fairly soft dirt. Here's what we'll do. He said, retreating from the window. Elmer you're the best shot. You keep their heads down while the rest of us run for the horses. We'll ride back here, into the alley, and pick you up. Then we skin the hell out of here. Elmer nodded. I'll need as much ammunition as you can give me. Here. Yanking off his gun belt, filled with shells, he pulled his revolver from it. We'll be shooting, too. He said as Elmer buckled the belt around his chest. Maybe we can keep them busy enough keeping their heads down they can't shoot at us. I hope so. George muttered. I don't want to get shot. Aaron rested his hand briefly on Elmer's shoulder. Good luck. Once you see us mounted up, run and drop out that back window. We'll be there. You got it, Aaron. Aaron checked the loads in his revolver, closed the cylinder, then nodded to his brothers. Let's go. Leaving Elmer to cover their escape, Aaron led George and Franklin to the window at the other end of the hall facing out over the alley. With no time to second-guess what he was about to do, his gun in his hand, 
Aaron climbed onto the sill and jumped. He hit the ground feet first with enough force to slam his teeth together. The shock wave traveling up his leg, crawled up his back and jolted his neck. His hat flew off as dirt and dust filled his eyes, nose and mouth, his saddlebags flung from his shoulder. Rolling across the dirt of the alley, he gasped for breath and looked up. George hurtled out the window next, landing with a thud just as he had, careening in a tight ball to strike the back of the building opposite. Getting to his feet, Aaron, spitting out dirt, helped George up just as Franklin jumped. His spectacles flew from his face as he hit the ground hard, thrown onto his hands and knees. Hearing his grunt, and then a long groan, Aaron knew he'd been hurt. Franklin Aaron ran to him, trying to help him up off the ground. But for a long moment, Franklin wouldn't move. George picked up his fallen spectacles and his own fallen hat and bags. What's wrong? Franklin? Talk to me. Are you hurt? His brother nodded. My back, he gasped. Lord, this isn't good, just when we have to get him on a horse and ride hard. Listen. Aaron said. You have to get up and walk. Can you do that? I don't know. Aaron, it hurts so bad. I'll help you. With his hand under Franklin's arm, he lifted, hearing his brother's choked off cry of pain. He stopped instantly, Franklin now on just his knees, sweat running down his hair and dripping onto his face. Brother? Can you stand? Don't. Pull on me. Let me do it. Aaron released him, anxiously watching him, fear etching its way down his spine. If he can't ride, we're all dead. I can't leave him behind. Franklin. He said, licking his lips, glancing up and down the alley. We have to go now. Please, try to get up. Without raising his head, Franklin reached out, fumbling for it, to grasp his arm. I. I'll try. Franklin, his teeth clamped shut on a long low cry of agony, put his right leg under him, pushing off from Aaron's extended arm. Stumbling, every muscle and tendon standing out on his neck. Franklin got his left foot under him and stood. His eyes met Aaron's and instantly knew Franklin wasn't going to make it. He saw death in those calm, pain-racked eyes. Franklin's death. Aaron. Franklin said, his hand on Aaron's shoulder. You have to leave me behind. Never. Aaron hissed, furious that Franklin would even suggest it. I can't ride, Aaron. I'm all busted up. You have to. Aaron groaned. I won't leave you. Please, don't give up. We'll get you to a doctor, he'll fix you up, then we'll go find Benji. Let me cover for you. Franklin asked, his voice pleading. I can cover your escape. They'll shoot me down, but it's better than this pain. No. Aaron glared at his brother, his anger and fear overwhelming his reason. He would never leave one of his brothers behind. Never. No. You come with us. I'm ordering you. Franklin looked away, then nodded. You'll have to bring my horse here to me. Relief flooded Aaron. You got it. Just wait here, Franklin, you'll be all right, you'll see, we'll find you a doctor, I promise. George, let's go. Dashing around the hotel, running for the street, Aaron pulled the hammer back on his revolver. George pounded at his side, his gun out and ready. The instant their boots hit the sidewalk, they started shooting at the men on the rooftops. Above them, gunfire erupted as Elmer also shot at the local men. The men fired back. Running to the horses, Aaron heard a choked-off cry as one of Elmer's shots found its mark. But bullets struck the sidewalk, the street, all around himself and George. The front window of the hotel exploded into shards of glass. Aaron spun, raising his weapon, firing at a man with a star on his fist. The sheriff ducked back down. Elmer continued to fire round after round, choosing his targets carefully. Under cover of Elmer's gun, George reloaded his revolver, snapped the cylinder closed, then shot a man on the bank building across the street who stood, and aimed the rifle at their horses. 
the man fell backward and disappeared. Elmer continued to fire, the gunshots from the sheriff and citizens slowing as they hid from his hail of bullets. The horses spooked, jerking back on their reins as Aaron and George ran among them, untying leather from the rail, leaping into the saddles. Dragging two horses with them by their bridles, Aaron and George hid the alley at a gallop, the hotel now concealing them from the guns behind them. Franklin still stood where they left him while Elmer leapt from the second floor window just as they entered the alley. What took you so long? He roared as he rolled to his feet and grabbed his hat from the dirt. Aaron flung himself from his saddle before the horse came to a full halt. Franklin's hurt. He yelled. We gotta get him up. Move. Oh, Lord. Elmer said, reaching for Franklin. How bad? Aaron saw Franklin's twisted smile. Bad enough. They're coming. George shouted. Get him up, now. On legs that appeared as stiff as planks, Franklin walked to his horse that Aaron held for him as Elmer bent and laced his fingers together. Franklin put his boot into them, his hand on the saddle horn. He screamed as Elmer boosted him into his saddle. God! Elmer gasped. What's wrong? We go now. With Franklin on his horse, even if he was bent over his horse's neck, Aaron vaulted into his saddle and grabbed the horse's reins. Elmer hit his seat the same instant Aaron followed George down the alley at a dead run. Gunfire erupted behind them. Ducking down another alley between houses put a barrier between themselves and the men shooting at them. Finding another street, Aaron and George led the way toward the end of town and out of it. Still at a dead run, not daring to slow down, Aaron turned south across the dry, dusty land, not daring to look back out of fear of what he would see. They aren't chasing us. George yelled over the pounding of hooves. We have to slow down, Aaron. Heeding his brother, Aaron slowed both mounts to a walk, finally glancing at Franklin. His brother still lay over the horse's neck, not moving. Frantic, he reached over to his brother's throat, seeking a pulse. He found it, but its thready, fast beat had him alarmed all over again. What happened to him? Elmer demanded riding up to Franklin's other side. He hurt his back when he jumped from the window. George answered when Aaron didn't. His back? Elmer's voice had grown ominously soft as he, too, checked Franklin's pulse. You can't put a man with an injured back on a horse, Aaron. Aaron recognized the danger in Elmer's voice, but didn't care. I had no choice. He snarled. We all would have been killed. Franklin wanted to stay in cover for us. George said. He knew he'd die though, knew they'd shoot him down. Quiet down, George. Aaron shouted. And I wasn't going to let that happen. No choice? Elmer's voice dropped an octave. He's going to die in agony when he could have died back there, painless, and with honor. Aaron reined his horse around until he was face to face with Elmer. We don't leave anyone behind. He snapped, his own voice low as he glared fiercely into Elmer's. You know that. And he's not going to die, damn it. I promised him I'd take him to a doctor. He'll get fixed up. Elmer raised his hand and pointed at Franklin. There is no fixing a broken back, Aaron. Even if he lives, he'll never walk again. Aaron's mouth opened, then closed, only to open again. He couldn't speak. His throat choked him. He felt the blood drain from his face, his hands and feet cold, like blocks of ice even in the desert-like heat. That's not true. He whispered. He's just beat up a bit. His back's not busted. Does that look like just being beat up to you? Elmer demanded his voice only slightly louder than Aaron's. Aaron followed his pointing finger. At the rising lump along Franklin's spine, a lump that hadn't been there a while ago. No. Aaron felt his world lurch, stumble, as though God had just given it a good hard push. No. Yes. That's his spine swelling, Aaron. 
you should have let him die the way he wanted. He knew. He knew, and you wouldn't listen to him. I couldn't let him die. Aaron pleaded. I couldn't leave you to die either. Or George. We're all blood. Elmer nodded slowly, his eyes never leaving Aaron's. We are. But sometimes, you have to let go. I can't. Aaron whispered, anguished. He's my brother. He's my brother, too. Elmer said with a growl in his voice. And I for one would rather see him gunned down than live the life of a cripple. Guilt, an emotion that he had never felt before in his life, raged through him. Franklin wanted to die on his feet, protecting those he loved, a quick, nearly painless death. But Aaron's demand, no order, brought Franklin to a life that was far, far worse than a clean end at the bullets of their enemies. What have I done? What you thought was right? Elmer replied, his eyes on Franklin. For you. But sometimes, you have to think about what is right for someone else. That's something you'll never be able to see, Aaron. What do you want me to do? Aaron screamed. Shoot him in the head right now? That would be merciful. Aaron shoved at Elmer's arm, dragging his brother's attention back onto him. If you're so high and mighty. He sneered. You do it. You kill him. You put an end to his suffering. You know I can't. Elmer replied, his voice calm, devoid of emotion. He's my brother. This is on you, not me, not George. Just you. Strangling on his runaway feelings, his anger, guilt, terror, he stared at the terrible swelling under Franklin's shirt. Then it's on me. He finally said when he could speak. I accept it. This is my fault. There's no going back on it. Elmer reined his horse away from Aaron's. Then, we best be moving along. Turning, Aaron snubbed the horse carrying Franklin's unconscious body to his knee and rode at a walk behind Elmer. Over and over, the same refrain sank through Aaron's mind. I did what I thought was right. I did what I thought was right. I did. But Elmer's remark about Aaron's own selfish view of what was right silenced it. I should have let him die as he wanted. He muttered to himself. With honor. Chapter 15 Feeling as though he stood in a nightmare, Tyler gawked at the raging inferno that had been his bunkhouse. While sleep still had a hold of his mind, he had no idea what to do. The horses and mules in the corral bolted around the pen in panic. Then, like someone dumped cold water over his head, he moved. Running to the corral, his previous pain non-existent in his panic and fear. Tyler reached the gate and unlatched it. Swinging it wide, he ran in, waving his hat at the already frantic animals, yelling. A mule found the open gate and galloped out, the others on its heels. They disappeared into the thin forest until he couldn't even hear their hooves. Grabbing a bucket from the well, he ran to toss the water, not onto the flames, but onto the closest building. The barn. He knew the bunkhouse was beyond saving and fought to keep the other buildings from catching. Back and forth he ran with full buckets, throwing them onto the sides and the roof of the big barn. Suddenly, he realized he was not alone. Winton to galloped into the yard, yelling something Tyler couldn't understand, four Comanche warriors behind him. Tyler dared not stop, but continued to run, throwing water on the vulnerable wood of the barn. Smoke from the fire choked him made him cough, and stung his eyes. When a hand grabbed his arm, he staggered, gasping, fighting to keep his property from the flames. No. Winton to yelled in his ear. Stop. Your barn is safe. Look. Through the smoke-induced tears in his eyes, Tyler squinted. The flames of the bunkhouse had died down, the light wind blowing it away from the barn. The four Comanche warriors dumped buckets of water on the embers near the bone-dry cedar and mesquite trees, stamping out tiny fires before the trees might also erupt into a raging forest fire. There is nothing more you can do, Winton told him. Come, you do not look well. I don't feel well. 
With wind and his hand under his arm, Tyler staggered, floundering his way to the porch. He slumped onto it, coughing, his throat raw, his previous injuries waking now that his adrenaline rush had died away. Winton to sat beside him, both of them watching the last of the flames die, even as smoke continued to rise into the blue sky. Someone set fire to your barn. Winton to said. We saw three riders gallop north at the same time we saw smoke. Tyler nodded. I didn't see them, but I figured it had been set. Still coughing, Tyler rested his forearms on his knees, bowing his head. When he could speak, he said, Your son is doing well. I am glad of this. But yesterday someone tried to kill Charlene and me. Shot at us. You were not harmed? We were. Just not fatally. Three horses from town were stolen. And three horses just rode away from here. Looks like it. Who are these enemies of yours? Tyler, at last, raised his head, looking blearily at Wintinta. I have no idea. You must find them. Before they kill you. You make it sound so easy. No. It is not easy when your enemy does not confront you on the field of battle but strikes from the shadows. Tyler nodded slowly. Maybe somehow I can draw him out. Get him out of his shadows. That would be wise, Tyler. Tyler stared at the smoking remains of his bunkhouse, the blackened timbers, the Indians still kicking out burning embers that might still set the trees on fire if the wind struck them right. A rage grew from those embers, a fury hotter than the flames that destroyed his property. I will find them. He gritted. I will find them, and they will wish to God they hadn't messed with me or mine. The woman, Charlene. Winton to asked. She was hurt? Tyler gestured absently toward his arm, still thinking about finding whoever was responsible and punishing them, his rage ebbing away, little by little. A bullet grazed her arm. But she'll be fine. The command she nodded with satisfaction. She is a tough woman. Like a miskeet with thorns to keep you away, yet strong. Nodding, Tyler chuckled as he thought of Charlene wrapped in heavy mesquite thorns that kept anyone from getting close to her. Very true. We found poor hunting. Went into said. We killed a yearling calf. Tyler ride him sidelong. Did you save some for me? We did. We will feast this day. The Comanche built a fire in the middle of Tyler's yard, spitting meat over it to roast. Hungry, his horses and mules wandered back home, ambling into the clearing. Tyler tossed hay into the corral and enticed them back in with a bucket of oats, then closed the gate behind them as the stock munched happily. He threw hay down for the Indian horses, already tied to trees with long ropes, then sat down beside Wintinta. The Comanche spoke amongst themselves in their tongue. The scent of the roasting beef tantalizing, as Tyler and Wintinta spoke together. When can I return to your village and bring Tosahui home? Wintinta asked. Tyler thought for a moment. Another week. By then, his leg will have healed enough that he can withstand travel but he must keep the splint on for a while longer. It is good he is so well cared for. Tyler grinned. The ladies adore him. Winton to nodded. Some white people are good, like you and the women. Others, steal our land, kill us, make war. I know. Tyler admitted, poking the fire with a long stick. I like to see good in people, but it's not always possible. The afternoon wandered toward evening as Tyler and the Comanche cut slices from the tender beef brisket cooking on the spit, its fat dripping to sizzle on the flames beneath. Tyler ate the meat off his knife, juice running down his chin. I'm headed back to town. He said to Wintinta. With these renegades causing trouble, the ladies need looking after. We will remain here and watch your property Tyler. Wintinta replied, nodding. They will not come back to burn again. I'm obliged to you. You have helped my son. After saddling his horse, Tyler mounted up and rode past the Comanche, 
offering Wint into a half salute as he passed them. His exertions in saving his barn from the flames had not done his head or his shoulder any good at all. Thus he rode back to Bandera at a quiet walk. The intense throbbing in his torso and the pounding in his head brought choice oaths to his mouth. The strong heat kept most folks indoors, and the town lay quiet under the blazing sun as he rode down the street. Victor's Dunn gelding stood tied to the rail outside his office, indicating he was inside. Halting his bay, Tyler slid wearily down from his saddle and wrapped his reins around the post next to the Dunn's. Not bothering to knock. He opened the door and went inside, into the slightly cooler shade of the sheriff's office. Victor glanced up from the paper he perused, his boots propped up on his desk. You look like hell, boy. He remarked by way of greeting. Matches how I feel. Sitting in the chair on the opposite side of Victor, Tyler groaned, taking off his hat and fanning himself with it. Our little friends are at it again. He said. They set fire to my bunkhouse. Victor, scowling darkly, took his feet from the desk and leaned forward. His blue eyes pierced Tyler through. You sure it was them? The command she saw three riders fleeing at the same time my bunkhouse went up. Did they see faces? Nope. Victor let loose a string of vile words. Just who the hell is doing this? He demanded. And why? Did you happen to ask your pal in there? Tyler jerked his thumb toward the door that led into the jail. I did. Victor leaned back in his chair, his fingers forming a steeple. Old Harvey Johnson claims he's got no friends who would plot revenge on his behalf. And, if he were turned loose, he would murder that boy the Quinscott, and them, too. Without blinking an eye. I hope you don't plan on setting him loose. No, sir, that ain't gonna happen. The circuit judge will be here in two weeks, then he'll be off to a Texas prison. I hope so. If these miscreants are acting on his behalf without his knowledge, might they think to break him out? You are just plumb full of trouble, ain't you? Not me, Vic. Tyler replied. Just trying to think like they do. Victor stroked his thick mustache, pondering. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll take extra precautions where that man is concerned. I'll keep the key to his cell on me at all times. Will that settle your mind? It'll help. But until these outlaws are caught and in your jail, my mind won't settle at all. I reckon I can see that. Tyler stared thoughtfully at the black cast iron stove. Was there anything distinctive about the stolen horses? Not that I was told. Victor replied. But I can ask. I know they wear the farmer's brand. The Bar H. I don't know if it'll help much to know. Tyler admitted. But it might. You can tell your Comanche friends about the brand. Victor went on. In case they see them again. Tyler stood. I will. I'm headed to the Quins to keep an eye on them. You do that. Deciding to mount his horse wasn't worth the trouble, he led the bay down the street toward the apple tree. Thinking Charlene might be done working, he tied his horse to the rail out front of the shop and went inside. Both Charlene and Mrs. Maple glanced up at the sound of the bell from where they stood behind the counter. He doffed his hat. Afternoon, ladies. He said, strolling toward them across the creaking wooden floor. Mrs. Maple beamed. Hello, Mr. Price. How nice to see you again. Charlene, look who came to see us. Tyler smothered his grin upon catching Charlene's tiny eye roll, out of Mrs. Maple's sight. You look like you've been rode hard and put up wet, Tyler. Charlene observed. Funny, ma'am. He replied, letting his grin pop forth. That's exactly how I feel. Eyeing her closely as he reached the counter, he decided Charlene looked only slightly better than he did. Her mouth and eyes were lined with pain the already pale flesh of her face lighter still. However, her wide smile and the sparkle in her eyes made his heart beat faster. I happened by, he said, mesmerized by her unequal beauty.
and thought I might walk you home. If you're ready to go, that is. Well, no, not yet. She began. Mrs. Maple cut her off. Yes, of course, she is, Mr. Price. What little there is to do yet can be finished by Harold. You work me harder than a Hebrew slave, woman. Harold called out from the back room. Mrs. Maple shook her head in resignation. Charlene, such a dear, came in to work and insisted upon staying, even though she should be home, resting. Go on now, girl, you're finished here for today. Charlene frowned, her fine brows narrowing over her eyes. It's no trouble, I'm sure Tyler won't mind waiting. Mrs. Maple waved her hands. Go. Get your bonnet, dear, or else the sun will cook your head. Why is it you never have a concern for my head? Harold Maple, mind your own business. Amused by the husband and wife exchange, Tyler waited as Charlene vanished behind the curtain to fetch her sunbonnet. Mrs. Maple made a few comments about the weather, her eyes all but gobbling him up. Feeling uncomfortable about a married woman of her age staring at him so, Tyler fidgeted. After what was only a minute or two but felt like ages, Charlene returned to the front of the store, tying the ribbons of her bonnet under her chin. I'll see you in the morning, Jean. She said. Get your rest, dear, and tell your mother I said hello. Happy to have the door between himself and Mrs. Maple's eyes, Tyler put his hat back on and untied his horse from the rail. Charlene watched him closely, almost as closely as the other woman. But Tyler suspected she was trying to read his mind. Something is wrong, isn't it? Tyler nodded. He headed down the hot street, Charlene beside him, leading his bay. Someone set fire to my bunkhouse. Oh, no. Oh, yes. He replied, his tone grim. And when I catch you did it. I'll be right there with you. Charlene snapped, her voice as hot as the air around them. Did anything else on your property catch? Nope, thanks to Wintinta and the Comanche. In clipped words, Tyler told her about the fire, the Indians spotting three riders, and how they kept the fire from spreading. Doing good often inspires others to do the same. She commented. But who could be doing this Tyler? If I knew, I'd be on them like a hawk on a fat rabbit. Pausing at the livery stable long enough to care for his horse, leave him with food and water in the shady barn, Tyler then walked Charlene to her home. Could it be the same boys who were at the house last night? He mused. Shot at us and set my property on fire? I find that difficult to believe. Charlene replied, strolling through the small gate into her yard. Boys pull pranks. But trying to kill someone? Bad men can start off by being bad boys. Tyler replied, following her up the porch steps, removing his hat before going into the house. The odors of a juicy ham in the oven filled the house as they entered. Olivia came to the doorway of the kitchen, wiping her hands on a towel. You're a little early. She said, smiling, but that's all to the good. We have a little surprise for you. We? Charlene asked. Tosahui. The sound of wood striking wood, an odd thumping, emerged from the back room. The Comanche boy hobbled into view, propped up by a pair of crutches. He grinned upon seeing them, his splinted leg held up at the knee. Though obviously still not quite used to how they work, he nonetheless took a few more awkward hops toward them. Charlene clapped her hands, laughing. That is wonderful. Where did you get them? Sheriff Barker brought them. Olivia answered, her eyes shining. He wants people to think he's a gruff old codger, but deep down he has a soft heart. Tyler stepped across the floor to Tosahui, and clasped his arm, forearm to forearm. Glad to see you on your feet, kid. He said, even if the boy couldn't understand a word. Your pa would be right pleased to see you up and around. Grinning and nodding as though he understood. Tosahui rattled off something in Comanche, making gestures with his hands. Tyler scratched his head, glancing at Charlene and Olivia. I sure wish I knew what you were saying. But anyhow, 
you should be able to go home with your pa soon. Tosahui nodded happily, even as Olivia said. I am going to miss him when he goes home. But, come along everyone, get washed up, it's almost time for supper. Olivia must have tutored the boy in the finer arts of using a knife and fork, for he sat at the table, his broken leg sticking out to the side. And ate his meal using the utensils rather than his fingers. He followed the conversation around the table and made Tyler wonder if he understood English even if he didn't speak it. Predictably shocked when Tyler told Olivia about the fire, she said. That's just terrible. Who could have done it? We're still working on that. He replied. Right now, we have no idea. Tyler is suspecting that the boys who came here last night might be the same ones who shot at us and set the fire. Charlene added. Olivia frowned. I suppose that is very possible. Unlikely, however. Insisting upon doing the dishes herself, Olivia shooed Tyler and Charlene from the kitchen, leaving Tosahui where he was for her to talk to. Tyler found it odd, yet also not odd at all, that the two made conversation while neither understood the other's language. Sitting on the porch with Charlene as dusk crept across Bandera, Tyler relaxed in his chair, watching as a few cowboys rode past on their way to the saloon. A breeze brought with it the scent of honeysuckle and mountain laurel. Tyler felt some of his pain ebb away as he breathed slowly in and out. Reaching across to Charlene, he took her hand in his. As he had hoped, she offered no outraged shriek, and met his eyes with a small smile. This is nice. She commented in a low voice. I like you Tyler. I'm happy to hear that, ma'am. Tyler replied, grinning. Cause I like you, too. Thus. As evening fell and a shooting star crossed the heavens above, Tyler sat with her in contented silence, holding her hand and simply enjoying the moment. No conversation seemed necessary, as Tyler felt they understood one another without words, and shared a growing closeness toward one another. Inside the house, the lights went out one by one as Olivia blew out the flames and the lamps. Between that and his exhaustion, Tyler knew he should head for his pallet. Rising, he lifted Charlene up with him, gazing down into her perfect features. Good night, lady. He murmured. Before she could answer, he closed his lips over hers in a slow kiss. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon, so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube. Chapter 16 Unable to believe what was happening, Charlene felt Tyler's mouth on hers, his warm breath. She had heard tales of first kisses from girls when she was younger and found none of them came close to the truth. Craving his closeness, she shifted so her right arm crept around his neck while her left hand rested on his firm waist. His hands held her lightly around her back. Leaning into him, into his kiss, a tangle of emotions swirled in her head. Shock, pleasure, a little fear, and plenty of joy. Breathing in his masculine odors, she lost herself in time. At that moment, Charlene realized that her liking for Tyler could transform, like a caterpillar into a butterfly, to love. She gazed up into his smoky eyes as he pulled away from her. That was incredible. She murmured, her voice husky. Tyler bent and planted another sweet, tender kiss to her lips. I could stand here and kiss you all night, lady. He said, his own voice slightly hoarse. We need our sleep, though. Charlene nodded, smiling a little as she stepped back. But her hand seized hold of his, preventing him from walking into the house. I know you're right. Just one more? His teeth gleamed in the dark. Happy to oblige. If it were possible, this kiss lasted longer and made her giddy. Love and joy and happiness rising to fill her, pouring those emotions from her and into him. Never before had she felt swept away by these feelings and she let them carry her on a sweet and delicious wave. Charlene felt lost when he let her go, craving to be held in his arms, to crawl into them and stay there forever where nothing could ever harm her again. However, she was also a realist and knew she should take their growing relationship one small step at a time. Tyler grinned touching her cheek with his finger. 
have to save a few of those for tomorrow night. Squeezing his hand once more, she let it go. You're assuming I'll let you kiss me tomorrow night. She replied tartly. Oh, I wager you will. He said, opening the door of the house for her. I know an addict when I see one. Chuckling under her breath, Charlene found a lamp on the table turned down low. As though her mother had recognized their need for a romantic evening. She also observed the two small glasses of wine beside it. No doubt holding their evening dose of laudanum. She picked them up and handed one to Tyler. Cheers. She said, touching his glass with her own, then drank the vial liquid down. Tyler gulped his in one swallow, grimacing, then set the glass down. I hope I don't need that stuff for much longer. Charlene shuddered as the wine and laudanum mixture struck her stomach. At least it isn't nasty for nothing. It helps the pain. True. Gazing up at him as he stepped closer to her, lacing his fingers through hers, Charlene thought he might kiss her again. Hoped for it. Instead, he smiled down at her. Good night, sweet lady. Captivated by him, by the powerful mix of emotions she recognized in his eyes. She barely responded with her own good night as he turned around and strode to the room he shared with Do Sahoy. Slightly dazed, Charlene bent to blow out the lamp. Feeling as though she strode on a foot of air between her feet and the ground, Charlene strolled to the apple tree the next morning, humming under her breath. She had a smile for everyone she passed, even that dreadful old Mrs. Williams. Who always spoke to her as though she were a child and found fault with everything she ever did. Though she wasn't late, the Winston widows had arrived at the store before her. Turning to peer at her from under their matching flowery bonnets as she entered. Good morning, ladies. She greeted them cheerily. Good morning, Jean. Jean inspected her from head to toe while standing behind the counter, a self-satisfied smile playing around her mouth. You are looking better, Charlene. She said. Not so pale as yesterday. My arm still pains me. She admitted, heading to the office to remove her bonnet and fetch her dust cloth. But I am improving. It is just dreadful what happened to you and that dear Mr. Price. Miss Harriet said, bringing her hands yet her eyes gleamed with the anticipation of fresh drama. Yes, it was a little frightening. Charlene admitted as she returned from the back, her cloth in hand. If these two already know all about it, why do they feel the need to come pester me? Frightening, dear? Miss Darley exclaimed, her hand at her throat as though in a terrible shock. Why, were you not terrorized? I mean, you were shot, child. Suspecting they needed to see the evidence for themselves. Charlene merely shrugged and started to dust the already clean counters and shelves. Not really. And it was just a graze. Charlene was very brave in the face of danger. Jean told them, bustling about the counter to fetch the goods they needed outside of simple gossip. Kept her head and didn't panic. I'm so very proud of her. Oh, my, Miss Harriet said, following Charlene with her beady eyes as she went about her work. The sisters eventually paid for the items and left the store, no doubt unhappy with the little information they received. Still, Charlene mused as she cleaned, they could inform their fellow gossips about how well she was recovering. The bell tinkled overhead, forcing her attention from her thoughts and her head toward the door. Sheriff Barker strode in. He snatched his hat from his head, glowering at her as though she had murdered his best friend, his mustache quivering in dreadful ire. Where is that dratted Tyler? He barked. Good morning to you, too, Sheriff. Charlene replied calmly. I believe he is on his way to his ranch. Is something wrong? Sheriff? Jean inquired. Is something wrong? He repeated as though astonished. Yes, you're dang straight there is. That old monster Harvey Johnson escaped my jail, that's what's wrong. Charlene sucked in her breath. The man who had tried to kill her was now free and had threatened to try again. And would murder Tosahui. How did he get loose? She choked out her throat filled with fear. He had help. 
Sheriff Barker snapped, his eyes blazing in his fury. Someone bashed me over the head before dawn this morning, knocked me out cold. Next thing I knew the jail's open and Johnson's gone. Charlene felt cold all over, as though a winter chill blew through her body. What are you going to do? Barker glowered, stepping close to her. First thing, I'm gonna do is take you and your ma into protective custody. When he reached for her arm, Charlene jerked back, her own anger rising. No, you are not. She shot back. We are no safer in your jail than anywhere else, as Johnson's escape proved. Neither I nor my mother will rot in there while you chase this murderer down. Now you wait. Charlene is right. She turned away from the raging Sheriff Barker to find Harold standing by the counter, a rifle in his hands. Charlene had known him all her life, and never before had she ever seen him annoyed. Much less furious. Right this moment, he appeared as angry as a pain maddened bull. She and Olivia are not the criminals here, Vic, nor will they be treated as such. We will find an alternative way to protect them. Victor slapped his hat against his thigh in frustration. They can't stay here. Nor can the Comanche boy. Maybe Tosahui can go back to his people. Charlene suggested. They can protect him. That's fine and dandy. Barker grated, his anger unabated. But how do we protect you and your ma? Maybe we'll take up guns and protect ourselves. Sheriff Barker spluttered in indignation. You little gals can't be doing such like that now. He growled, looming over her. This wouldn't have happened if you hadn't taken in that calm. Raising her hand, Charlene slapped him hard across his cheek in a strong roundhouse blow. Shaking under the power of her fury, she ground out. Don't you ever say anything like that again. Not to me, and not to my mother. Do you understand me? As though he had forgotten his anger. Sheriff Barker stared at her, his hand rubbed his flaming cheek. His eyes popped from their sockets. You hit me. He said, his voice wandering. And I'm ready to do it again if you say one more thing against that boy. Expecting his rage to rise once his stunned brain started working again, Charlene braced herself for a verbal if not a physical brawl. He continued to gawk for long moments, disbelieving, then at last, drew in a deep breath and offered her a rueful grin. Dang, girl, I ain't been hit like that since I was a young buck. Charlene rubbed her stinging palm. You deserved it. Tosahui has done more for my mother than she ever did for him. If not for his being under our roof, my mother would still be sitting in her rocker staring at the fireplace. That's very true. Jean spoke up. I won't hear a bad word regarding that boy from anyone in my store. So, if you still want to keep buying your tobacco here, Sheriff, you'd better be on your best behavior. Sheriff Barker leaned against a glass case behind him. You're both right, and I apologize. Getting hit on the head done turned me into a mean old bear. Charlene relaxed at last. I would ask a favor, Sheriff. Teach my mother and me to shoot, and loan us some guns. Before you all do any of that, Harold said, or continue beating each other up in my place of business, give me some time to work on an idea I have. Walking around the counter, he handed his rifle to Sheriff Barker. The grizzled man stared from it to Harold and back again before taking it. You stay here and guard Charlene while I'm gone. I'll send someone to keep an eye on Olivia and the boy. What do you mean to do? He asked. Harold stalked toward the front door. Call a meeting. It was nearly closing time when Harold came back to the store. Sheriff Barker had lounged around the place as Charlene and Jean waited on customers, stocked the shelves, worked the books, and ordered more merchandise. Very few people questioned his armed presence and made pleasant conversation with him as they shopped. As usual, Charlene had gone home for her midday meal, finding a bemused Olivia and a wide eyed Tosahui under the watchful eyes of an armed man the local blacksmith. Josiah Jones nodded gravely to Charlene as she and Barker walked into the house. A big man with a pleasant voice and smile, he sat on the sofa with a 12-gauge shotgun. Happy to help. 
he replied when Charlene apologized for Harold taking him away from his work. Can't have some drunken maniac and wild boys harming you folks. I'm making sandwiches. Olivia said brightly from near the kitchen. I hope everyone is hungry. Thus, by the time Harold returned late in the day, Barker itched to get out and chase down his escaped prisoner. Clearly annoyed that Harold didn't return until far too late to begin a manhunt. Sheriff Barker's mustache constantly quivered, his brows lowered, and he paced the store's floor like a chained and agitated hound. Well? He demanded when Harold returned. Without being asked, Jean brought him cool tea to drink, and Charlene soaked a towel in water, wrung it out and handed it to him to wipe the sweat from his face and neck. Before I say anything. Harold began after taking a long drink of the tea. I spotted Tyler riding this way, so I'll wait until he gets here. Charlene frowned as Sheriff Barker began to bluster and protest, then quieted when he saw Tyler halt his horse outside. Entering the store, Tyler removed his hat and stopped, staring around at the silent tableau of people watching him. What? He asked, baffled. Come in, Tyler. Harold said, waving him in. I want you to hear what I have to say. Am I in trouble? Don't be ridiculous. Barker snorted. Harold, he's here now, get on with it. Drinking the last of his tea, Harold wiped his sweaty face and neck again, then said. Most of you probably don't know I served during the war. On the side of the Confederacy. Now there are about a dozen others who settled here after peace was called. He took another drink. We all know and trust each other, and seldom talk about the war except amongst our loved ones. I went around town and the farms outside asking them to meet with me. All of us, to a man agreed to post watches around the Quinn house until we catch whoever is trying to harm them. Charlene breathed in deeply. Harold, that is far too much to ask. These men have their farms and businesses to run. He nodded. We agreed to four-hour shifts so we can all get enough sleep and still work to feed our families. Too bad I can't get them to help me run down Johnson. Barker muttered, stroking his mustache. Do you know which way he went? Harold asked. Is he on horseback? He's had an excellent head start if he simply wants to run. And if he's still lurking around here hoping to slice some throats, then we'll be waiting for him. I expect that's true enough. Harold looked at Charlene, smiling. Well, little girl, will you let us safeguard you and your mother? Charlene glanced at Tyler seeing a tiny grin crossing his face. No doubt, he liked the idea. She nodded. Yes, I agree, for my mother's sake and the Indian boy. I am under too much obligation to you already. Jean huffed. This does not obligate you to anyone or anything, dear. You know that we here in Bandera look after our own. When one is under attack, we all are. Harold put his arm around Jean's shoulders. That's exactly it, Charlene. We do the same for anyone who cannot defend themselves from a knife in the dark. She grinned, feeling a great weight tumble off her shoulders. Thank you. Thank you both. Sheriff Barker grumbled something under his breath, then said, I'll stand my watches with you all, as I ain't gonna run off after my prisoner. Too doggone late now, anyway. We're glad to have you, Vic. Harold glanced at Tyler. When you've recovered enough, Tyler, you may join us if you want. He nodded after flicking a quick grin toward Charlene. I'll resume sleeping outside the boys' room at night. If something happens, I'm already there. Good man. Harold hugged Jean closer for a moment. Now, wife, I need some food, as I am standing the first watch tonight. Feed me, woman. Chuckling, Charlene strode quickly to the back room to grab her bonnet, then, as she put it on, walked back through to the front door. See you in a while, Harold. She said cheerfully, waving at Jean. See you tomorrow. Good night, sweetie. Jean called as she opened the door. With Tyler and Barker on her heels, 
Charlene entered the furnace that was South Texas, the sweltering heat and humidity striking her in the face like a brick. And it isn't even as hot as it will get. She muttered sourly. Yup. Barker agreed. Still spring here. But with it this hot so early, I expect we're in for a god-awful summer. That's what I like about you, Vic. Tyler replied, his tone sardonic. So encouraging. You'll wish you had stayed in Colorado before long, son. Wanting to hold Tyler's hand in public, Charlene strode through the street, not seeing many people at all. If I chose to, no one would see anyway. Still, it was far too hot for that, and she wiped her already sweating palms against her skirt. Josiah Jones rose from the couch as Charlene, Tyler and Barker trooped into the house, his shotgun in his hand. Tosahui sat in an armchair, his splinted legs sticking out ahead of him, gazing around at the sheer number of people filling the small house. I reckon I'll head on home then. Mr. Jones said, forcing Charlene to tilt her head back to see into his face. She had forgotten what a huge man he was. Are you one of Harold's fellers? Sheriff Barker asked him, stroking his mustache. Yes, sir. Harold told me what was going on, and I am very happy to help out. He grinned and touched Charlene's cheek with his knuckles. We can't lose these lovely ladies to some drunk with a vendetta. You come back any time, Josiah. Olivia called from the kitchen doorway. I'll make you a cherry pie. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Jones put his hat on, shook Tyler's hand. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Price. Heard a lot about you today. Tyler shook his hand. Thanks. And thank you for looking after them. I don't know what I'd do if something happened to these ladies. Nothing will. Mr. Jones assured him. Not now. With a friendly nod all around, the big blacksmith took his leave, closing the door quietly behind him. Charlene stepped up behind Tosahui, resting her hands on his shoulders. Turning his head, he grinned up at her. Thank you for bringing him the crutches, Sheriff. She said. It's made quite the difference for him. Sheriff Barker harumphed. Can't let him lie abed all day. Stunt his growth. Don't tell me you actually like the boy. Tyler said, sitting in the other armchair. Not you. Never said I did. Barker replied gruffly. Said it would stunt his growth. And you're a very poor liar. Not so. I happen to be a very good liar. Barker stole a glance at Charlene. When I want to be. I expect you're staying for supper. Sheriff? Charlene asked, hiding her smile at Barker's discomfiture. I suppose as I've been eating at your table so much. He said, still gruff, perhaps y'all should start calling me Vic. All this sheriff nonsense is a mouthful. Then, Vic, you may address me as Charlene and mother as Olivia. Charlene said. The less formality, the better. I'll tell mother we have another guest for supper. The five of them crowded around the small table, dining on Olivia's sumptuous fried chicken, mashed potatoes, cornbread, and boiled cabbage. Tosahui ate as though having been starved for a week, often talking in his native tongue. Olivia nodded as though she understood every word. Perhaps he's healed enough to go home to his father. Tyler mentioned, glancing between Charlene and Olivia. Absolutely not. Olivia declared her tone fierce. He cannot travel yet, and I certainly don't need that dreadful doctor returning to set his leg again. Charlene shrugged, happy to have Tosahui stay a while longer. I love having him here. And now that we have added protection, I won't worry so much about his safety. Tyler nodded, smiling a little. I'm giving reports to his father, who also seems willing to have him stay until he can ride. Then we'll hear no more about him leaving. Olivia stated. Her arm still burning as though constantly on fire, Charlene knew it was healing without any sign of infection. Olivia changed her bandage under the curious eyes of Tyler and Vic, the old linen coming off caked in dried blood. 
She winced as Olivia peeled it away, but the pain was not as bad as it had been. Red surrounded the long gash in her upper arm, but the wound itself was not as deep as it was when fresh. Victor peered at it. Healing from the inside out. That's good. Olivia rewrapped it after applying a cool ointment, but the wound continued to pain her despite the new dressing. Outside the window, darkness had fallen, and through the open windows. A freshening breeze hinted at rain. A good storm is just what we need. Victor commented. Cool things off for a day or two. Olivia nodded. It's been so dry. At that moment, a loud shout from outside the house was followed by a gunshot. Instantly, Tyler and Victor bolted from the house, grabbing their rifles that stood beside the door. Charlene followed. Charlene, no. Olivia cried. Chapter 17 In the distance to the north, lightning flashed on the black horizon. Many seconds later, thunder rumbled, dim with distance. Storm soon. Aaron absently wondered if they should seek shelter from it, gazing into the embers of their campfire. It doesn't matter anymore. Nothing does. He glanced at Franklin lying beside him, his eyes closed, his breathing fast and shallow. Though it was hotter than Hades at high noon, Aaron had covered him to his chest with a light blanket. It just didn't seem right to leave him exposed when he couldn't care for himself. During those times when Franklin woke, he restlessly threw it off with his hands. His legs never moved. A breeze that felt cooler than any of the others caressed Aaron's cheek as he stared into the fire. A scent of rain lay upon it. He had fed Franklin pieces of hot meat from the deer they shot, and since then his brother slept. Or appeared to be sleeping. One could never tell with an injury like Franklin's. After escaping the town's trap, the Dawson gang rode on through the day, Franklin unconscious, until finding this sheltered spot high upon a rocky wall with a curving overhang. From here, they could see anyone approaching save from the south. Aaron couldn't make himself care that someone from the San Antonio area might have ridden north to find them after the gunfight that morning. Franklin was dying. Turning his head, Aaron found Franklin's eyes on him. Hey, brother. Aaron said, trying to raise a welcoming grin. Aaron. Franklin's voice sounded weak, quavering. Where are? He stopped, swallowed, and tried again. George. Elmer. They went to find a town where they could steal medicine for you. They'll be back soon. Aaron stroked Franklin's hair back from his damp face. We're gonna get you well again, you'll see. Franklin's eyes latched onto his. His head rolled slowly back and forth. No. I can't. I can't feel my legs. Not now, brother, but you will. I promise. Aaron. Franklin reached weakly for his hand, grasping it. Franklin's flesh felt so cold as though his life were already leaving him. I hurt. So bad. I can't stand. This pain. He licked his dry lips. Aaron turned around, seeking his canteen of water. Kneeling, he held it to Franklin's lips, lifting his head with his free hand so his brother could drink more easily. There. You see? Aaron said brightly when Franklin could drink no more. You'll be good as new soon. Franklin swallowed again. No. Let me go. Please. Let you go? Aaron half smiled, pretending to himself he had no idea what it was his brother meant. We are staying right here until you get better, Franklin. Franklin closed his eyes, a long slow groan emerging from behind his clenched teeth. I'm in agony. Kill me, Aaron. I beg you. Kill me. Aaron tried to scoff even as a bolt of pure terror ran through him. Kill you? I can't kill you, you're my brother. I love you. I forgive you. It's all right. Please. Aaron turned away from the pleading in Franklin's eyes. No, he said, rocking back and forth. No. I'm gonna get you better, I swear it. I made you a promise, and I'll see it through. I'll get you to a doctor. Make him help you. 
Let me go, Aaron. I want to go. Rocking back and forth, Aaron covered his face with his hands. I can't. I can't. I can't. Tears leaked down his face beneath his hands, shame that he wept filling him. I'm ashamed to cry in front of my brother, but I am selfish enough to keep him here when he should have left me this morning. Taking his hands away, he wiped his tears away on his sleeve, observing that Franklin mercifully had fallen asleep again. Or passed out from the pain. Though he himself knew little about severe back injuries, Elmer had been happy to inform him. Elmer read more than Aaron did. Franklin's spine had broken, leaving him paralyzed from the waist down. He could not move his legs, nor feel anything below the injury. Yet above it, he could feel every agonizing movement of his splintered spine, the bones grinding together. Aaron recognized it as his fault. Franklin knew he had been too badly hurt to survive, could stand on his feet and shoot those that had sought to trap them. But Aaron's insistence of putting him on a horse had sealed his fate. His brother's spine, once fragile but intact, allowed him to stand. Elmer throwing him onto his horse finished shattering the bones in his back. I'm so sorry. Aaron said to the fire. I should have let you die then, as you asked me to. I didn't listen, out of my own selfishness, out of the need to never leave one of my blood behind. So, you finally acknowledge it, then. Aaron, crouching, spun, his revolver out and the hammer pulled back. Elmer and George emerged from the shadows and into the firelight. You gonna kill us, too? Elmer asked, his tone sardonic. Go ahead. Seems like that's all you can do. Kill your own flesh and blood. Aaron shoved his gun back into its holster and stood. Shut up. What did you get? Elmer tossed a leather satchel at his feet. Wound stuff. Splints. Bandages. Iodine. Laudanum. Shoving past him to the fire, Elmer squatted beside it, staring at Franklin. Too much of it will send him to sleep. He muttered. The sleep of the eternal. Aaron watched as George edged away from him, almost skittering, the whites of his eyes showing. What have you been telling George? Aaron demanded. Nothing. Elmer replied, not looking at him. He figured it all out by himself. Shut up, Elmer. George tried to snap through his shaking voice. I ain't stupid. I never said you was. Aaron didn't like the way George stared at him, as though Aaron himself had snapped Franklin's spine like a twig in his own two hands. What's your problem? He raged. You jumped from the window same as me. And you're fine. This was an accident. Why? You should have let him get shot. George said, stuttering in his fear. That's better than. George stared at Franklin, his eyes wide with terror. I'd rather be shot dead than that. He whispered. I am done scared to get shot. But that is far worse. Elmer ceased squatting and sat beside the fire with his legs crossed. So now what, big brother? He asked, not looking at Aaron. We lug him around while we rob banks and search for Benji? Aaron sank down by the fire as well. I don't know yet, damn it. He ran his hands through his shaggy hair. What if you're wrong and he can be fixed? He can't be fixed, Aaron. Elmer glared at him, his voice almost imperceptible. You gonna let him suffer like some coyote in a trap, dying by inches? In agony? Make him. Let me. Go. Franklin's voice, still weak, filled the tense silence over the crackling of the fire. Elmer. I want to go. Standing, Elmer walked around the fire to kneel beside Franklin, clasping his brother's hand. Frankie. He said softly, calling him by his childhood nickname. I brought laudanum. It'll kill your pain, but... Aaron watched him hesitate lick his lips, shunt his eyes away from the agony in Franklin's. Too much. He went on. And you'll go to sleep. Forever. Oddly, a smile creased Franklin's pain-wracked features. Yes.
Please, Elmer. Elmer stood up, then crossed the fire again to the leather satchel. He paused beside Aaron, still not looking at him. Say goodbye to him. Coward. On legs he couldn't feel, Aaron stumbled his way to Franklin's side, then knelt. He plucked his brother's hand from the blanket and held it. Forgive me, brother. He whispered. I am so, so sorry. I couldn't leave you behind. I forgive you, Aaron. Franklin continued to smile. Be at peace. Not without you. His throat closed up tight, blinded by tears, Aaron rose and walked numbly away from the fire and his dying brother. In the darkness, the shadows crept across what remained of his soul, filling it with coldness and dread. The black emptiness consumed him, and somewhere a distant part of him cried out in grief. Behind him, he heard George weeping, saying his last goodbyes. Listened to him collapse on the ground, wailing. Beyond that, Elmer's voice murmured something, words that Aaron could not understand. It didn't matter, though. He knew what was being said, what was happening. What was in the drink that Elmer offered Franklin. He stared up at the cold stars above and knew there would be no redemption for him. During all the robberies he committed, all the men he killed. He had never once considered what might happen to his soul after he left this world. Now he knew. With his brother dying behind him, and himself too cowardly to hold his hand, he knew there was no salvation for him. Ever. He didn't know how long he stood there, staring at the stars, feeling the emptiness, the blackness, within him, before Elmer stepped to his shoulder. He didn't turn when Elmer spoke those four fateful words. It's done. It's over. They buried their brother in a grave under a grove of pecan trees, dug out from the sandy soil with rocks and their own hands. It was laborious work, the sun beating mercilessly down on them, despite the shade of the trees. Aaron said not a word to either Elmer or George as they worked. Not when they lay Franklin in it, nor when they covered him with the dirt. To protect the grave from scavengers, they enclosed the mound with large stones. By late afternoon, the sun descending into the west in a riot of pink and purple. Aaron stood beside Franklin's grave with his head bared. Had a preacher been there, he no doubt would have spoken prayers, things about eternal life. As the eldest of his brothers and the leader of the Dawson gang, it fell to him to say something about Franklin. No words came to him. Only the black emptiness in his soul brought him any comfort. He was a good man. Elmer finally said, his hat in his hand. A fine brother. Maybe he's in heaven now, if there is such for the likes of us. I'm gonna miss him. George added, brushing at his eyes with his sleeve. Aaron felt both his brother's eyes on him, but he did not look up from the mound of rocks. He swallowed the lump in his throat, but it returned almost instantly. At last, he managed to choke out. Goodbye Franklin. Setting his hat back on his head, Aaron turned and strode quickly from the grave to the horses. Though he was hot, tired, and emotionally done in, he needed to be away from this place, to escape Franklin's ghost. He heard his brothers following, their boots crunching on the rocky soil as he untied his horse from the tree branch. Mounting up, he didn't look around as he reined his mount southwards. Hearing the rattle of hoofs as Elmer and George swung into their saddles to ride on his heels. Striking a canter, his mind empty, Aaron rode with the sunset on his right, not truly knowing what he intended to do. Behind him, he half listened to George's sniffling. Still weeping for Franklin. Elmer rode up beside him. What are you planning Aaron? Though he didn't want to talk, Aaron supposed his brother had a right to know. Find a place to camp. He replied slowly. Then head on to San Antonio, find Price. You know that Price may not know where Benji is. Elmer pointed out. He was just the fellow that caught him. That may be so. Aaron said. But he will still pay for what he did. Elmer shook his head. Look, we already lost one brother. Maybe we should just ride north, find new territory where they don't know us. Or head on down south of the border. At last Aaron looked over at Elmer. 
and leave Benji to rot in prison? We have no choice, Aaron. Elmer snapped. We don't know where he is, and this trying to find him may get the rest of us killed. Is that what you want? I won't leave Benji. Elmer stared at him, his eyes cold. Then maybe you should do it on your own, Aaron. Me, I want to live a while longer. I'm not liking the odds stacked against us. So, you would leave Benji in jail? Aaron asked, his voice just as icy. Then, go. You ride to Mexico and live it up. I'm riding to San Antonio to find Price and make him pay for what he did. I'm with you, Aaron. George piped up from where he rode, behind them leading Franklin's horse. I go where you go. That leaves you, brother. Aaron turned his face ahead of him to gaze out over the darkening landscape. Go. I won't stop you. Elmer said nothing, nor did he rein aside to leave, to depart and go his own way. None of them spoke much as they camped beside a small creek, built a fire, then munched cold rations for their supper. Before lying in his bedroll, Aaron strode to the rushing creek and stripped off his dusty clothes. Washing in the cold water almost felt like heaven after the day's heat as he rinsed the sweat and dirt from him. His guilt and the darkness in his soul remained with him. They rode out the next morning, Aaron estimating that they would reach San Antonio by nightfall. He had half expected Elmer to have taken his horse and vanished in the night. Yet he continued to follow Aaron without a word. Finding another small creek to water and rest the horses, they sat in the shade of a hackberry tree. We'll camp outside town. Aaron said at last as the midday sun rode high overhead. I'll go into town alone, maybe find a way to disguise myself. Ask around about price. Elmer nodded, chewing a strip of dried beef. That might work. They are looking for four outlaws, not necessarily a single man alone. How will you disguise yourself? George asked. Aaron shrugged. Tuck my hair under my hat, maybe wipe a load of dirt on my face. Look like a saddle tramp, that sort of thing. Would the law in San Antonio know where Benji is? George drank water from his canteen. We can force them to tell us like we did before. Elmer shook his head. Benji was captured in El Paso, not San Antonio. All they'd know is to take his wanted posters down. Oh. Mounting up again, the Dawson brothers continued on through the long, hot afternoon, their horses growing leathered under the exertion. In the distance, hills rose into their sight, marking the hill country that encompassed San Antonio and the smaller towns that surrounded it. By passing farming and ranching villages, Aaron decided they'd camp for the night near a river, realizing they'd not reach San Antonio that day. Sitting beside the fire after eating half-heartedly, Aaron glanced up into the darkness and saw Franklin. Dressed in the same clothes they buried him in, he gazed at Aaron with sorrow. He did not smile yet raised his hand as though in greeting. With a low cry, Aaron started up, half in panic and half in joy, garnering the attention of the other two. At his movement, Franklin vanished. Did you see him? Aaron gasped. Did you? He was right there. Elmer peered into the shadows, frowning. See who, what? Drawing his gun, George stood up and paced away from the fire, searching. I don't see anybody. Franklin. Aaron pointed to the spot. He stood right by that rock. Elmer scowled. Are you out of your mind now? George holstered his gun and returned to the fire. There's no one there, Aaron. But I saw him. I swear it. No such thing as ghosts, Aaron. Elmer growled. Franklin is dead. I know what I saw, Elmer. Aaron insisted, still staring, his eyes wide. He raised his hand like this. Aaron repeated the gesture, but Elmer shook his head. Your grief for him is playing tricks on your mind. He said, his tone filled with sorrow. We are all grieving for him. Opening his mouth to protest further, Aaron closed it again. Elmer and George would never believe him. He scarcely believed it himself. 
Why would Franklin come back from the dead to haunt him? Despite it was Aaron's fault he got hurt so bad, it was Elmer who actually put him down like a rabid dog. Haunt Elmer, not me. You said you forgave me, remember? His sleep that night was fractured by dreams of his dead brother. Franklin's face twisted in agony, holding his arms out to Aaron in supplication, his mouth saying, let me go even if no sound came out. Tossing and turning, often waking to stare at the stars. Aaron found no peace in his sleep that night. Nor will I find it ever again. Chapter 18 On Victor's heels, his rifle in his hand, Tyler heard Olivia scream for Charlene. A swift glance over his shoulder informed him that Charlene ran as quickly as she could behind him, her skirts in her hands. Knowing that to stop and demand from her to go back into the house was as useless as telling the wind not to blow. He continued on toward the rear of the house. Victor stopped dead, Tyler all but slamming into his back. Thinking the sheriff had found something, Tyler gazed around, walking into the shadows and found nothing. There was no one back there and also no Harold or the other man who was supposed to stand guard. Did you see something? He asked. No, damn it. Victor replied, his voice tight. Where's Harold? Charlene arrived, asking. What happened? We don't know, T. Ler answered, exploring the small yard, peering across the fences into the neighbor's property. No one is here. That was Harold's voice yelling. She said, striding toward the front of the house. I'm sure of it. Tyler went with her, baffled as to what may have occurred. Standing by the street, he gazed up and down the quiet neighborhood, listening to dogs barking a distance away. Suddenly, Charlene pointed toward the alley that ran between the homes across the street. What's that? Peering into the gloom. Tyler thought he saw two men walking toward them, something between them, but he couldn't be sure. Hello? He called. We caught one. Harold hollered back. The other two got to horses and ran off. This one wasn't as quick. Crossing the street, the two men approached the house, the lights from within the windows illuminating them as they drew closer. Charlene gasped. That's just a boy. Harold and the other man firmly held the arms of a struggling youth, their grips on him relentless. Behind Tyler and Charlene, Olivia opened the door to the house as Victor trotted around the corner. What have you got? He demanded. Harold and the other man hauled the boy up the porch steps and into the light. I'd say this here is Ian Miller. Let me go. The kid squalled, trying to kick, whipping his head back and forth his dirty face a mask of terror. One of the Miller boys? Olivia asked, standing aside and holding the door as the men dragged the kid into the house. Tyler's eyes met Charlene's, seeing the confusion that must be in his own. Why would the Millers be harassing us? She asked, baffled. That is what I intend to find out. Victor snapped, gesturing for Tyler and Charlene to precede him into the house. Harold and the other man, whom Tyler found out was Jack Ortega, also the local undertaker, sat the kid firmly on the couch and stood over him. Their hands on his shoulders kept him securely planted, even as Ian glared his hatred at To Sahui. His tears created clear streaks down his stained cheeks. All right, Ian. Victor bellowed, standing in front of him with his fists on his hips. Start talking. Tyler watched as Ian's expression turned mulish, his mouth closed tight, his brown eyes under the tangle of dark hair defiant. He said nothing. Guessing him to be about twelve years old, Tyler couldn't help but admire the way he glared back at Victor. Not intimidated by the sheriff or all the adults in the room staring at him. I know it was you boys who threw that rock and hit me. Victor went on. That's an offense I can put you in jail for. Why are you coming around here, boy? Ian shunted his eyes to the side and still said nothing. Were you the ones taking shots at Miss Gwynn and Mr. Price? This time, Ian flicked a glance toward Victor, then away again. Tyler knew immediately it was indeed Ian and his brothers who were responsible for almost killing him and Charlene. 
Why were you trying to kill us? He asked. Did you set fire to my place? Sullen, the kid sat silent, determined not to say a word. Tyler glanced at Harold. Did you find the horse he was trying to get to? Harold nodded. It's still tied up a few streets over. Jack. Victor said, not taking his fierce stare off the kid. Will you go get it? It might have the Bar H brand on it. Right away. The undertaker slipped out of the house and into the night. Stealing horses is a hanging offense here in Texas. Victor went on. If that pony was stolen from the Bar H, you will hang son. Is that what you want? The court don't make allowances for little bitty boys. I ain't done nothing. The kid replied, sullen, not looking at Victor. If that horse comes back with the brand I think it will. Victor told him, setting his hands on his knees and bending toward Ian to be on eye level with him. Then you are guilty of stealing horses. It wasn't me. Ian cried, tears leaking from his eyes again. It was Kevin. He did it, not me. Victor straightened, glanced at Tyler and Charlene. That be the oldest. About sixteen, I think. Dennis is the middle one, maybe fourteen. Kevin made me. Ian sobbed. I didn't want to. He threw the rock, stole them horses. What for? Victor demanded. Ian jerked his head toward Tosahui. Him. Kevin hates engines just like our pa did before he ran off. Kevin says all engine lovers should die. Was it Kevin who tried to strangle Tosahui that first night? Charlene asked. Ian nodded. I told him, we would get into trouble, but he don't listen. So, it was you who tried to shoot at us? Tyler said. Damn engine lovers. Victor raised his hand as though to slap his face. You watch your mouth, boy. You just admitted to stealing horses and being an accessory to attempted murder. Burning down that bunkhouse is arson, which is a crime that'll put you in jail for the rest of your life. Provided the judge don't hang you. Tyler felt sorry for the kid as he whooped in loud sobs, crying his heart out. It was Kevin who made me. He wept, his shoulders shuddering. I didn't wanna. Charlene leaned toward Tyler. Murmuring. Odd how he swings between remorse and defiance. He's a kid. Tyler replied. He only knows what he has been taught, hatred for the Indians and anyone who helps them, yet still a young boy who is scared to death. It must have been him I heard crying that night. Charlie nodded. I knew all those boys were troubled but had no idea it was this bad. I'm guessing no one did. Tyler met Harold's eyes over Ian who nodded. Their pa was a bad one. He said, his voice low. Always in the bottle, beat the kids and his wife, spewing his hatred of Indians, Negroes and Mexicans. Anyone who wasn't white. Don't you say nothing about my pa. Ian yelled. Shut your lip boy. Victor warned, raising his hand in a definite threat. You don't talk unless you've been asked a question. Got it? Flinching from his lifted hand, Ian nodded, sniffling, using his sleeve to wipe his nose, his eyes on his lap. With a sigh, Victor stared down at him, his thumbs hooked into his gun belt. Now I gotta decide what to do with him. The jail? Tyler suggested. And have him get broke out just like Johnson? Victor groused, rubbing the back of his head. I don't need another strike to my noggin. Johnson must be with him. Charlene said. Is that true Ian? She received a sullen nod but no other answer. So, the jail is out. She commented. Well, we need to keep him somewhere. Victor complained, pacing away from the kid. At least until I can get him to San Antonio. His brother won't find him there. Or break him out. The sheriff there has deputies. Tyler grinned. We can always take him up to my place and put him in the care of the Comanches. At his words, Ian screamed, loud and piercing, making Tyler wince and Charlene to cover her ears. 
drawing breath, he continued to shriek, crying. No, 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 no. That's enough. Olivia snapped, her voice carrying over the boys. Stop it, Ian. Unbelievably, Ian silenced instantly. He continued to sob, hoarse, his entire body shaking. Tyler felt sympathy toward the kid again, wondering how any father could treat his children the way this boy obviously had been. Beaten, taught nothing but hate and fear, then abandoned. No wonder he was troubled. Glancing up, Tyler found Olivia's frown of intense disapproval aimed at him. What? Putting this child amid those he is terrified of is cruel Tyler. She grated. You should have known better than to suggest it. Yes, ma'am. His eyes met Charlene's, her lips lifted in a grin. I think it would have served him right. She muttered from the side of her mouth. I heard that, Charlene. Yes, mother. What about that old jail? Harold asked. We could put him there. No one would find him, and he can yell until he's blue in the face. What old jail? Victor's scowl faded away in his bewilderment. You don't know about it? If I did, I wouldn't be asking, now would I? Harold grinned. Back in the day, the town's founders built a jail inside solid rock, planted the bars into holes drilled into it. It's almost a cave but doesn't go in very far. I had heard rumors about that place. Charlene said thoughtfully. I never knew it really existed. From what I had heard, Harold said, the law back then kept condemned men in it. Then our current jail was built, and the other fell into disuse and obviously was mostly forgotten. Have you been there? Victor asked. Can you show me in the morning? Certainly. But what do we do with Ian tonight? I reckon he'll have to stay in the other tonight until we can shift him in the morning. Victor replied, glowering at Ian. Don't stay at the office alone, Vic. Tyler advised. I'll go with you to take him, then lock him up and you can come back with me. No sense in risking them jumping you again. All right. Let's get him on down there. As Victor reached for the boy's arm, the front door opened with Jack entering the small house. Seeing Victor, he nodded. You were right. The horse carries the Bar H brand. It's tied up out front. Grabbing Ian's arm, Victor hauled him up, staring down at the cringing boy with a fierce glare. Horse thief. You're in serious trouble, boy. Glancing at Harold and Jack, Victor said more calmly. You boys stay here and look after the ladies. Tyler and I will take this child to sit in my jail and think of his interesting future in prison. Since Ian started struggling again as Victor started toward the door, Tyler took his other arm to ensure he didn't wriggle free from Victor's grasp and bolt. He himself knew how fast this boy could run. He glanced at Charlene as he left the house, offering her a grin. Back soon. We'll be here, she replied. Pausing to untie the Bar H horse, Victor led it with them in his free hand, muttering under his breath as Ian continued to kick and howl. Looking after this little monster will not be easy or pleasant. He said. I wouldn't be surprised if everyone in town woke to his racket. He can certainly wake the dead. Tyler agreed. Sure enough, no few residents emerged from their homes to discover what the fuss was about. A man yelled from the doorway of the house. What in our nation is going on out there? I'm Sheriff Barker, and I'm taking this juvenile horse thief to my jail. Victor hollered back. Go on back in your homes. Nothing to see here. The resonating sound of galloping hooves echoed through the night as three horses broke from an alley almost beside them. At the same instant, gunfire pierced the dark, small flames erupting from the barrels. Tyler, unable to raise his rifle in defense and keep a hold of the kid, let go of Ian and aimed at the charging riders. He fired off two shots before the shoulder of one of the horses struck him sending him spinning to the ground. As his rifle was wrenched from his hand, he fought to grab it while Victor cursed. His body twisting, Victor fell to his knees, and let go of both the Miller kid and the horse. Both bolted in the direction of the riders, who had slowed their mounts to wheel, 
shooting at Tyler and Victor again. Bullets peppered the ground near Tyler's head, forcing him to duck and roll. Seizing his rifle, Tyler rose to his knees, firing at the riders, now halted in the street. He knew one bullet struck home when he heard a choked-off cry, but none fell from a horse. A shadow reached a hand down to Ian, hefting him up behind his saddle. Tyler fired one more round before his rifle clicked, empty. Fearing the riders would charge back to finish off both Victor and himself. He got his feet under him, prepared to bolt to shelter. The riders didn't charge. Instead, they hit a gallop again, fleeing down the street to vanish into the night. Tyler stood. Vic? You all right? No, I ain't. Victor groaned. I've been hit. Chapter 19 Four days after Franklin died, Aaron rode his horse down San Antonio's main street. For a disguise, he wrapped his bandana around his head, keeping his distinctive red hair tucked under his hat, the blue cloth covering his brow. Dirt and a new mustache, his cheeks and chin shaved, half hid the rest of his face. Despite the heat, he put on an old coat and slouched in his saddle. Passing people on foot and horseback, he eyed the street vendors, many of whom were Mexicans selling food, trinkets, serapes, boots, and saddles. A few Comanche Indians traded in town, bartering at the tables. White folks shopped there or passed them by, and no one seemed to pay much attention to him at all. Strangers were common here, and with so many people, he didn't think he would stand out among them. Reining in at one of several saloons, Aaron dismounted and tied his horse to the rail among several others. Thinking that perhaps Price may have spent time in San Antonio, or lived near the town, Aaron suspected a saloon might be the best place to start. Standing at the bar, well away from the others there, Aaron ordered a beer and tossed a coin to the bartender. Glancing around covertly, he saw no one who seemed particularly interested in him. The barman came back with his beer and set it on the mahogany counter in front of him. I'm looking for a friend of mine. Aaron ventured, catching the man's attention. I think he moved here from El Paso. What's his name? Tyler Price. The bartender shook his head, his jowls wobbling. Never heard of him. Good looking fellow, Aaron pressed on. Long black hair. Don't know him. The bartender moved on to serve his other patrons leaving Aaron to nurse his beer, thinking that San Antonio was large enough that Price might be here, and no one knew him. Yet. Aaron tapped his glass thoughtfully. If Price lived around here, he would have to come into town for supplies. That would mean he would purchase them at the general stores. Finishing his beer, Aaron went back out into the raging inferno that was the Texas summer and untied his horse. Mounting up, he rode down the street, keeping an eye out for mercantile shops, and halted his mount at the first one he found. Three women left the shop as he entered, sending sawdust, coffee, candy, and tobacco. Other shoppers roamed the place as he walked to the two men behind the counter. One glanced at him. Help you? Yes, maybe you can. Aaron replied. I'm hoping to find a friend of mine. Tyler Price. Does he maybe buy his goods here? The fellow shook his head. Never heard the name, mister. Sorry. Good looking guy? Long black hair? Doesn't sound familiar. Riding up, down and through the town, Aaron asked the same question of all the general stores he found, the bank, the assayer, even the Mexican from whom he bought his lunch. All he received for his trouble was the same answer. No never heard of him. Discouraged, Aaron rode back through town toward the outskirts where his brothers awaited him. Maybe he did head to old Mexico, then. Elmer said, his tone thoughtful as he and George sat beside the fire, a haunch of beef spitted over the flames. Aaron unsaddled his horse and led him to the creek for water, then picketed him where he could graze. I still think that's not Price's style. Aaron replied, sitting down beside the fire. The odors of the cooking beef made his mouth water, even as he sipped from the bottle of whiskey he had bought in town and passed it to Elmer. How else can we find him? George asked. He could be anywhere. That's true. 
Elmer said. Now will you consider giving up this fool plan to find Price? Let's just focus on Benji. Taking off his hat and the bandana, Aaron pondered that idea. While he craved his revenge on Tyler Price as much as he craved food, he began to rethink. Elmer was right. Price could have gone anywhere, from old Mexico to New York and never leave a trace behind. Come to think of it, he may even have gone back to Colorado. Aaron knew he had spent many years there. He nodded at last. We'll focus on finding Benji, but if we come across Price's trail anywhere, we go after him. Got it? Elmer nodded. Fair enough. Are there any federal marshals in San Antonio, you think? It's a fair-sized town. Aaron replied, his eyes on the sizzling meat as George turned the spit. There could be. As I have already been there, asking questions, maybe you should go tomorrow. Ask around. If there are, we can pay him a visit. I don't have a problem with that. Elmer said. George, you're gonna burn that side if you don't work that spit right. Aaron discovered the wonders of napping in the shade while the sun beat down upon the land from above. George sat cross-legged nearby, playing with a deck of cards. Elmer had ridden into town hours ago and likely wouldn't return until late. Aaron had given him instructions to bring back not just whiskey, but coffee and salt as well. Aaron woke suddenly out of another dream of Franklin where his brother reached for his throat with blood-caked hands. Breathing hard, his heart racing, he glanced around, expecting danger to arrive with guns blazing. The horses quietly dozed in the shade of a cluster of cedar trees, rear hooves cocked, resting as George lay back against his saddle, sleeping. Rising, Aaron walked to the stream for a drink and to splash cool water over his face and head. Hearing hoofbeats approaching, Aaron drew his revolver, ducking behind the rocks to peer over the top. Two horses, riding at a slow canter. The lead horse, a bay with a wide blaze across his face, he recognized as Elmer's. Shoving his gun back in its holster, he trotted back to George, kicking his brother's ankles. Wake up. Elmer's back, and he brought someone with him. George woke with a snort. What? Get up. We've got company. Who? Get up and find out. Striding to the dry wash, Aaron stood in plain view as George scrambled to join him, placing his hat on his head and adjusting his gun belt. But that's Elmer. George said. But who is that with him? Waiting for the two horses to approach, Aaron squinted to see better against the brilliant sunlight. A man with a star on his vest and a gang across his mouth. Aaron almost whooped as he recognized that the man's hands were bound behind his back. He's a prisoner. Elmer must have captured him. What for? George asked, puzzled. I'll guess he's a federal marshal we can interrogate. Elmer's wide grin flashed in the sun as he halted both horses a few feet from Aaron and George. Aaron, meet federal marshal James Colbert. James. Meet my brothers Aaron and George Dawson. Colbert's ice blue eyes over the gang glared his defiance, yet Aaron observed the faint quiver in his shoulders, the nervous tick next to his right eye. The man was scared, and that's exactly how Aaron liked federal marshals to be. Welcome, Mr. Colbert. Aaron said, stepping to the horse's head, gazing up. I hope you don't mind answering a few questions for us. Colbert tried to yell behind his gag, but all that emerged was what sounded like a muffled curse word. George, help him down from his horse. Aaron said, stroking the horse's nose, watching Colbert closely as George dragged him from the saddle and dumped him in the dirt. Elmer stepped to his side, staring down at the marshal. He recognized me, Aaron. He said. He was following me, so I led him into an alley and got the drop on him. Had to take him through a lot of side streets to get him out of town unseen. Aaron clapped Elmer on the back as George seized Colbert by the boots and hauled him near the fire. You did excellent, brother mine. Elmer gazed into Aaron's face. But he'll be missed. We have to get what we can from him and haul out of here fast. Right. Aaron squatted beside Colbert's head and removed the gag. 
you know who we are. Colbert nodded, his lips thinned in defiance. I know who you are. Where did your pals in the Marshal Service take our brother Benji? For a moment, Colbert's eyes clouded in confusion, his brows started to knit. Then his expression grew defiant again. If I tell you, you'll release me? Not when you're lying. Aaron replied calmly. I read it in your face. You don't know. Do you? Colbert licked his lips, nervous. No, I do not. I wasn't part of your brother's detail in taking him to prison. It's a secret that's been guarded, and no one who was part of it is talking. Aaron took off his hat, scratched his head with a sigh, and put it back on. Then, you're no good to us. Shall we kill him now? George asked, his voice eager. Colbert's expression changed to fear. Wait. I can tell you where I think he was taken. I don't know for sure, though. I'll tell you only on the promise that you don't kill me. Why would you believe the word of a Dawson? Aaron inquired politely. I have to. Give me your word, and I'll tell you. But then you'll tell your marshal friends that we had you, and then warn the prison that we're coming. That doesn't work out so well for us, now, does it? Look. Colbert said, sweat sliding down his temple to mat his silver hair, we give each other our word. You let me live, and I won't tell my friends what happened to me. Deal? And the prison? I don't care what happens to that. Colbert replied, licking his lips. You can wait a year from now when they're done looking for you, your brother will still be there, and you can break him out when they think you've gone to Canada. That's nothing to me. Hmm. Aaron stroked his chin. All right. I'll let you live. What prison? I believe. Colbert said, swallowing hard, he was taken to the federal prison in Sugar Land. Sugar Land, eh? Why there, you think? Something I overheard. Colbert replied, licking his lips again, nervous. I heard only part of the conversation, see? Two marshals chatting about Benji Dawson, then I lost some of what they were saying. Then I heard the name Sugar Land. Reasonable. Aaron nodded. Thank you for your information, Colbert. He stood. You're gonna let me live, right? Colbert asked, I mean, we have a deal. Aaron shrugged. I won't kill you. He replied. But the elements might. Colbert's jaw dropped. You're not gonna leave me here, tied up like this? Yup. If you're lucky, your pals will come searching. If not, then I guess you're not so lucky. Ignoring Colbert's screams and demands to be let loose, that he would die in this heat, he may as well put a bullet in his head. Aaron ordered George to saddle his horse. He kicked out the remains of the fire, then saddled his own, and snubbed Colbert's horse to his knee. Nice horse. He called to Colbert. And thanks. Barely listening to the marshal's shouts and yells behind him, Aaron led the way back north in order to skirt San Antonio before heading east. From just behind him, Elmer said. You know he can get to water, Aaron. He will probably get loose, then set the marshals on us. Aaron grinned. I know. They won't find him for several days, however, which by then our trail will be cold. We might even get Benji out before they can wire the prison to be on the lookout for us. It's at least a four-day ride to Sugar Land. And can you even trust what he said? No. But it's a place to start, eh? I think he was telling the truth. George added. Aaron turned in his saddle to gaze back. Why do you think that? George shrugged, his hands full with guiding his own horse and leading Franklin's. I read his body signs, you know? Horses and dogs talk like that to each other. People do, too. He believed what he was saying. At least the part about Sugar Land. I think he lied about the rest. About not caring if we break our brother out? Elmer nodded. That makes sense. Of course, he would care. He's a marshal. 
So, we're headed to Sugarland. Aaron said, satisfied. Let's just get there before the prison is warned and is expecting us. Through the rest of the afternoon, the Dawsons rode north before turning east just as dusk fell. Thunderheads climbed into the sky on their left flank, lightning flashing within their depths. Unlike the storm a few days ago, which dissipated into nothing, this one meant business. Aaron kept an uneasy eye on it as the wind picked up, the scent of rain on its wings. We need to find shelter. He said, trotting his mount to the top of the ridge and studying the deep black clouds drawing closer. There's nothing out here. Elmer replied, standing in his stirrups and looking around. George pointed. There's a bunch of trees right there. They'll block the wind and shelter the horses. Let's go. Aaron trotted back down to rejoin his brothers, following the rocky gulch to the thick stand of mesquite and cedar trees that line the steep ravine. It had room enough for five horses under the sheltering branches, and a thin trickle of water offered water for the thirsty men and beasts. Loosening cinches but keeping the saddles on the horses, they let their mounts drink, then graze on the thin grass. Aaron kept a wary eye on the storm as thunder cracked and rolled in the distance. The thunderheads growing to a nearly black color and climbing high. This is a mean one. He muttered. Tying the horses under the trees where the spreading branches offered some protection in case the storm decided to turn into hail. Aaron and his brothers squatted by the creek munching dried beef and salted pork. They built no fire and scented rain on the rising wind. Above them, the branches whipped back and forth under the rising wind. It sure feels a lot cooler. George commented as the daylight was shrouded by the oncoming storm, setting his hat firmly on his head before the wind could blow it away. Feels good, Elmer agreed. Lightning flashed blinding their eyes, with thunder booming close on its heels. Aaron flinched, seeing Franklin's ghost in the aftermath of the brilliant light, standing a few feet above the creek. He shut his teeth against an exclamation, knowing Elmer and George would think he was crazy if he mentioned seeing Franklin again. The image vanished as more lightning cracked around them, the rolling thunder almost continuous. Fat drops of rain spattered down amongst them, beginning with only a few increasing within just minutes. Aaron huddled with his arms clutched around himself as the temperature dropped at the same time the rain slashed down in torrents. The horses shifted restlessly, their ears flicking back and forth nervously as the lashing rain increased further until it felt as though Aaron stood under a waterfall. The darkness of late dusk enfolded them despite that the hour was far too early for the sun to descend. This is hardly a shelter. He yelled over the storm's wrath. Maybe there's something else. George hollered back, standing up and stepping out toward the creek. Where once there had been a thin trickle of water, now... A full-sized stream ran through it as he stepped gingerly on the wet rocks to peer up and down. Aaron felt the ground tremble beneath his boots, a distant rumbling that confused him. Wiping rainwater from his face, he peered through the murk toward Elmer, who stared back at him, just as baffled. What is that? he yelled. Don't know. Elmer stood, gazing around through the near darkness and driving rain, then stared toward George. He walked out from beneath the trees to get a better vantage point. Aaron joined him, feeling the ground vibrating under him. Even through the gloom and the savage rain, he saw his brother clearly. George glanced upstream and his jaw dropped. Oh, crap! He yelled. Scrambling across the rocks and the rapidly running stream, George tried to run. His foot caught between two rocks, and he fell with a splash into the rushing water. Elmer took two strides toward him, then cursed, his voice filled with panic. Flash flood! he yelled. George, get out of there now. Chapter 20 Tasting panic like dry iron in his mouth, Tyler ran to Victor. Falling to his knees beside him, he asked, Where? My leg. Victor gasped. Damn, does getting shot hurt like the Dickens? Peering into the darkness, Tyler found Victor's hands clutching his thigh just above his knee. Dark blood gushed from the wound. Snatching Victor's bandana from his neck, Tyler quickly tied it around the gaping hole, making Victor yell out in pain. 
the night around him faded as people carried lanterns into the street, surrounding him and Victor, asking questions Tyler had no time to answer. He gazed up at a few men clad in their dressing gowns who stared down in shock. Help me get him to the doctor. Tyler stood up amidst them. Someone, grab a blanket, we'll have to carry him. One young man still in his day clothes bolted toward a house as the crowd around Victor on the ground increased. Who was that, Sheriff? Someone asked. Who shot you? Never mind that. Victor growled, struggling to sit half up. One of you run and wake up McFadden. Two men abandoned the small crowd and hustled down the street, vanishing into the darkness. Tyler turned as he heard Charlene's voice raised in fear, seeing her push her way through, Harold at her shoulder. Tyler. She cried. We heard shooting. Victor got hit. Tyler replied, taking her arm. We're gonna get him to the doctor. Charlene knelt beside Victor. In the light of the lanterns, Tyler watched as Victor gave her a wry grin. I'll be all right, Missy. I'm too cranky to die now. You better not, you old coot. Charlene replied, inspecting his wrapped wound. What happened? Ian's brothers and Johnson were waiting. Tyler said. Anticipated we'd take the kid to the jail and ambushed us. Took Ian and bolted. The young man pushed his way back through the townspeople, carrying a thick wool blanket. With Tyler's help, he spread it on the ground. All right. Tyler ordered as Harold and another man stepped forward. Careful of that leg. Let's pick him up and put him on the blanket. With Victor gasping and struggling to not yell out, Tyler, Harold, and the others hefted him onto their makeshift stretcher. Bending, they each took a corner and lifted Victor, the throng parting to let them pass through. Charlene strode at Victor's side, holding his hand, offering a few words of encouragement as they marched him down the street. Dr. McFadden's house stood a few blocks down and around a corner, lights blazing in the windows. McFadden and the two men who ran to warn him that he had a patient arriving stood on the porch waiting for them. The doctor waved at them impatiently as Tyler, Harold and the other two trooped up his porch steps. Lay him on the table in there. He ordered crossly. Obeying him, Tyler and the others lifted Victor up to set him gently on the steel table in what appeared to be McFadden's medical office. Cabinets filled the small room while bottles, metal instruments, bandages, and jars filled the counters. The place smelled of herbs and ointments as well as a strong odor of alcohol. Tyler hoped it was for the patients and not the good doctor himself. He and the others stepped out of the way as McFadden untied the bloody bandana from Victor's thigh. What have you done this time, you idiot? He asked, his tone mild. Got shot. Victor retorted. Why else would I come see you? Because you miss me. Like hell. Taking up a pair of scissors, McFadden cut away Victor's trousers, exposing the still oozing wound. You might just keep your leg, you old geezer. McFadden remarked, pulling a lantern closer and peering at it. I can see the bullet. Then yank it out. McFadden gazed at Tyler, Harold, and the others, his eyes resting briefly on Charlene. You heard him. He said. He said to pull it out. I'll need you all to hold him down. Charlene set her hands on her hips, glaring at the doctor. Give him some laudanum first. He doesn't need to suffer while you do it. A smile briefly touched McFadden's lips, then he looked at Victor. Sheriff? Should I give you laudanum? Yes, damn it. Victor snapped. You know I don't do pain well. McFadden went to a cabinet and took down a large brown bottle. Pouring some of the liquid into a small glass, he then handed it to Victor. Drink this. You'll still feel some pain, but it won't be as bad. Gentlemen, please help hold him down. Tyler stood by Victor's left shoulder, offering his friend a small grin as Victor downed the pain medicine. Like it? Victor grimaced as he handed the glass to McFadden. Hell, no, I don't like it. It's like drinking poison. 
Actually, some poisons taste quite nice. McFadden commented. Or so, I'm told. Within a few minutes, Victor's eyes closed, and his head fell back against the table. His breathing slowed, grew even and deep. McFadden peeled back one of his eyelids, then nodded with satisfaction. All right. It's time. Hold him down, please. As Tyler and the others each gripped a portion of Victor's body, McFadden picked up a forceps, then bent over Victor's leg. Muttering under his breath as he worked, he inserted the tool into the wound to pull the bullet out. Victor moaned, thrashing so hard he almost threw Tyler off. Charlene, holding Victor's hand, winced as his grip on it tightened painfully. Keep him still. McFadden ordered. I almost got it. He and the men pushed with all their weight on Victor's body as he tried, even in the depths of his unconsciousness, to throw them off, to escape the agony. McFadden straightened, lifting the forceps to the light in triumph. Got it. Picking up a cloth, he wiped blood from the wound as it leaked onto the table, then turned to grab a bottle of iodine. Pouring a large portion into the wound, making Victor cry out and try to kick out with that leg. Quickly and expertly, the doctor bandaged the wound with a clean cloth, nodding that the men could release him. He'll lay still now, McFadden said. I have a small cot where he can sleep the rest of the night. He directed Tyler and the others to carry Victor into a tiny room just off the office with nothing in it save a narrow bed. Placing Victor on it, Tyler took a moment to gaze down at him, his grizzled features, his thick silver hair. The others filed out, but Charlene slipped her hand into Tyler's, also staring at the injured man. He'll be all right. She whispered. Tyler smiled briefly. I hope so. I've grown rather fond of him. So have I. Charlene tugged on his hand. Come on. There's nothing more we can do right now except let him sleep. Leaving the room, they found McFadden cleaning his table and instruments, Harold waiting for them by the door, the other men gone. The doctor didn't look up as they passed him, nor did he speak as they joined Harold at the door. Thank you. Tyler said glancing at the doctor's back. McFadden didn't answer. Leaving the house, Tyler closed the door behind him and ambled down the porch steps with Charlene and Harold. Not a real friendly man. He commented as they strode toward Charlene's house. Harold shook his head. Never has been. But he knows his medicine, even if his bedside manner could use a softer touch. Harold. Charlene said. Still holding Tyler's hand, you should go on home to Jean. Your watch is up, isn't it? It would seem so, Harold replied. After the events of tonight, protecting you is more important than ever. These boys are determined. I'm sure one of the shooters was Johnson. Tyler commented. There were three of them, one was an adult. The rider who picked Ian up didn't look full grown. So with Johnson's meanness, Charlene added, her tone bitter, he's instigating these boys into greater violence. They're doing things they might not do on their own. That's probably quite true. Harold replied, slowing his pace. You got him hurt, then thrown into jail for a crime more serious than disturbing the peace. He's not likely to forgive that. He's a drunken fool. Charlene snapped. And a dangerous one. Tyler added. Harold, you go on home. I'll walk Charlene back to the house, then bunk outside the window. Harold clasped his hand. The next shift should be there already. Get your rest. We're all going to need it. The remainder of the night passed uneventfully, the early morning sun waking Tyler with its bright rays streaming into his eyes. Yawning. He stretched, wincing as his bruised shoulder protested vigorously. Yet, his pain had lessened considerably even if the discoloration remained a hideous black and yellow combination. Getting up, he wandered into the house, nodding a greeting to the two men on the porch, rifles in their hands. Tosahui, sitting at the table, greeted him warmly as Olivia set a plate of food in front of the boy. Sit down and eat, Tyler. She commanded turning back to the stove. 
Charlene already left for the apple tree. Tyler shared a grin with Tosahui as he sat down, the young Comanche gobbling his food as usual. Thank you, ma'am. Any word on Vic? Not that I've heard. After breakfast, I'll look in on him. Olivia put a plate down in front of him. If I know that man, she said, her tone dry. He will insist upon forming a posse to hunt those boys and Johnson down. Nor was Olivia wrong. Upon entering Vic's sickroom at the McFadden residence, his rifle in his hand, Tyler found Vic sitting up, his mustache quivering in his annoyance. About time you got here, boy. He barked. Tyler eyed him with a lifted brow. Good morning to you, too. Vic waved his hand, impatiently. I need to deputize you so you can form a posse and go after those boys. Me? I'm a stranger here, Vic. No one is going to listen to me. They will. Maybe some of Harold's pals will help. Those Miller brats and Johnson have become a public menace and need to be brought in. Shrugging, Tyler said, All right. I'll head to the store and talk to Harold. Lift your right hand. After Victor administered a quick oath of a lawman, he then said, There's a badge in my office desk. That'll lend you some authority. First thing, go pay a visit to their ma. She may know where them kids might be hiding. Tyler nodded as McFadden came in to check on his patient. I'll let you know what we find, if anything. You do that. Vic answered, glaring at McFadden. You gonna feed me? Or do I perish of hunger right here? Grinning, Tyler walked out on the two men arguing, then strode through the rapidly rising heat to Victor's office. It felt strange to find the deputy badge in Victor's drawer and pin it to his shirt. It gleamed there, its presence a symbol of Tyler's new responsibilities, an unwelcome weight landing on his shoulders. The wild shooting of the night before and Victor's subsequent injury passed through town like a hurricane people stopping on the street to gape at him and his new badge. No few tried to ask him questions, even going so far as to address him as deputy. Sheepish and ill at ease, Tyler tried to answer their questions while still walking toward the Maples General Store. Ducking inside on a gust of relief, Tyler leaned his back against the door as though expecting a tidal wave of folks to rush it and break it down. Glancing up, he found Charlene, Harold and Mrs. Maple staring at him in a frozen tableau behind the counter. The pair of almost identical biddies, standing nearby, also gulped, their mouths open. It wasn't my idea. He said, defensively. Vic made me. Harold grinned. Why you make a mighty fine lawman, Deputy Price. Tyler rolled his eyes, then set his rifle down before he stepped forward. I'm too new to this town to be deputized. But you're supposed to help me form a posse. Oh, my, exclaimed one of the biddies. This town hasn't seen a posse in ten years. Twelve, Darla. Corrected the other. It was twelve years ago when old Sheriff Kennedy formed one to run down that pair of bank robbers. He caught them, too. Charlene's already warm smile for him broadened into a wide grin. You make a very handsome deputy, Tyler. Tyler felt his face grow hot. Why, um, thank you. He didn't miss the triumphant and significant glance Mrs. Maple threw Charlene. Harold, will you help me form the posse? I mean, you know the people in this town. Of course, if the resident slave driver has no objections. Mrs. Maple huffed. Go help the poor man, Harold and cease all your pathetic drama. Charlene and I will manage just fine without you. Oh, so you don't need me anymore. Harold feigned a pout. I get it. Chuckling, Charlene walked out from behind the counter to Tyler, gazing up at him. With the two biddies watching avidly, she rested her hand on his arm. You'll be careful, won't you? Finding in her eyes that special look she shared only with him. Tyler felt his heart flop like a landed fish in his chest. Warmth and a strange giddiness spread through him, a feeling he hadn't experienced in a long while. He wanted to hug her close to him, feel her body in his arms and kiss her soundly. 
Of course, he couldn't under the stairs, but he could, and did, run his fingers lightly down her cheek. Yes, ma'am. He murmured. Charlene's face flushed with a light pink, of pleasure, he thought, not embarrassment. Her eyes dropped from his as she burnished the badge on his chest with her sleeve. My deputy sheriff. She whispered. Come home safe. Abruptly, Charlene turned and hurried back to the counter as Mrs. Maple and the old women pretended that they hadn't been watching and spoke of the price of coffee and sugar. Harold had vanished. Tyler gazed at Charlene, knowing his heart showed clearly on his face, but could not seem to help it, or remove it into an expression of neutrality. She said for me to come home. Not to the house, but home. Finally, he cleared his throat, tearing his eyes from her with an effort. I, er. He began, then tried again. I need to pay a visit to the Miller boy's mother. Might one of you ladies direct me to her house? Of course, deputy. One of the old women replied. Go down the street toward the south three blocks, then turn right. It's the pale blue, dilapidated house at the end of the street. Thank you, ma'am. Setting his hat back on his head, he tipped it briefly before picking up his rifle. He shared a quick glance with Charlene, a mutual look of understanding and growing affection. Turning, he left the store the door's bell chiming behind him. Heading south, he strode down the wooden sidewalk. Observing Harold across the street near the bank, speaking to three men. With Harold gathering the posse, he only needed to gain some information on where the Miller kids might go to hide. He found the Miller house easily, as it fit the old woman's description perfectly. The porch steps, needing a coat of paint desperately, creaked alarmingly as he strode up them to the front door. It sagged on its hinges, swaying back and forth under his knock. Glancing around, Tyler observed shutters broken or missing from the windows and no few panes cracked. Shuffling steps approached the door, Tyler trying to make himself appear as important as he didn't feel. The door opened on a sharp creak, a thin woman with oily, stringy blonde hair to her shoulders appeared giving him a disinterested glance. Her eyes flicked to the badge on his chest. Yes? Mrs. Miller? Tyler asked, doffing his hat. I'm, er, Deputy Price. I need to speak with you about your sons. Blue Eyes regarded him with an odd lack of curiosity. What have they done now? Ma'am, they are running with Harvey Johnson, do you know him? Yeah, he's my husband's friend. Though I haven't spoken with him in years. Well, ma'am. Mr. Johnson was in jail for attempted murder, and your sons broke him out. They have been stealing horses, setting fires and shooting at Bandera civilians. One of them shot Sheriff Barker last night. Can you tell me where they might be? She shook her head. Last time I saw them was three days ago. Just up and left without a word. Tyler's gaze sharpened on her face, suspecting she had just lied to him. He usually had a good nose for deceit and wondered if the boys had been back recently. Not wanting to see them in jail, and no doubt knowing of their activities, she would most certainly lie for them. Ma'am, do you know where they might stay, or hide when they aren't here? An old cabin, maybe? Mrs. Miller offered a half shrug. When their pa was still around, he used to take them hunting along the Medina River. I don't know about any cabins, though. If your boys come back, Mrs. Miller, Tyler said, his voice more authoritative, you will let us know, right? They are in very serious trouble, and I'm sure you don't want to see them get killed. At this, her eyes widened slightly. No, I love my boys. I don't want them to get into any more trouble. If they come home, I'll tell you. Replacing his hat on his head, Tyler nodded to her. Good day. Ma'am. He heard the squeak of the door, and then it snicked shut as she closed it while Tyler walked down the weak steps. He knew she wouldn't come find him if her sons returned. And their getting hurt or killed while on this rampage had just increased tenfold. Those kids never stood a chance. He muttered as he paced back the way he had come. Stopping at the livery stable, 
he saddled his bay, then shoved his rifle into its scabbard. Mounting up, he rode back toward the mercantile store, finding five men on horseback standing outside it. Two more men rode toward them, even as Harold himself emerged from around the corner, leading a tall piebald. Harold stepped up beside Tyler as he reined in. Any luck? Nope. Tyler rested his arms on his saddle horn. I believe she's lying when she says she hasn't seen them. We may consider watching their house at night, see if we can catch them sneaking home to Mama. Good idea. Finding it odd that such a humorous and easygoing man as Harold would have a revolver strapped to his hip or tie rifle scabbard to his saddle. Tyler recalled his story of being a Confederate soldier during the war. You should be the deputy, not me. Tyler said. Nope. Harold swung easily into his saddle. Those days are behind me Tyler. I don't like being on this posse, but I dislike disruptive people shooting up the town even less. Did Mrs. Miller give any hints at all as to where they may be? She said their father often took them hunting along the Medina. Lots of places to hide there. Harold replied, reining his horse in beside Tyler's. I reckon it's a place to start. The other seven men fell into a group behind them as Tyler and Harold broke into a trot, horsemen, and wagons pulling to the side of the street to make way for them. Once again, Tyler felt the weight of stairs as people gaped and pointed, talking amongst themselves at the new deputy and the posse riding off to run the Miller boys down. Hoping to catch Johnson and these runaway boys quickly so he could go back to his life as a budding rancher. Tyler struck a canter once they hit the edge of town, riding toward the rocky hills and the wide river running through them. With Harold directing them toward a trail that game and hunters often used. Tyler and his posse struck it quickly. Forced to ride in single file along the narrow trail that ran beside the Medina, Tyler took the lead, Harold right behind him. With a deep river on one side and the thick trunks of cedar and mesquite. Spotted with prickly pear and the occasional hackberry. On the other, Tyler suspected their quarry might see them before he observed them. He watched the jagged hills above, speculating about riding up there. Harold. He said, gesturing toward the outcroppings. Think we can get up there? Harold squinted in the direction he pointed. I think so. The horses should be able to make it. Finding a thinner spot amid the thickets of trees and brush, Tyler urged his horse through. Finding the ground sloping upward. His base hooves sent loose rock sliding downhill behind him, the hill growing steeper the further he went. Soon, he leaned forward over his mount's black mane, enabling the horse to utilize his rear quarters better. After about a 15-minute climb, the rocky ground became less steep. And Tyler trotted his horse across the side of the hill, Harold and the posse following. Gazing out and down, he observed the Medina flowing through its banks, the sun glinting off its surface in slivers of silver. He could also see anything moving for miles around. See anything? He asked as the posse reined in around him. That. One of the men pointed. Following his finger, Tyler saw the northeastern horizon roiling with black clouds. Looks ominous. He commented. We need to be in town before that one hits. Harold advised. That's an ugly storm. Wait, said another man. What's down there? Where? Tyler asked. The man pointed to the right, near the river. I saw movement. See? Tyler saw them and smiled. Yes. I surely do. Riders rode along the same trail the posse had just vacated, four of them, one rather small. Back up. Tyler ordered. Get back before we're seen. Reining his horse around, Tyler trotted away from the outcropping, the river vanishing from his sight. Harold and the others circled around him, waiting to hear his plan. We have nine to their four, gentlemen. Tyler said. Four of us ride to cut them off. Now more than likely, they'll turn tail and run. That's when you other five stop them. If there's shooting, save your lives and the man beside you, not them. But those are kids. Protested one of the posse. 
Kids with guns who will kill you without hesitation. Tyler replied evenly. Hopefully, we can catch them alive, that's our goal. But every one of you returns to his family. Understood? Nods of acceptance greeted his words and mutters of yes, sir, abounded. Now, can a horse swim that river? Tyler asked. Harold snorted. Not if its rider wants to live. It's got a powerful current. Let's hope none of them think to escape that way. You four with Harold, that way. You three, with me. Trotting down the hill, too steep and rocky for cantering, Tyler led his men back the way they had come. The excitement of the chase coursed through his veins, the thrill to be on the hunt once again. Though he had left that life behind him to start over, he suspected that this, born to be a hunter, was in his blood forever. Striking the river trail, he spun his horse right, and kicked the bay into a swift lope. Yanking his rifle from its scabbard, he jacked a shell into the chamber, hearing his men behind him doing the same. Though he listened hard, he didn't hear anything save the thudding of hooves. Surely I didn't misjudge where they were and missed them completely. Around the bend came a horse at a walk, a man in the lead. He reined in, gaping, as Tyler yelled. There they are. Chapter 21 Panic leapt down Aaron's throat. A flash flood bore down on a helpless George, his foot caught between two rocks as he yelled and struggled to free it. With it charging down on them ten times faster than a galloping horse, Aaron and Elmer had mere seconds to grab their brother and drag him to safety. Leaping down the gulch's steep but short embankment, Aaron hit the rushing river that an hour ago had been a trickle and now reached his knees. Not daring to risk a glance upstream, Aaron, Elmer beside him, grabbed George by his shoulders. I can't get my leg out. He screamed, his eyes showing the white. Aaron shoved his arm under George's and pulled hard, half blinded by the thick, wind driven rain. His brother yelped in pain. Elmer, showing a little more sense than Aaron or George, grabbed hold of one of the rocks that had trapped his boot and yanked on it. Seeing what he was doing, Aaron pulled hard the instant the rock gave way a merciful inch. His foot was free. Go, go, go. Aaron yelled, dragging George by the arm. From the corner of his eye, he saw the horror bearing down on them, seconds away from slamming into himself and his brothers. A wall of brown water, foaming yellow, rushed down the gulch, tree trunks caught in its grasp. Lunging forward, a low whine of panic striking his ears every time he drew breath. Aaron hit the embankment and struggled up it. Still pulling George, Elmer shoving him from behind, Aaron lunged upward. His body bent forward for greater impetus. Snatching a fast glance behind, he saw the flood strike the spot where George had been seconds before, the water soaking Elmer's legs as he, too, hurtled his way up, ever up to safety. Even then, at the top, Aaron watched in horror as the flood continued to climb, spilling over the banks of the gulch. Running to the horses, he untied reins as fast as he could, his saturated hair covering half his face blinding him. Spooked, the horses backed away, scrambling to escape the approaching water. Elmer and George grabbed reins from Aaron, and vaulted into their saddles. Aaron had no sooner put his boot into his stirrup when his horse bolted, striking a dead run in a heartbeat. Flinging himself up and over, he landed half in and half off his saddle, clinging desperately to the saddle horn. Reaching up with his left hand, he grabbed a fistful of flying mane and hauled himself into an upright position. Though he lost his stirrups, Aaron breathed easier, risking a glance behind. The flash flood had swallowed the spot where they thought they'd be sheltered from the storm, which had almost become their death trap. Looking ahead, he found Elmer and George slowing their mounts, turning to gaze behind them. Aaron reined in his horse to a bouncing halt. Criminy. Elmer gasped, rain still lashing down, lightning lighting up the sky. Thunder cracked in Aaron's ears, but in the distance, he recognized the storm's ragged edge, blue sky behind it. That was close. George shivered and shook as though from ague, his face as white as a ghost. Another second and I'd be gone. Aaron trembled almost as badly panting for breath as though he had done the running. 
not his horse. Chilled to his bones from both the rain and reaction of what had just happened. He rubbed his arms, looking around. Storm is almost over. He said. I reckon we should just endure it. Elmer nudged his horse over to George. You all right, brother? George nodded, his teeth chattering, the sound clear even with the wind, the rain and the thunder. I... I think so. We're damn lucky we didn't lose you, George. Aaron said, shivering. Thus, the three of them, with five horses, stood amidst the pouring rain and heavy wind. The lightning and thunder passed them by, flashing in the distance, the low growls growing more and more faint. Within another fifteen minutes, the rain had also cleared off. Aaron turned his face up as the sun emerged from the roiling clouds. I never thought I'd be so happy to see that. He said, grinning a little. Taking off his dripping hat, he shook back his hair, combing it back. I'm actually starting to warm up. George dismounted from his horse, and in the mud, he dropped to one knee, hat in hand. He bowed his head. Thank you. Was all he muttered. Squelching back through the mud around his mount's hindquarters, he gazed at the gulch that had once been a raging river. Look at that. Aaron and Elmer both stared. The gulch was a gulch again, the waters receding, little evidence remained of what had been a flood that forced them to flee for their lives. I reckon that's why they call them flash floods. Elmer commented. They're and gone in a flash. With the sun now blazing down on them, Aaron warmed up quickly. But his clothes and saddle remained damp. With all the extra moisture in the air, he knew he would take a long time drying. I guess we should ride on. He said. Find a place to camp. All our food will be ruined. George said, inspecting the contents of his saddle bags. The whiskey is still good. He mounted up. Leading the way east, Aaron reflected on how close they had all come to being killed less than an hour past. Had they been slower in getting to George, he and Elmer might have survived, but right now they'd be searching for George's corpse. Had they been a few seconds longer getting him out, they'd be all dead. The Power of the Land Aaron glanced over at Elmer in surprise. Elmer smiled wryly. It ain't just bullets or the hangman's noose that can kill you. He said. A flood. A tornado. A wildfire. He pointed to the ground. A rattlesnake. We escape death every single day and never realize it. Aaron nodded slowly. I suppose that's very true. After what happened today. Elmer went on slowly. I think I'm going to give up thieving. Take what I got and buy a small farm. Aaron, we don't always get second chances like this. After we spring Benji, I'm giving up the life. I am, too, Aaron. George said. I almost died, and it weren't from getting shot. I'm alive because of a miracle that you two got to me in time. I'm done, also. Aaron nodded thoughtfully. That's your choice, boys. I'll respect it. Elmer watched him carefully. Will you give it up, too? Leave while you still can? Aaron gazed out at the eastern horizon across the inhospitable land. I'm not going to look beyond tomorrow, boys. It's one day at a time for me. Four days of hard riding brought them outside the small town of Sugar Land, Texas. They had replenished their supplies at a small trading store near the ranching town of Seguin, and thus had food, coffee, and salt in plenty. With bulging saddlebags, the brothers continued their journey east, the sun's terrible heat made Aaron wonder how he could have ever been cold that day of the flood. Camping on a hill where they could see for miles in any direction, Aaron watched the town in the distance. As the horses grazed on the lush pastures of the region, Aaron and Elmer discussed options on getting Benji out, if he was indeed in there. Aaron thought he saw the prison itself, a massive stone structure at the edge of town. They may have work gangs. Elmer said, sitting beside Aaron in the shade as George played cards behind them. We can ride in there and threaten to shoot the guards if they don't cut him loose. Aren't they chained? Aaron asked. If so, the guards may not have the keys. 
Maybe. Elmer responded slowly. Maybe not. What we need to do is get in close. Watch the prisoners let out in these chain gangs, and see if we see Benji. How can we do that without being recognized? Let me take care of that. The next day, Elmer rode off, not to the town, but back west. Aaron fretted all day, wondering what he had in mind. He didn't just ride off and leave us? He didn't want to believe that, but after the talk of quitting the life of an outlaw, he wasn't so sure. By mid-afternoon, Elmer rode back up the hill at a walk, a donkey laden with baskets on its back led by its rope. Both Aaron and George gaped as Elmer crossed his leg over his saddle horn and grinned down at them. Just what are we supposed to do with that thing? Aaron demanded, pointing at the gray donkey, getting angry. She's part of our disguise. Elmer said, leaning out of his saddle to stroke her long ears. If you don't explain yourself this minute, I'm gonna shoot you to kingdom come. Elmer laughed and slid down from his saddle. Opening his saddle bags, he pulled out colorful serapes and tossed one to Aaron. With these, a pair of big sombreros and our little friend there, will pass for a pair of poor Mexicans. How many Mexicans have red hair, dummy? Aaron snapped. Elmer pulled out a small clay jar and threw that to him as well. Black shoe polish. Turn our red hair to black. Comprende, señor? At last Aaron began to laugh. See. Thus, shortly after dawn the next morning, two Mexican peasants walked down the hill toward the town of Sugarland pulling a small donkey behind them. Wearing serapes, wide sombreros, tan trousers, and sandals, Aaron and Elmer covered their very white feet with mud and grime and added dust to their faces. Keep your eyes down. Elmer warned. Mexicans don't usually have blue eyes. In town, they found many Mexicans just like them, operating an open-air market not far from the prison. People pass them by as in any town, some smiling and nodding, others not as friendly. Several federal marshals rode or walked past the two Dawson brothers, not giving them a second glance. They sat in the shade of a large cedar, their patient donkey dozing at their side, her tail absently swishing at flies. We should have thought of this when we were robbing banks. Aaron muttered out of the side of his mouth. Blame the crime on Mexican banditos. Think cold beer was found and spilled that we were coming here? Elmer asked. There sure seems to be a lot of federal marshals here. We better plan that they are expecting us. Aaron replied, closing his eyes as though sleeping whenever someone came close. In studying the place, Aaron knew that a direct frontal assault would never work. Guards on foot and horseback surrounded the structure. It in itself was built like a fortress made of granite blocks with tall guard towers and a medieval looking gate of wrought iron and steel. No one went in or bypassed the guards. Our only hope lies in a chain gang. Elmer said, his tone grim. Otherwise, there's no getting him out of there. As much as he hated it, Aaron was forced to agree. Surely, we'd see the prisoners heading out to work by now. Unless they left before we got here. To both avoid raised eyebrows and to stretch their legs, Aaron and Elmer got up to walk around the town a little. They had brought food, kept in the donkey's straw panniers, to avoid the need to buy a meal and not pass as truly Mexican. Aaron knew very little Spanish, and Elmer only a tad more than he did. By late afternoon, they and their donkey found a fresh patch of shade with which to pass the time and watch for the chain gangs to return. That Benji would be on one Aaron had no doubt. The marshals would have made damn sure Benji suffered as much as possible during his long imprisonment. Just as Aaron was about to give up, while dusk settled over the land and Sugar Land's inhabitants headed toward their homes, families, and suppers. The rattling of chains eclipsed the evening silence. Aaron gripped Elmer's arm as a long line of men clad in black and white striped clothes strode warily toward the prison's gates. Do you see him? Aaron whispered, his heart pounding in his chest. Shh, not yet. Wishing they had taken a position closer. Aaron peered through the gloom toward the man chained hand and foot, each man attached to the one in front. 
Guards armed with rifles and mounted on horses walked to either side, watching the inmates closely. How can we free Benchy from all those others? Aaron asked, near despair. Elmer gripped his arm tight. There. He's right there. Where? Behind the tall thin one. Eager, Aaron stared hard. Was it really Benchy, their younger brother? The man Elmer pointed out walked with the same dispirited attitude as the others, his head down, his red hair, if it was red, falling tangled and filthy to his shoulders, his body slumped with exhaustion. As Aaron stared harder, he recognized the man's features. They were his own. Benji. He breathed. Chapter 22 Harvey Johnson, the town drunk and now the leader of a gang of boys, recognized Tyler at the same moment Tyler recognized him. Raising his rifle, still at a lope, Tyler yelled. Stop or I'll shoot. Johnson didn't heed his order. Wheeling his horse, he yelled at the Miller boys behind him. Ride. Run. Watching the tangle of horses as their riders tried to turn on the narrow trail, Tyler fired off a quick shot. He hoped it would make them surrender, but the Miller boys and Johnson whipped their mounts with their reins, forcing them into a dead run down the trail. Giving chase, Tyler didn't shoot again in the hopes of their surrender once they realized they were trapped. The narrow trail rounded a bend and Tyler lost sight of his quarry. He still heard the shouts, yells, and gunfire as Johnson and the boys discovered another band of men had them cut off from escape. Kicking his horse into greater speed, Tyler galloped headlong down the trail into chaos. Standing in his stirrups, the Miller boys and their horses jammed in a tight knot on the trail, Johnson fired at the approaching men led by Harold. One of the boys, the biggest, who Tyler assumed was Kevin, also fired his rifle. Reining his horse into a rearing halt, he aimed his own gun at Johnson and pulled the trigger. Yelling out, Johnson lowered his gun, blood blossoming on his shirt. But he didn't fall from his horse. Turning it, he kicked it hard, forcing the beast through the tangle of horses, and into the thick trees. A horse reared. A boyish voice cried out as one of the riders tumbled out of the saddle. Bearing down on the boys, Tyler saw Harold in the lead on the far side of them. Relieved that he did not appear hurt. Two of the Miller kids still aboard their mounts, kicked them into the trees. Following hard on Johnson's trail just as Tyler and his band reached the spot where they had been a moment before. The fallen boy's horse also bolted, chasing after its companions, leaving the winded kid on the ground. Leaping from his horse, Tyler heard crashing in the underbrush as Johnson and the other boys fled. Trotting to the kid on the ground, Tyler planted his boot on the boy's back, pinning him. His rifle barrel pressed against the back of his head. Don't move. He warned. He glanced up as Harold dismounted, the other men riding in as close as they could. Should we chase after them? Harold asked, his rifle in his hand. No. Tyler replied. Johnson's got my bullet in him, he'll go to ground somewhere. We've got that storm breathing down our necks, too. And we caught one. Unlike Ian, this boy lay quiet under Tyler's boot and gun resting against his head. His face turned away from them. Who is this? Tyler asked. Harold peered closer. Dennis. The middle boy. Well, Dennis. Tyler said cheerfully. You just turned yourself a stay in jail. My brothers will break me out. He said, not a trace of tears or fear in his voice. I don't think so. Where you're going, they'll need dynamite to get you out, even if they find you. Harold went to his saddlebags and retrieved a set of steel shackles. The county owes me for these. He said, clamping them on Dennis's hands when Tyler forced them behind his back. Unless I get them back. Taking his foot from the kid, Tyler and Harold hauled him to his feet. Defiant blue eyes glared at them under a shaggy mop of dirty blonde hair. Dennis guessed his age to be about 14 or 15. You're awful young to be riding like an outlaw, trying to kill people. And you're a damn engine lover. The boys bet back. Engines need killing, and so do you. 
Harold shook his head. This is sad. Taught only violence and hatred. I doubt he'll ever change. It's good he'll spend the rest of his life in jail. Tyler replied, dragging the boy toward his bay. Help me haul him over my saddle. The Miller boy offered no fight as Tyler and Harold hefted him face down over Tyler's saddle. In the distance, thunder rumbled, and the wind rose to make the tree branches around them lash. You lead the way to this old jail. Tyler said to Harold, swinging up to ride his horse's rump behind the kid. Fortunately, it's not far. With the rest of the posse strung out behind them, Harold and Tyler rode at a quick trot back down the trail. Finding another small path that led into the hills, this one well overgrown with bramble and mesquite. Tyler was forced to duck low over the kid and his horse's neck in order to not be swept off his bay's rump. Soon the path vanished altogether. Harold still making his way unerringly toward a narrow gap in the jagged hills. Huge black rocks all but blocking the way. Tyler rode into a shallow canyon, a sheer cliff face at the far end. Built into the cliff lay the old jail, a curve of rock in the hollowed-out precipice. Heavy steel bars set firmly within the granite. He chuckled, sliding down from his bay pulling Dennis with him. I don't think you'll be getting out of that any time soon. Dennis's skin paled when he saw it. You can't keep me in that. He tried to snap. I'm just a kid. Taking his other arm, Harold helped Tyler drag him to the cave. You'll have lots of time to sit here and reflect on your sins, boy. And remember that this is what you may be facing for the rest of your life if you don't change your ways now. Let's keep him shackled. Tyler said as they halted in front of the cage. But with his hands in front so he can eat and drink. This time, the boy tried to fight, kicking and punching, but he was no match for two adult men. His hands bound in front of him with steel, Harold and Tyler forced him inside. And swung the heavy gate shut with a resounding clang. Don't leave me here. Dennis yelled, his expression now filled with fear and anguish. One of the posse approached with a canteen and a small bundle in his hands. He gazed in at the boy, his brows furrowed in sorrow. He pushed the canteen and the bundle and threw the bars to drop on the ground. Water and some travel rations. He said. I hate seeing this, deputy. It's wrong. But I reckon it's a greater wrong to have him running loose. Tyler clapped him on the shoulder. And temporary. Once we get Johnson and his brothers, we'll bring him to town and put him in the regular jail. His mock and come visit, the man nodded, then returned to the rest of the men. Tyler peered in at the now frightened kid. We'll be back tomorrow and bring you food and water. Meanwhile, as Mr. Maple said, you might reflect on your future, son. Chapter 23 Aaron almost couldn't believe what he was seeing. They had found Benji, against all the odds. Imprisoned yes, but there still might be a way to free him from the chains that bound him. It would take patience and strategy, but Aaron knew they could pull it off. They were blood after all. We found him. Elmer's fierce voice sounded filled with grim triumph. Let's get back to George. Maybe we can spy on the gang at work, find a way to spring him. However, Aaron continued to sit where he was, watching his youngest brother, drinking in the sight of him as though he were fine wine. Until he passed through the iron gates and they clanged shut behind him. Despite his filth and his weariness, Benji looked healthy enough. Strong, even. Aaron stared at the now closed gates until Elmer nudged his arm. Come on. It's almost full dark. We'll attract attention sitting here. Agreeing, Aaron rose and followed Elmer, leading the donkey, yet cast glances over his shoulder at the closed iron gates. The gates that stood between him and his little brother. I'll free you somehow, Benji. He whispered in the dark. Somehow. Upon hearing the news, George danced a little jig of happiness. We're finally going to be a family again. I wish Franklin were here to see us free Benji. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Elmer cautioned, removing the basket panniers from the donkey and picketing her with the horses. 
seeing him and getting him out are two very different things. Aaron removed the sombrero and serape, putting his own hat on his head as he sat down by the fire. We'll have to watch the chain gangs for a few days. See if the guards have the keys, where they take Benji, how many are watching him. Elmer nodded, squatting by the fire and taking off his own disguise. Maybe taking a couple guards as hostages? He suggested. Hold guns on them, the others might cooperate fairly quickly. Maybe create chaos by setting a bunch of other prisoners loose, too. George, being a decent enough camp cook, had made biscuits and beans with bacon, doling out the food onto plates for each of them. It's been so long since I've seen Benji. He said wistfully, sitting down with his own plate. Aaron ate his food hungrily. He looked good. Strong, so at least they're feeding him right. I bet he'll have lots of stories to tell us about prison. George added. Let's not make too many plans until we bust him out. Elmer said, frowning. There are a lot of men and guns between him and us. How about you stop stealing our hope? Aaron snapped, growing angry. Right now, that's all we got. Elmer shrugged. Just being realistic. Hope won't stop a bullet. Later, as the stars came out and the sound of an owl hooting flowed over the hill, Aaron breathed deeply of the fresh prairie scents, of grass and wildflowers. His brothers slept in their bedrolls beside the dying fire, their light snores coming to him on the breeze as he sat on the edge of the knoll, gazing toward the small town. Tiny lights glittered in the distance, blinking out little by little as the residents sought their beds. Aaron imagined Benji also sleeping right then. No doubt exhausted after the long day slaving in the heat. Though deep down he knew Elmer was right, that the odds of getting Benji out were slim. He still believed they would be riding north with their youngest brother within a few days. Sleep well, Benji. He said softly in the dark. I'll be seeing you real soon. The guards set the prisoners to clearing a stretch of land with a river that ran amid it. Since the region was open grassland spotted with clusters of trees and short rolling hills, Aaron, Elmer, and George were forced to ride around the town of Sugarland and watch the chain gang from the south. That was the only cover for miles around. Unable to see which of the prisoners was his brother, clad as he was in the same black and white striped clothing, Aaron despaired. From what he could see, the inmates were shackled together in groups of five or six. They worked in a cluster and took their short breaks together, all watched over by guards. Without a pair of binoculars to see better, Aaron could only guess which one was Benji. After two days of watching, he saw no way he and his brothers could overwhelm twenty armed guards, even if they could take one or two hostage. They'd be forced to ride across open ground and be seen instantly. What about a ruse? Elmer suggested, lying on his belly in the tall grass gazing down on the work party. Draw them out somehow? We'd only get a few away from the prisoners. Aaron replied. The others won't leave. If we can get in there, we can shoot Benji's chains. But how do we get the guards away from him long enough to ride in there? How about a fire? George asked. Won't the guards have to go put it out? Elmer nodded thoughtfully. A distraction might work. Explosives might work better. One of us should throw dynamite near them, they'll ride in to save the prisoners, and catch us. Might work if we can get our hands on some. Still, Aaron added. We need to know where Benji is. Won't do us any good if we throw it into his location and draw all the guards down on him. I think that's him over there. Elmer pointed to a group of men cutting down trees by the river. I see only a few fellows with red hair among the inmates, and he's about the right size as Benji is. Aaron peered closer. That group was there yesterday cutting trees. So, Elmer went on. If we create a disturbance on the far side over there, the guards ride that way, leaving Benji's group by themselves. They can't go anywhere, they're chained. We ride in, grab him, and then run like hell. The guards can chase us very far, as they have to mind their charges. Hope filled Aaron. 
if we free several others, they'll be forced to run them down as well, leaving fewer to come after us. Exactly. Elmer grinned. After the town goes to sleep tonight, we go in and steal a couple of boxes of dynamite from the hardware store. We'll have to get him out first thing in the morning then. Aaron added, watching the inmates chop at the trees with axes. Before word gets out that it's missing. The prison would be warned immediately. Let's go back to camp, then. Elmer suggested. We are going to be very busy. Not long after midnight, Aaron led the way through side streets and alleys in the town of Sugarland, their horses' hooves muffled on the packed dirt. The noise of their saddle leather creaking never sounded louder in the night's silence as the three of them rode to the rear of the hardware store. It lay near the center of town across the street from the bank and several streets up from the prison. Leaving George to mind the horses and look out for trouble, Aaron and Elmer dismounted at the back entrance. Of course, the door was locked. Pulling his knife from its sheath, Elmer set its tip into the lock and worked it around until the spring popped open. Slowly, so as to not let the hinges squeal, Aaron and Elmer slipped in like ghosts. Finding a lantern, Aaron lit it, but kept the flame down low, barely enough to illuminate their immediate area. Without the need for words, the two of them searched the storage room for the boxes of dynamite most hardware stores kept in stock. Many farmers and ranchers used it to blow stumps from the ground when clearing land. No doubt the prisoners would also use it in their labors. At last, Elmer pulled a wooden box from a shelf. Got it. He muttered. Let's take as much as we can and leave the box there. They might not notice it's gone for a while. Stuffing their pockets with the long pieces of explosives, Aaron found the fuses in the box, and also stuffed that into an inner pocket of his coat. Elmer returned the box to the shelf, and Aaron blew out the lantern. Closing the door softly behind them, the two filled their saddlebags with the dynamite, then remounted. Their departure from town seemed to go as unobserved as their entrance. Rather than return to their hill once they left the town behind, they headed toward the river in the area the chain gangs would be working later that morning. Watering their mounts, they loosened cinches but kept the saddles on, and made a dry camp in a small grove of trees. Aaron munched on a strip of dried beef as Elmer and George caught a little sleep in the grass. Up shortly before the dawn, Aaron and his brothers tightened cinches while eating cold fare and led the horses to water. This is it, boys. Aaron said, gazing out over the slowly lightening landscape. Today, we get Benji back. George grinned. I can't wait to see him. He's going to be plenty sad to find out about Franklin. Elmer said, standing beside Aaron. They were close. Thinking of his brother's ghost who still haunted him, both waking and sleeping, Aaron replied. If Franklin can see us now, he'll be cheering us on. As Elmer had the best arm, he was given the dynamite and one of Aaron's thin cigars to light the fuses with. You throw from the cover of those trees there. Aaron said, pointing. It's close by the river, and you have a good view of what's going on. When you see us ride in, then you get out of there and join us. It won't take them long to figure out where you're throwing from, so create a lot of confusion, then spur hard. You got it, Aaron. Aaron clasped Elmer's hand. Good luck, brother. You, too. I'll see you soon. His gut clenched with nervousness, Aaron mounted his horse. With George, both of them leading a spare mount. He trotted along the river toward a spot not far from the area where Benji had been set to work. Let's hope they don't change up where they have him at the last minute. That would certainly throw a cog into their works if they create absolute chaos and ride in only to find Benji wasn't there. Finding some cover amid a grove of hackberry and mesquite trees, Aaron mentally bit his nails as he waited for the chain gang to arrive. There was so much that could go wrong with this plan. Benji not being where he was supposed to be was the least of them. If they failed at freeing Benji this time, there would never be a second chance. Dust rose in a cloud as men and horses made their slow way toward the river in the work area. Aaron sucked in his breath, waiting, his gut roiling in anticipation and gnawing worry. Follow me. 
he said to George in a low voice, even though the men were still too far away to hear them. Shoot the chains between each man, shoot at any guards who come running. I know what to do, Aaron. George replied, his voice annoyed. I ain't dumb. I know. I'm telling myself as much as you. Within thirty minutes or so, the labor gangs were spread out to their various tasks, the guards already seeking the shade trees though it was barely an hour after dawn. From this position, Aaron easily saw the redhead assigned to chop trees down again. There was no doubt any longer. It was Benji. There he is. George whispered, excited. Oh, Benji, I can't wait to talk to you again. Shush, Aaron muttered. Any minute now. Willing himself to focus and be patient, Aaron waited for the explosions to start. Long moments later, they did. The dynamite blasted amid the trees, detonating like thunder, mesquite trunks splitting wide, dirt and water exploding high. More explosions rocked the river, water fountaining, as Elmer threw stick after stick into the mass of men and horses. Guards shouted orders as inmates yelled, panicking, trying to run in all directions. Chained together as they were, they had no place to run to, no way to hide as dirt, parts of trees and water rained down on them. Horses reared, some bolting in terror as more sticks blew up in their faces. Leaving their charges, the guards surrounding Benji spurred their mounts toward the chaos. Now! Aaron yelled. Brandishing his rifle, he and George burst from the cover of the trees, galloping hard toward the Jane men. He socked it to his shoulder and fired around at a mounted man who sat in his saddle, gaping in shock. The guard tumbled from his saddle, his gun falling to the ground with him. Reining in amidst the panicking prisoners, Aaron met Benji's eyes. Aaron? Benji yelled in shock and awe. Aaron. Not taking the time to reply, Aaron aimed his rifle at the chain between Benji and the man beside him, shattering it. George alternated firing at chains, breaking them, and at the prison guards who now saw them. And charged back to stop them. Aaron shot the other chain holding his brother to the next fellow. Mount up, he ordered. We ride now. As the freed prisoners ran in all directions as fast as their flopping chains would allow, Benji swung up onto Franklin's horse. Aaron had time to notice that the explosion stopped and caught a quick glimpse of Elmer riding at a dead run toward them pursued by several mounted guards. Go, go, go. Aaron screamed. Benji lashed his reins over his horse's rump, whooping and yelling with joy, his chains rattling down from both his shackled feet. Elmer caught up to them quickly, hollering. Ride hard, they're coming. Benji, damn glad to see you. Galloping toward the hills to the north, Aaron flashed a quick glance over his shoulder, seeing their pursuers close behind. The guards had raised their rifles to their shoulders, firing even at a dead gallop, the bullets striking the ground all around their running horses. Aaron bent low over his horse's neck to create a smaller target. Riding beside him, Benji laughed in exultation, the wind from their speed whipping his tangled hair behind him. I can't believe you did it. You got me free, you got me. Aaron clearly heard the sound of lead striking flesh. Benji's mouth went slack his eyes widened in shock. No, no, no. Aaron cried out, seeing his youngest brother swaying in his saddle. Benji. He reached to grab Benji, to hold him upright in his saddle. But the distance between their two horses was too great. Elmer, too, tried to grab him, George whipping his horse into greater speed to try to catch him. Benji's eyes rolled back in his head. He toppled from his saddle. No. Aaron screamed, reining his horse to a rearing halt, Benji's horse, its saddle empty, and those of his brothers galloping on. He stared at the still figure of Benji lying in the grass, blood bright against the back of his black and white shirt. No. The ground around his horse's hooves burst up as rifle fire exploded around him. Aaron might have sat there until the prison guards shot him down if Elmer hadn't reined around, galloped back and forced Aaron's horse to turn. He's dead. Elmer screamed in his ear. Ride, or we're dead, too. 
hardly aware of his horse galloping with Elmer's errand sat stunned and shaken. Benji dead. Benji was dead. He risked a look over his shoulder, saw the mounted men had stopped at the spot where Benji lay, his body hidden by the tall grass. He's dead. Yeah. Elmer choked as they caught up to George. He's gone. Riding hard for the north, Aaron's throat closed up, choking him. Both Elmer and George wept as they rode, not bothering to wipe their tears from their sleeves. But there were no tears in Aaron. Instead, a rage grew within his grief, a burning fire that only one thing could quench. Tyler Price's Death Chapter 24 Poppy? Tyler asked, gazing at Harold in confusion. The flower? When harvested at the right time, Harold said, the herbs from it can cause anything from pain relief to death. The middle ground is sleepiness. If we add it to water, and bread, leave it in the cell, they'll eventually eat and drink. Once they get too drowsy and unable to think straight or understand what we're doing, you can walk right in and pluck the guns right from their fingers. And you know how much to dose them? Charlene asked. We don't want to kill them. I'll consult with McFadden. Harold said, heading to the back room to fetch his hat. I have Poppy here as I sell it every now and again, mostly to McFadden so he can create his laudanum. After he left the store, Tyler put his own hat on his head. I need to round up a few men to help. Count on me. Josiah said from his spot in the corner. Charlene had almost forgotten he was there and spun in surprise. Do you know who else might volunteer? Josiah smiled gently. Just ask. Everyone in town wants their peace and quiet back, don't want these boys coming back to shoot the place up. Since you know them, Mr. Jones. Tyler ventured. Would you mind finding about five men for me? Between me, you, Harold and five others, that should be enough to capture them. Please, call me Josiah. The blacksmith stood. Yes, I'll be happy to. If you'll stay here to guard the lady here, I'll do it right now. Had them join me here just after dark. Tyler said. They attack Victor near dawn to free Johnson, but that doesn't mean they'll stick to the same plan. Josiah offered him a half salute, then strode to the door. I will. Charlene gazed up at Tyler. I want to come, too. Now wait a minute. Tyler said, his tone sharp. That's no place for you. I won't risk your safety. But you'll risk yours. She replied evenly. He frowned. Please don't argue with me. Stay home and look after your mother in Tosahui. They'll be looked after. I want to make sure you don't get hurt. Just what will you do to stop that from happening? Jump between me and a bullet? If I have to. She watched his expression soften into a smile. A happy shiver ran through her as Tyler traced his finger lightly down her cheek, his smoky eyes warm tender. You are something. He murmured. So brave and loyal and true. Catching his fingers in her hand, she squeezed it. Promise me you'll be careful. That I promise fully, sweet lady. Bending. He pressed a light kiss to her lips, sending a thrill through her, a delighted tingle that spread from her face to her neck and then coursed down her body. I think I am falling in love with him. Yes, I'm sure of it. When Tyler pulled away from her mouth, her fingers still laced through his. Charlene craved more, needed to taste him, to feel his breath on her cheek. But when his eyes shifted briefly to the side, Charlene knew that they were being watched. No doubt Jean observed the entire moment from her spot behind the counter. Blushing faintly, Charlene stepped back from Tyler a pace and refused to glance over at Jean. You think this plan could work? She asked him in a low voice. Tyler stared out the big front window for a time, then shook his head. I can't say, Charlene. These boys seem fanatically loyal to one another. I don't see them letting one sit in a jail cell while the others roam free. 
They risked killing me and Vic to get the younger boy from us. Charlene squeezed his hand. It's so hard to believe such violence has come to our town. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Aware of Jean's eyes on them, even if with approval, Charlene released her grip from Tyler's. I should get back to work. Tyler nodded, offering her a quick smile. I'll just be over here. As he sat down on the stool Josiah had vacated, Charlene opened the glass cases to rearrange the items inside for maximum attractiveness. Then headed, still not glancing at Jean, for the storeroom. With the Miller boys and Johnson on the loose, men in Bandera had been purchasing ammunition in greater quantities. Restocking the cases, Charlene tried not to think of the incredible danger Tyler would place himself in later that evening. I don't care if he wants me there or not, I will be. Her feelings for Tyler had grown tremendously over the last few days. Tumbling her, head over heels toward full-blown love. That he returned those feelings, she had no doubt. She saw his own growing love for her in his eyes. The bell chimed overhead, making her glance up from her work. Jean no longer stood behind the counter, thus it would be up to Charlene to wait on the customers. With a smile, she turned toward the door. Can I help you? She asked. Two young ladies had entered, but they didn't acknowledge her greeting or even appear aware that she existed at all. She knew them both. One was Marcia Taylor and the other was Nancy Hepworth, both of whom were close to Charlene in age. And they were also the pair who had glared their jealousy at her in church. Her own resentment rose as they made a beeline to Tyler, who watched them come toward him with no little alarm. Mr. Price Marcia cooed, stepping as close to him as was socially acceptable. How nice to see you again. Before Tyler could answer, Nancy planted herself in front of him blocking Charlene's view of his face. Mr. Price, I'm Nancy Hepworth, it's such an honor to meet you. Schooling her face to hide her growing anger at their behavior. They're all but throwing themselves at him, the hussies. Charlene stood behind the counter, waiting. She could hardly call them out for their interest in Tyler, as they were potential customers. And Jean would not be happy if she lost a sale because of her annoyance. Nancy, Marcia. She called, her voice pleasant. Did you come by to look at the new cloth we just received? It's a lovely color, would go well with your hair, Marcia. Again, neither woman turned toward her. She heard Tyler say. A pleasure to meet you, as well, miss. We heard you're the new town deputy. Marcia gushed. And single-handedly caught the Miller boy. No. I had plenty of help in catching him, miss. Charlene noticed they all but had Tyler pinned into the corner, wondering what she could do to extricate him from the situation. When Nancy shifted slightly, Charlene caught a fleeting glimpse of his expression. Amusement mixed with annoyance and a trace of embarrassment had creased his features. Charlene felt Jean arrive beside her and found Jean, also, watching the scenario unfold before them. Jean gave her a tiny smile and a look that said, let him handle it. Her anger loosening, Charlene decided to do just that. Taking a deep breath, she relaxed and watched. You make a mighty fine deputy. Marcia went on, her smile, what Charlene could see of it, adoring. Some of us in town are planning a barn dance, Mr. Price. Nancy said. We'd really like it if you'd attend. Maybe ask us to dance? Well, I'm not so sure about that, miss. Tyler said, a drawl in his voice. I wouldn't want to offend my lady by dancing with others. I am a gentleman. Your lady? Marcia spun around to glare at Charlene. Are you stepping out with her, Mr. Price? Now I don't recollect that whom I am paying calls on is any of your business, miss. Tyler said, his tone pleasant. I don't get into anyone's business, and I expect the same courtesy from you all. Charlene smothered her grin and choked back her snicker, earning for herself a stern glance from Jean. Both Marcia and Nancy stared at Charlene, affronted, as though they knew perfectly well that she hid her amusement. Doing her best to return a wide-eyed, I have no idea what he is talking about look. 
she merely waited, letting them stare at her without reacting. Are you here to purchase anything in particular, ladies? Jean politely inquired. I'm sure Charlene will be happy to show you whatever you are looking for. Marcia's glare faltered and Nancy glanced at the floor. Hesitating, Marcia, at last, strode to the counter, Nancy at her heels. Yes. She began, tentatively. I wanted to know if you had any bolts of pink cloth. As Charlene pulled down the bolts to show her, Jean returned to the back room. Knowing perfectly well Marcia had no intention of buying, Charlene flicked her glance to Tyler past the other women's shoulders. He met her eyes and shook his head faintly with a wry grin. No, that's not what I had in mind. Marcia announced after a look that lasted less than an instant. Turning abruptly, she marched across the floor, Nancy tagging behind her like a faithful hound. Neither of them looked at Tyler as they departed, all but slamming the door behind them. That was rude. Charlene commented, watching them storm down the walk through the window. People are people, Tyler replied. A moment later, Harold entered, staring in the direction that Marcia and Nancy had gone. What got into them? He asked. Charlene chuckled. Their own foolishness. What did you find out? How much poppy to use to get them drowsy? He answered. Where's my lovely wife? In here. Jean called from the back. I'll take over. Harold said, heading in her direction. If you would bake some bread with a poppy in it. We'll need it within a few hours, so hustle, woman. I don't recall hearing a please. Please, woman. Charlene shared a grin with Tyler at Jean's pained sigh. Oh, very well. Jean replied, emerging from the back. Give me what I need to add to it, Harold. I should check on the boys, anyway. Both Harold and Jean vanished into the storage room, their murmured voices floating back to Charlene's ears. More customers arrived to purchase supplies of flour, sugar, coffee, salt, ammunition, and other goods. Charlene was kept busy, Harold with her, until closing time. Just as the last one left and she breathed a sigh, walking to the door to lock it, Josiah returned with news. I found five men willing to help out tonight, Tyler. He said. They'll be here an hour after dark. That's great. Tyler replied, standing. I'll have the store open for them. Harold added. We'll meet here and finish our plans. I thought you'd sit this one out, Harold. Tyler said. Not on your life. Harold snorted. I'm seeing this through to the end. Now you two go on and get your supper. You, too, Josiah, as you're coming along tonight. I want to check on Vic first. Charlene went to the back room to fetch her bonnet. Fix him his meal. That's mighty nice of you, Charlene. Harold said as she returned. Then you go home and stay with your mother until we catch these boys. Not wanting either Tyler or Harold to suspect she planned to go regardless of what they wanted. She lowered her eyes and didn't answer as she and Tyler left the store. The humidity had risen since the storm, making perspiration burst from her pores as she strolled down the walk with Tyler at her side. Though he didn't speak, she suspected he knew what she had in her mind. Vic sat in an armchair as they entered his small house, his injured leg propped up on a cushioned stool. Lines of pain ran down from his eyes and his mouth, but he raised a slight grin upon seeing them. You pair are a fine sight to see. He commented. Charlene gave him a quick embrace. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm all right, young miss. He replied. Just catching up on my wool gathering. Haven't had much time for that lately. I'm going to fix you something to eat. Charlene told him, striding to the small kitchen as Tyler sat down. Half listening as Tyler outlined their plans to trap the young Millers, Kevin, and Ian, Charlene found not quite stale bread, leftover bacon that was still good, fresh beans and a hard sausage. Filling a plate, 
she took it in a mug of water from the hand pump at the sink back into Vic. Thank you kindly Charlene. Vic said, accepting it. I just haven't had the energy to get up and scavenge up some food for myself. Now you won't have to. I expect Tyler told you of his idea? Victor nodded, taking a bite of bread and bacon. I can't find too many flaws except him possibly getting shot at. No plan can be perfect. Tyler said with a shrug. I'll make a dummy from straw and shirt, add some hair from a white horse tail. We need something to actually draw them into the cell itself. Like Dennis is sleeping and they go in to wake him up? Charlene asked. Tyler nodded. Exactly. Just leave yourself an escape route in case they get to shooting. Victor warned. I don't need my new deputy shot on his first day on the job. He doesn't need to get himself shot at all. Charlene replied sharply. Vic, we need to go. Will you be all right? I've been looking after myself for almost 60 years, little girl. He groused with a small grin. Get out of here. I'll be by later to let you know how it goes. Tyler said, resting his hand on Victor's shoulder. Take care. You stay healthy, boy, you hear? I will. Quit worrying. Despite Tyler's optimistic tone, Charlene worried plenty. Unable to halt her nervous anxiety. She ate what little food she could choke down at supper with Olivia, Tyler, and Tosahui, watching the sun settle over the west with dread. Once told of the plans, Olivia, too, cautioned Tyler to be careful. Biting her lip with apprehension. Tyler eyed them both with amusement. You two can stop fussing, please. It'll be all right, you'll see. That was hardly enough to reassure either of them, and when Tyler picked up his rifle an hour after the sun had set, Charlene felt her anxiety rise. He paused at the door to send her a reassuring wink and a smile, then left the small house. Striding to the window, she watched him vanish into the dark. Charlene. Her mother said, her tone alarmed. What are you doing? I'm going, mother. She replied, waiting until Tyler had gotten a clear head start. Please don't try to stop me. Let the men handle it. You have no reason to go. Charlene gazed long at her mother. I have every reason to go. Waiting until the current house guard left the porch to patrol around the home, Charlene slipped out and hurried down the steps and out of the yard. Her skirts in her hands so she wouldn't trip over the hem. She strode as silently as possible down the sidewalk toward the store. She saw no one save a few locals headed toward the saloon. Suspecting Tyler and the other men would finalize their plans in the back room where no lights might be seen from the street. She stood in the deep darkness in the alley, watching the rear entrance to the apple tree. Within minutes, she saw Tyler stride toward her. And she caught her breath, thinking he would make her return to the house. But he didn't seem to know she was there and went through the back door. A light showed briefly, illuminating him, then was quenched when the doorway closed behind him. Soon, Josiah also walked down the alley and went in. As did several others. Trying to still her fidgets and her nerves, Charlene waited for them to come out. About thirty agonizing minutes later, they did. Josiah and Harold left together and headed down the alley away from her to disappear into the night. The other men followed after, each taking a different route, one tall man passing within a few feet of her still body without seeing her. She held her breath until he passed, then waited for Tyler to emerge. He did, and walked toward the main street, no doubt letting himself be seen to any watching eyes that he headed to the jail to look after his prisoner. Keeping to the shadows, Charlene followed him, her heart in her throat. She stepped softly, creeping like a ghost clinging to the side of the building where no light showed. Peering around the corner, she observed Tyler striding casually down the middle of the street. The occasional light shining on him, marking him clearly. Knowing she might be seen in the light herself, Charlene returned to the alley and hiked her skirts to run as swiftly and silently as she could. She caught glimpses of Tyler in the street. And always waited until he was past her before making her way across the next side lane. So far. He didn't seem to know she was there, 
but she had no idea where Harold and the other men had hidden themselves. And who might spot her? Without a hue and cry raised, she hurried on to the alley between the jail and Victor's house just as Tyler entered the front door of the sheriff's office. Hiding in the shadows again, Charlene gazed around at what she could see of the quiet street. The hot night was still and silent, and not even a dog barked. Catching her breath, she leaned her back against the wall of the building. Here we go, this is really happening. Chapter 25 we're riding back to El Paso. Aaron's announcement, the second day after Benji's death, brought no comments from either Elmer or George. They camped that night northwest of Sugar Land, staring into the flames as the sun descended over the western horizon. During those long days of riding, their grief over the loss of the youngest Dawson brother was too great for words. Why El Paso? Elmer finally asked, poking the fire with a stick. I want out of this line of work, Aaron. It's become too much. Why? Aaron stared at him over the flames. To find Price. He's to blame for Benji getting put into prison, now dead. We're going to find him and tear him into little bounty hunter pieces. He had permitted Elmer to talk him out of his vengeance once before, persuaded him that getting Benji out was all that mattered. Since Benji had died, Aaron's burning rage had increased rather than diffused over time. No rock or tree would hide Tyler Price from Aaron's revenge. Not anymore. Price would die, even if it took Aaron years to hunt him down. Will that bring Benji back? Elmer asked, not looking at Aaron. We find Price and kill him, then what? Then we retire. Aaron replied. Give up the life. Find a place where we're not known, live out the rest of our days as ordinary people. Price has to die, Elmer. You know it. Do I? He asked softly. I'm not so sure about anything anymore. I am. Aaron said, his voice harsh, his rage bubbling just beneath the surface. If I am sure of nothing else, I am of this. We deserve our vengeance. Glancing from Elmer to George, Aaron found him staring not at the fire, but into the darkness, his head tilted to the side as though listening to something that only he could hear. George? Aaron asked. You with me? Slowly, George turned his head to look at him, his eyes shadowed by the light cast by the firelight. Yeah. He finally said, his voice devoid of all emotion. I'm with you. Then tomorrow we ride west. Aaron went on, feeling a faint chill at the deadness in George's voice and eyes. We need cash. On our way to San Antonio, we robbed a few banks, using the Mexican disguises. George merely nodded, turning his gaze back into the darkness, Elmer saying not a word. That, too disturbed Aaron more than a little, for Elmer always spoke his mind, never held his opinions back. Hope he ain't planning to ride off and leave us to start a new life as he says he wants to do. He studied his brother as closely as he could, observing the same deadness around him that George had. As though neither one of his brothers cared about anything anymore. Riding straight west again, they headed toward the rocky hills, dark with distance, that marked the San Antonio region. Passing ranches with grazing herds of longhorn cattle, George's rifle brought down a weanling calf. After roasting a haunch that evening, they spent the next few days curing much of the meat over a slow fire. Here's what we're gonna do. Aaron said as they sat their horses outside the small town of Gonzales late in the afternoon. We make camp in those trees yonder. Early tomorrow, Elmer and I go into town dressed as Mexicans. We wait till the bank opens, rob it, then head south. Once out of sight, we strip out of the sombreros. Then circle around and come back here. You ain't riding in Mexican saddles. George said, his voice still emotionless. That might be noticed, Aaron. Elmer added. And it might not be. Aaron replied, testily. Look, we have to get money. We stay out of sight as much as possible, hide our horses around the back of the bank. Then we ride out fast, and all people see are our backs. All right. 
Elmer said, turning his horse toward the grove of trees, his tone almost as dead as George's. Shortly after dawn, Aaron and Elmer rode toward Gonzales, leaving George to wait for them with the spare horses. Wearing their sombreros and serapes, dirt on their faces and hands, they once more appeared as Mexican. Once striking the main street of the town, Aaron almost continued on down, for very few people occupied it. Before they turned down a side lane, Aaron counted three people and a single horse tied to a rail. The bank may not have much of anything in it. He muttered sourly. Riding through the back alleys, Aaron kept a watchful eye out for the local lawman and spotted only a tiny office that had the sign sheriff over it. Like everything else in this town, it looked dead and empty. Very few people conducted their business, wandered into shops, or drove wagons to the general store. This town is hardly alive. Elmer commented. Does it even have a bank? Aaron reined in, his brother halting beside him. It's right there. He pointed down the alley. The bank stood on the corner of the main avenue of the town in a side street. He saw no movement within it, no one coming or going, and a single cowboy walked past it. Let's cross over the street a few blocks down, then come up behind it. Aaron said. Made uneasy by the sheer lack of humanity in this town, Aaron speculated about the reason they saw so few people. Maybe the heat has them inside. He muttered. That'll make it easier on us. Elmer agreed. It's hotter than an overloaded stove out here. Leaving the horses behind the bank building, Aaron and Elmer, their heads down, ambled lazily from around the corner to lounge for a moment. Looking around, Aaron found no one in the general vicinity much less anyone paying any heed to them. This is almost spooky. He muttered. Let's get this done with an out. Opening the door to the bank, they walked in, pulling their revolvers from their holsters. The teller behind his window raised his hands instantly, his eyes widened with fear. A single customer stood in front of him, a man with a cowboy hat on his head and a gun at his hip. The man started to turn, his hand pulling his gun from its holster at the same time. Aaron acted without thought. Raising the butt of his gun, Aaron brought the butt of it down on the back of the man's head before he completed his turn. He collapsed, rolling onto his back, his face twisted in pain. The star on his vest made Aaron gape. The local sheriff. Not unconscious, the sheriff tried to still yank his gun from its holster but Elmer quickly kicked it out of his hand. Neither of them dared speak, for their accents would give them away as white men, not Mexicans. Reaching down, Aaron seized him by his collar and dragged him up, the muzzle of his gun pointed at the sheriff's face. The man raised his hands in surrender. Just don't kill anyone. He gasped, his face turned away from Aaron's under the pressure of the gun pressed against his temple. Aaron didn't answer his eyes on the frightened teller. Elmer threw open the door that led to the back of the bank, seizing hold of the man's arm. Don't kill me. The man begged. I'll do anything, just don't kill me. Grabbing a sack, he gestured for the employee to fill it from the drawer. The trembling fellow obeyed him, then was forced by Elmer to the safe. Aaron dragged the sheriff back there as well wondering what he was going to do to make sure the lawman wasn't on their tail the moment they rode out of town with their loot. If he shot the man, the sound would bring the town down upon them. The manager rose from his desk, his plump cheeks pale, sweat running in rivers down his face. Elmer jerked his revolver toward the safe, indicating he was to open it. Doing as he was told, the manager spun the dial, then opened the safe. Aaron almost gawked in shock. Elmer stared from the safe to Aaron and back again. Stacks of cash and bundles, as well as gold bars, sat upon the shelves. A cuss word rose to Aaron's lips and hung there, almost emerging before he managed to swallow it. He gestured with the barrel of his gun, then set it against the sheriff's head again. Kneeling, the teller stuffed the cash and the gold into a sack and handed it to Elmer with hands that shook. Glancing around, Aaron knew they needed to write in fast right then if they were to escape with all those riches. But how to keep the sheriff quiet without killing him? Pulling his gun back, 
he reversed it and cracked the sheriff just behind the ear with the butt. The sheriff went down, his eyes rolling back in his head, and sagged immediately to the floor. With gestures, Elmer got the other two to sit down, then Aaron and he backed through the bank, keeping their guns trained on the pair of employees. Once back in the front portion, Aaron and Elmer spun around, bolting through the front door with their prize. Triumph sang through Aaron's veins as he and Elmer ran around the corner to their horses, putting their revolvers back into their holsters. We are rich. We'll never have to steal again. Elmer shoved the thick sack into his saddlebag as Aaron vaulted aboard his horse. Leading the way down the alley as Elmer swiftly mounted his horse behind him, Aaron kicked his mount into a gallop. We did it. Aaron said, half turning in his saddle toward Elmer. He froze. At the bank's rear door, the manager raised a gun in their direction and fired off several shots. Aaron ducked instinctively, making himself as small a target as possible. At his mount's tail, Aaron heard a sharp grunt from Elmer, saw his brother's eyes widen in shock. Just as Benji's did before he fell from his horse. Elmer? Aaron choked out, panic filling him. I'm hit. Elmer gasped, squeezing his eyes closed. My shoulder. Needing to get them both out of town as fast as possible, Aaron galloped down side streets and alleys, keeping buildings between their bodies and any others who may want to shoot them down. From the main street, Aaron heard shouts and yells as the gunfire drew attention from the citizens. Still, he saw no one as they cleared the town limits, and turned toward the south. Only when Gonzalez vanished from their sight did Aaron slow both horses. Elmer slumped over his saddle horn, a hole torn in the serape over his right shoulder blade. He was conscious, his eyes squeezed shut in pain. We need to stop for a minute. He told Aaron, his voice hoarse. Spotting a thicket of mesquite and prickly pear, Aaron stopped within its shelter and yanked off his sombrero and serape. Leaning out of his saddle, he lifted Elmer's from his back, examining the bloody wound in his shoulder blade. Did it go straight through? Aaron asked. Elmer nodded weakly. Yeah. I'm bleeding from the front, also. We need to get back to George. Aaron told him. We can get you fixed up a bit, but then we have to ride. Think you can? Have to. Hiding his disguise and Elmer's hat in their saddlebags, Aaron led the way back east a few miles before turning north again. A hot brisk wind over the landscape helped hide their tracks, and Aaron watched for any signs of pursuit from the local Gonzales townspeople. Hopefully, he speculated, any posse would be delayed with the sheriff temporarily out of action. George stood up from his never-ending card playing as Aaron and Elmer galloped toward him. Is Elmer hurt? He called out. Yeah. Aaron trotted his horse into the shade, Elmer following without much guidance then dismounted. Elmer cried out in pain as he and George pulled him from his saddle and sat him carefully on the ground. Get the whiskey, George. Removing the serape from Elmer, he cut his shirt away with his knife, exposing both bloody wounds, one on each side of his shoulder. Washing blood away with water from his canteen, Aaron examined them closely. Not too bad. He muttered. Clean in and out. It's not really bleeding anymore. George returned with the whiskey, holding Elmer steady as Aaron cleansed the holes with the alcohol, Elmer trying not to yell out and not succeeding. You'll be fine. Aaron muttered. You'll heal quick. Tearing a shirt into bandages, Aaron wrapped Elmer's shoulder, then manufactured a sling for him to rest his arm in, tying the knot behind Elmer's neck. Elmer blew out a gust of breath in relief as his arm hung nearly immobile. That's better. He breathed. Putting the serape back over his brother's torso, Aaron handed him his hat. We ride north again to skirt the town. He said, leading Elmer's horse to a tall rock. If we aren't being chased, we'll ride in easy stages as we go west. With George's help, Elmer climbed atop the rock, then mounted his horse. Sounds good. He replied, sweat running down the side of his head. Riding out again at an easy lope, 
Aaron told George about the huge amount of cash and the gold taken from the bank. Where once George would have greeted the news with excitement, he merely nodded, his eyes on Elmer riding beside him. That's good. Puzzled, Aaron added. We are rich. We may never have to rob a bank again. Once we kill Price, we have enough to make new lives that don't involve stealing. George seemed not to hear him. Falling back into silence, Aaron led the way west, toward the distant hills, keeping watch for a pursuit that never materialized. Not bothering to wonder if it was the disguises that worked, or his disabling the sheriff, Aaron didn't care. They now had miles between them and the town, their trail obliterated by the wind. They'll never find us now. As the miles and hours passed, Elmer's skin turned a pasty white shade, his eyes closed, and his head bobbed loosely on his neck. Aaron grew more alarmed over the state of his health but dared not stop. Not until the cover of night could conceal them. Sunset lay a few hours ahead. Aaron. George said at last. We have to stop. He ain't looking so good. Yeah. Elmer muttered, his voice barely perceptible. I can't go on. Must rest. Reining in, Aaron gazed at his brothers helplessly. This is too open. We have to find cover before we stop. We need water, too. George rested his hand on Elmer's brow. He's burning up, and it ain't from the heat. Gazing helplessly around at the barren land they rode through, Aaron tried to spot anything that might conceal them as they let Elmer rest. Let's ride a little further. He said at last. We might find somewhere we can hole up for a day or two. Elmer managed a weak grin. Let's go. It took them until near sunset to find it. Beneath a line of short hills grew a dense cluster of willow, a heavy stream running under their branches. Under their concealing shade, a rider would have to be right on top of them to discover their presence. Aaron dismounted with relief as the shade was at least ten degrees cooler than the sun outside. He and George helped Elmer down from his saddle, Aaron holding him up while George untied his bedroll from the cantle and spread it on the ground. Elmer breathed his own sigh as he lay down on it, his eyes closed. George squatted beside him for a moment, brushing Elmer's hair back from his face. You're gonna be all right. He murmured. Aaron and George unsaddled and watered the horses, then picketed them where they could graze. Elmer seemed to be asleep as they set up camp, building a small fire, George concocting a soup from dried meat, some wild onions and a few old carrots. A breeze pushing through the shade, making the willow branches shake, cooled Aaron considerably. Taking a moment to gaze down at Elmer, Aaron said, I'm gonna take a quick look around. Make sure no one's sneaking up on us. George merely nodded, stirring the soup in his small cast iron pot. Returning into the sunlight, even if it was fading, was like walking into an oven. Aaron walked up the hill, frightening a jackrabbit into panicked flight. At the top, he stood high enough over the land to see quite far but found nothing alarming. A herd of cattle grazed in the distance, as did a small cluster of deer. A hawk screamed from above him into the south, a flock of buzzards circled over something dead or dying. Satisfied that he and his brothers were in no immediate danger, Aaron returned to their camp under the willows. George knelt beside Elmer as Aaron strode toward him, his hand on Elmer's forehead, his expression a mask of anxiety. Aaron, George said, frantic. I can't wake him up. Chapter 26 Setting the lantern's flame down low, Tyler ordered himself not to go to the door to look outside. Whether Johnson was with him or not, he felt certain the Miller boys were out there, watching the sheriff's office. The sensation of being followed had not left him even after he closed the door behind him. He did, however, go to the locked jail cell to inspect his handiwork. Under a thin blanket, Straw filled a shirt and made the semblance of a thin body under it. Wisps of hair taken from the tail of a palomino at the livery stable appeared in the near dark as dirty blonde hair, but in reality, it covered a melon. On the floor near the cell's cot lay a covered tray, as though waiting for the occupant to wake up and eat. It held a pitcher of poppy-laced water, cold meat and a loaf of bread. 
Mrs. Maple had added more of the herb to the bread with the hopes of setting Kevin and Ian to sleep once they ate it. Returning to the office, Tyler set the keys to the cells on the desk by the lantern, then paced out his escape plan. If the boys started shooting at him from inside the cell, a fast duck around the door put not just a wall but a heavy oak cabinet between the bullets and himself. If Johnson stays out here on watch, I could be in trouble. He muttered to himself, trying to plan out every possible scenario. All depends on how badly he got hurt today. Tyler suspected he was too badly injured to ride to Dennis's rescue. He knew his shot caught the man in the upper back. Between that and his busted ribs from a few days past, Tyler doubted he could ride. Surely, he had gone into hiding, waiting for the boys to return and care for him. Or so, Tyler hoped. Johnson was a wild card in this particular game. He went over in his head the signals Harold and the others would pass him once the Millers were spotted. The office windows were wide open, and Harold had hidden himself on the roof. Various nightbird calls would travel from man to man, with Harold giving the soft call of an owl once the Millers were spotted. He had chosen his own hiding spot. Under Victor's desk. Seating himself, Tyler turned over and over in his head everything he could think of that might go wrong. He had his rifle leaning against the wall next to him, extra shells at hand, a six-gun in the desk drawer. Men were outside ready to jump in and help him should he need it. He just hoped none of them got killed this night, himself included. More than an hour passed with nothing at all happening. Tyler yawned, rubbed his shoulder where it still ached and realized the boys might not show up until dawn. It'll be a long night if that happens. He jerked into full alertness at the quiet hoot of an owl. Taking his rifle and the revolver from the drawer, he jacked a shell into the chamber of the rifle. Ducking under the desk, where there was just room enough for him to crouch, his head down, he listened intently. For a long while, he heard nothing at all. He began to think he hadn't heard Harold at all, but a real hunting owl passing nearby. Then he stiffened. The door creaked open with a faint scream. He heard tense breathing, as though the person was in mortal fear. Then soft steps entered the sheriff's office. Where is he? The voice was quiet, a boy's voice. And one that trembled clearly. He thought he recognized the voice as Ian's. Tyler tensed, himself, waiting for them to walk past him to the cells beyond the far door. Are there two of them or three? From the sounds of the footsteps, he couldn't be certain of how many were there. Maybe in the outhouse. Said another voice. This one was deeper, more masculine, an adult. Tyler didn't think it belonged to Johnson, however, and suspected it to be the older boy, Kevin's. Maybe he's sleeping in one of the cells. The voice added. He must be around someplace, the keys are here. Then let's get Dennis before he comes back. If he's back there, we'll have to kill him. Tyler listened to a faint whine, the cry of a frightened boy. We can't kill him, he's a deputy. We'll hang. You can't hang what you can't catch. Now quit your whining, Ian. Listening to the faint steps past the desk and walk to the back of the office, Tyler heard that door open. Bracing himself, he waited for the jangle of keys on the cell door. Dennis. Kevin called out softly. Wake up. He ain't waking up. Ian said, his voice still high-pitched, near tears. Did they do something to him? No. He's just a hard sleeper. The keys jangled in the cell lock. Tyler crept out from under the desk, stepping lightly yet quickly toward the jail portion of the office. Peeking through the crack between the door and the jam, he saw both boys with their backs to him as they fumbled to find the right key to the cell. Hiding behind the door, he listened intently as the hinges on the cell screeched as it opened. Dennis said the tall boy. Wake up. Just as Kevin Miller stepped inside to bend over the dummy on the cot, Tyler lunged. Shoving Ian hard, he slammed the younger boy into the older, sending them both into a tangle on the cot. Grabbing hold of the cell door, he swung it shut with a clang and grabbed the keys from the lock. Roaring, Kevin staggered up, his rifle in his hand, throwing Ian to the floor. 
He didn't bother to aim it but fired at Tyler straight from his hip. Luckily, his shot hit the wall inches to Tyler's right, but he was correcting his aim. Moving faster than he ever had in his life, Tyler bolted through the door, keys and rifle in his hands, and threw himself to the floor, rolling. He lost his grip on his gun. Kevin's rifle shot blasted through the wall and the oak cabinet both, sending shards of wood in all directions. Still down, Tyler covered his head as the boy in the cell continued to shoot, yelling and screaming for all he was worth. Wood continued to rain down on his body, but the shots went well overhead, at man height. At last, the rifle emptied, but Tyler had no illusions that the kid didn't have extra ammunition. The boy continued to yell, Ian screaming and crying, and Tyler started to get up, to scramble out through the front door as Kevin reloaded. He got as far as his knees when a solid kick to his ribs flattened him again, taking his breath. Rolling onto his back, gasping and coughing, a searing pain coursing through his torso, Tyler stared up into the barrel of a gun. Harvey Johnson's leering face stood behind it. He froze. Johnson pulled the hammer back on the revolver. Tyler knew that in an instant, he would be dead. Johnson took a moment to sneer. Engine lover. Tyler twisted to the side a fraction before Johnson pulled the trigger. The gun went off. Wood splinters from the floor burst into Tyler's eyes. He didn't wait for Johnson to correct his aim and try again. Lashing out with his legs, he struck Johnson across the ankles, knocking him to the floor. Pouncing like a cat onto its prey, Tyler scrambled to his hands and knees, then landed on Johnson. Having fallen onto his back, Johnson snarled silently, his face twisted with hate as Tyler went for his gun hand. He was a fraction too late. Johnson swung his revolver and cracked Tyler across his left eye, sending him reeling backward. Falling, blinded by pain and blood, Tyler heard men shouting and the thudding of feet on the roof. Holding his hand to his eye, he tried to get to his feet but only succeeded in rising to his knees. Johnson also heard the shouts, the sounds of running feet, and got up faster than Tyler. Not bothering to take aim and shoot Tyler while Tyler knelt helplessly, he instead ran staggering out the door to vanish from Tyler's sight. Stumbling and holding the heel of his hand to his bleeding eye, Tyler heard the sound of hoofbeats, a gunshot and a few more yells. Trying to find his rifle while half-blind, Tyler jerked in shock at the feel of hands on his body. You better sit down before you fall down, Charlene said. Gawking, Tyler removed his hand to stare down at her, her arm around his waist as she tried to guide him to the chair. His vision had doubled, and he saw two of her. Yells and cries still shrieked from the jail cell behind them, offering him more confusion. What? He began. How? Don't try to talk yet. She ordered, plucking a laced handkerchief from her dress pocket and pressing it to his bleeding head. At that moment, Harold rushed in the door to skid to a shocking halt. What? He began. Josiah ran inside, and within moments, the small office was filled with the men Tyler had assisting him. Worried that Kevin might begin shooting through the wall again, Tyler hustled them, and Charlene, out the door and into the dark street. He still held her cloth to his brow, waving his hand back at the jail. Can't risk him hitting y'all if he starts to shoot again. Tyler said, wishing he could sink to the muddy road and lie down. What in damnation are you doing here, girl? Harold demanded, staring hard at Charlene. I had to see what was going on. Charlene replied, not at all intimidated. I was worried. Tyler gaped, his jaw slack. What? I know you told me not to. She went on, plucking the kerchief from his brow to examine his latest wound. I wanted to protect you if I could but it seems that wasn't necessary. Tyler walked on stiff legs to peer into the open door of the office, trying to figure out where she came from. How did you get in there? He asked. Yes, young lady. Harold crossed his arms over his chest, glowering at Charlene. How did you get here? I walked, silly men. She gazed around at the circle of armed men staring at her, unperturbed. 
After Tyler headed here, I followed him, then came in the back door and hid in the closet when he wasn't looking. I heard Johnson's voice and felt torn between staying or running out to help you. Charlene glanced away. I'm sorry I didn't. You did right to stay in there. Tyler replied softly. He could have gunned you down easily. We never saw him come in. Harold admitted, now abashed. I confess that once the Miller boys went inside, I quit watching, thinking Johnson stayed behind. I never thought anyone else would follow. Another man raised his hand. I apologize, deputy. He got by me, somehow. He got by us all. Josiah said, his big head shaking in sorrow. It's our fault, Tyler. We were supposed to have your back. Tyler raised a faint grin. It all worked out, gentlemen. I'm alive. And we have all three Millers in custody. We heard the shooting, and we're on our way to you. Harold said, gazing inside the office as Tyler had done. Glad to know you were faster than the kid. Only barely. Tyler admitted. I hit the floor, and his shots made a mess of Victor's office instead of me. I hope he's not mad. Well, he is mad. Madder than hell, to be exact. Tyler and Charlene jerked around to see Victor hobbling on his crotches toward them. Even in the near dark, Tyler recognized Victor's furious expression. Hey, now, I told you the plan, and you went along with it. He protested. Everything except her nearly getting herself shot up. Victor snapped, scowling at Charlene. That closet she hid herself in ain't any kind of cover. That kid in there could have blown her to bits. Then what would I tell her mother? Well, he didn't. Charlene retorted hotly. And you need to be resting. How in the tarnation can I rest with all this gold darn shooting going on? Y'all about woke up the entire town. Tyler gazed down the street. Sure enough, lanterns burned, lighting the folks who had been woken in the dark by screams and gunshots, all walking down the street toward them. I'll handle this. Harold muttered, heading toward them, his rifle in his hand. I reckon I'll have a chat with the folks from this way. Josiah said with a sigh. Walking away, he strode in the opposite direction to meet with the throng that came up from the other part of town. Tyler, Charlene stuck to his side like a burr, approached the door to the sheriff's office to listen. He heard what sounded like sobs, and a deeper voice cursing. Yet, no guns fired from within its depths. I wonder if he's out of ammunition. He said, his tone soft. Maybe he is. Charlene replied, her head tilted as she, too, listened to the sounds. He could have kept on firing and didn't. Get back here. Victor demanded. I ain't done scolding you. Tyler, Charlene's arm still around his waist, went back to the others and stared into Victor's rage. Stop it now, Vic. He said, growing irritated in his pain. She wasn't supposed to be here, but I sure am not going to complain about it. She may have more guts than brains, but I tend to like that sort of thing in a woman. Charlene frowned and poked him in the ribs. I have plenty of brains, you cow chaser. Insult me again and see what happens. Tyler, grinning, hugged her tightly under one arm. I can't wait to see what happens. Victor finally traded his scowl for a wry grin. Yeah, she always did tend to act before she thought things through. Seems to believe she's invincible or some such. Gentlemen. Charlene retorted, her hands on her hips. I am here. You can talk to me. All right. Victor said, hopping around on his crutches. Since no one got themselves killed, I'm going home. I do believe I was commanded to rest. By some high-handed female, if you can believe it. Muttering under his breath, Victor hopped down the alley that led to his house and disappeared into the dark. The other men shook Tyler's hand, tipped their hats to Charlene, and also spoke of going home to their families. They dispersed, Tyler watching them go. After they left, 
and the townsfolk also went their separate ways, Harold and Josiah returned. Tyler gazed at the open door to the sheriff's office thoughtfully. I'm just going back in there and get the keys to the cells. In case Johnson comes back. Before Charlene or any of the others objected, he walked cautiously inside, listening for any sounds from the occupants. He heard nothing save soft crying from Ian. Plucking the keys from the floor, as well as the revolver from the desk drawer, he went back outside. Anyone know where their horses are? He asked. Josiah pointed. Right there. The stolen animals from the bar H. With Charlene, Harold and Josiah with him, he went to the horses. Examining them, he discovered the reason why there were no more shots fired from inside the jail cell. Ammunition belts hung from the saddle horn of one while a revolver, still in its holster, hung from the other. So, he is empty. Tyler said with a sigh. He can't shoot the cell lock and escape that way. Ian wasn't even armed, poor kid. We'll get these animals back to their owners. Harold said. I'll hold on to everything for now. He untied the horse's reins from the rail. I reckon I'll stand guard on the jail. Josiah said with a grin at Tyler. You get yourself fixed up. He's going home to a well-earned tongue lashing for my mother. Charlene said, her arm through Tyler's. One he won't soon forget. Tyler sighed but grinned in the dark as Charlene led him down the dark, muddy street. That was the second time she referred to her home as his, and he certainly liked the implication. Her arm never left his waist as they walked, and when Harold peeled away with a wish for them to have a good night, taking the horses with him, her hand reached across his stomach to take his within it. I'm so glad you're all right. She said as they walked. He grinned down at her. I'm so glad you're here, even if you don't listen to what is sensible. Sensible is in the eye of the beholder. Once Olivia discovered Charlene had gone to the sheriff's office, and that she was in the middle of a shootout, Tyler wasn't the only one who received a serious tongue lashing. As Tosahui looked on in wide-eyed astonishment, Olivia alternately wept and railed at her daughter. Tyler sat in an armchair, dabbing at the cut over his left eye with a bloody handkerchief, his head pounding. What am I going to do with you? Olivia cried, tears streaming down her face. What will happen to me if you get killed? Charlene stared at the floor, her hands clenched around the folds of her skirts. I'm sorry, mother. I had to help. You had to help. Olivia snapped. You had to help nearly get yourself killed. Storming away, weeping, Olivia went to her room and slammed the door behind her. Chapter 27 Panic leapt down Aaron's throat. I can't lose another brother. I just can't. What do you mean? Just that. George replied, turning his gaze back to Elmer. I wanted him to drink some water, he needs it, but he won't wake up. Squatting on his heels beside Elmer, Aaron rested his hand on his brother's brow. He's got a fever. Bad one. I know. His fingers at Elmer's throat found his pulse, slow and weak, but steady. Keep cooling his face and chest. Aaron said, standing. If we can get his fever down, he'll wake up. George grabbed his canteen and trotted to the stream, filling it with nearly cold water. Returning, he dribbled it on Elmer's face, throat and chest as Aaron went to his saddlebags to pull out the bottle of whiskey and the remains of the shirt they used to bandage Elmer's wound with. Kneeling again, he pulled the serape up, and removed the bloody bandage. Soaking the wound in the whiskey, Aaron observed the swelling around the wound. It's getting infected. Help me roll him over. Removing the crusty bandage from the wound on his back, Aaron packed it with a clean cloth, then they rolled Elmer onto his back again, his weight holding the packing in place. He bandaged Elmer's front wound again as George continued to bathe Elmer in cool water. If we keep his wounds clean, he'll make it. Aaron said, trying to reassure himself as well as George. George nodded. I know. Dusk fell and with it went the temperature. 
the wind picked up and along it drifted the distant sound of thunder. Not again. George groaned. Keep quiet. Aaron grumbled. Maybe this one won't be as bad. At least, it's cooling us off. After eating the soup George brewed, they set some aside for Elmer in case he woke. His fever had diminished a little, giving Aaron new hope. We have to build a shelter of sorts for him. He told George. We can't let him get soaked if we get rain. With oilskins they hadn't used since they left the north and slender willow branches, Aaron and George created a makeshift shelter over Elmer, draping the heavy oilskins across the bent wood. Though his boots stuck out at the end, Aaron didn't worry too much about that. The rest of his brother was protected, and most of all his wounds would remain dry. Thunder cracked close by, lightning lighting up the darkness. It did indeed rain, but not hard enough to flood the stream over its banks. Water dripped from Aaron's hat despite the sheltering willows, yet he found the wet quite refreshing after the day's fierce heat. The storm passed quickly, leaving behind a sweet-smelling breeze and a much cooler night. Checking on Elmer, he found his brother weak, but awake. Aaron grinned. Hey, good to see you. You had us plenty worried. Water, please, sure. Aaron crouched under the shelter to hold a canteen to his brother's dry lips, letting him swallow until Elmer finally shook his head, having drunk enough. Setting the canteen aside, Aaron said. George made a soup for dinner. You need to eat some of it. Keep your strength up. George brought over the soup he kept warm beside the fire, offering Elmer a wry grin. You're gonna be just fine. After Aaron spoon-fed Elmer the last of the soup, he brushed his fingers over his brother's brow. Fever is still there, just not as bad. Closing his eyes, Elmer rested his head back against the saddlebag George placed there as a pillow and went back to sleep. George smacked Aaron on the shoulder. Told you. He's gonna be fine. Four days later, Elmer's wounds had healed enough to continue travel, and Aaron set an easy pace with frequent stops for rest. Skirting around towns, they lived off their supplies and whatever game they killed. George's quick gun brought down a lean jackrabbit, which he later turned into a stew. Still, their supplies dwindled, and Aaron knew they needed to venture into a town for more. In their camp that night, Aaron handed George some cash from their latest robbery. You're the least known among us. He said. San Anton is only a few miles away. I. In the morning, you ride into town and get us salt, flour, beans, coffee, whiskey and whatever else we need. Elmer and I will stay here. He needs the rest, anyway. George nodded. Will do. Shortly after dawn the next morning, George rode toward San Antonio, leaving Aaron and Elmer to nap in the shade of a group of cedar trees. Elmer still unable to use his right arm, slept soundly all morning, woke long enough to eat and slept through the afternoon. Aaron, however, dozed through the morning and kept a watch for George. As the afternoon passed the hottest part of the day, he grew increasingly uneasy. Pacing their small camp, he muttered, he should have been back by now. Riding to the town might have taken two hours at most. Getting supplies less than an hour, then two riding back. George had now been gone for going on seven hours. Aaron, still paced, sweating and fretting about what was keeping him. If he stopped to gamble in a saloon, I'm going to kill him. George wouldn't do that. Elmer said. Aaron spun around, finding Elmer awake and sitting beside the dying fire Aaron hadn't kept fed with wood. You sure about that? His arm still in its makeshift sling, Elmer nodded. He's not that irresponsible, Aaron. He knows that to linger in a town is dangerous after what happened to Franklin. You don't think he got caught, do you? Aaron's mouth went dry at the thought. No, I can't lose any more brothers. He muttered, pacing. He couldn't have gotten caught. He's the least known among us. We have to consider that possibility. Elmer said, his tone soft or he was killed. No, no, no. Aaron shook his head fiercely. No, he can't be dead. He's alive, 
he has to be. Then he need to ride into town and find him. His feelings of rage and helplessness rising, Aaron paced in furious circles. If they caught him, we'll bust him out. He declared. I'll kill anyone who gets between me and him. I swear it, I'll kill anyone. You need to calm down, Aaron. Don't tell me what to do. Aaron screamed, spittle flying from his mouth. Do you hear me? I am the leader here, I am the oldest, and you don't tell me what to do. His nerves frazzled, Aaron felt himself coming apart. His rage at Franklin and Benji's deaths had increased to such levels he hardly recognized himself anymore. When Elmer got shot, Aaron suspected that had Elmer died, he would have gone completely and utterly insane. His fear of losing either one of his surviving brothers sent him perilously close to the edge. We're going after him. Aaron snapped, heading to the horses to saddle them. Best we wait until after dark. Elmer advised, his tone calm. Aaron stopped short. If they rode now, it would still be full light when they reached San Antonio. Elmer was correct. They needed to wait. Fine, he retorted, spinning around. We wait. Though he couldn't sit at his ease, Aaron continued to pace restlessly, watching the dark hills around them for any sign of George returning. He might still come back. He might. When he did, Aaron planned to yell himself hoarse at George for scaring him so badly. George didn't come. Aaron paced with increasing energy and fury, pausing to watch the hills every few minutes or so. He noticed that Elmer didn't try to calm him down or console him with reassuring words he didn't truly mean. That's smart of him. Aaron knew he would not be able to control his fury, and would lash out at Elmer, potentially saying something they both would regret. Saddle the horses, Aaron. Aaron tossed him a glare for daring to tell Aaron what to do but stalked across the camp to where the horses were tethered and started to saddle them. The occupation soothed his rage to a small degree, and by the time all four were ready, he had begun to think clearly again. Without the use of his right arm, Elmer needed help to mount. Aaron held his horse near a tall stump Elmer used to climb on and swing into the saddle. He nodded his thanks to Aaron, then started toward San Antonio at a walk, leaving Aaron to lead both spear horses. When Aaron caught up to him, Elmer pushed his horse into a lope, then caught Aaron's eye. I'll never be able to use this arm again. He said. The last of Aaron's anger drained away in shock. You don't know that. I do. My wounds are healing, but the bullet did too much damage inside. I can only lift it a few inches. But you're not even halfway healed yet. I know what I know, Aaron. Elmer snapped. I'm useless now, a cripple. I should have died. I wish I had. The words you don't know for sure rose to Aaron's lips and hovered there. In the end, he didn't say them. I'll take care of you. He said simply. No matter what it takes, I'll look after you. Elmer didn't answer but stared straight through his horse's ears. San Antonio was a lively town after dark. Music and dancing filled many of the side streets, saloons spilling their customers out to drink and laugh on the sidewalks. Ladies of the night took customers up the stairs to the rooms above. Lamps lit the night, making it harder for Aaron and Elmer to hide their faces. There's a jail just up yonder. Elmer muttered from the side of his mouth. If I remember right, federal marshals and Texas rangers spend time there. Aaron bit off a few choice words. If he's inside, how will we get him out? Don't know until we see it for ourselves. A block from the jail, Aaron and Elmer reined in at the hitching post in front of a hotel, then dismounted to tie all four horses up to it. Keeping away from the lamps on the posts, they walked in single file up the street and ducked down an alley that ran between the jail and another structure. In the dark, they sped up, their boots making almost no sound on the packed dirt. Holding his hand up in front of Elmer's face to stop him, Aaron then held his forefinger to his lips. Leaving Elmer to stand silent, waiting, Aaron crept toward a lit window in the jail. It was almost over his head. Exploring the ground in the alley, he found a couple of old bricks, set them under the window, then stood on them. 
he found the window opened onto a long single jail cell. A few men lay on the bunks within them, two others sat on them, their heads in their hands. One of the prisoners had bright red hair and rubbed his face wearily. It was George. Chapter 28 Aaron hustled Elmer away from the jail. He's in there. He hissed when they were clear from any potential eavesdroppers or lawmen. Is he all right? Elmer asked. Yeah, he looked like it. How are we going to get him out? Elmer rubbed his chin. Were there others in there? Yeah. Did you see any marshals or deputies? No. The window just looked in on the cells. We have to find out how many marshals are in there. Elmer said. Let's get back to the horses. They left the alley as quietly as they went in and stopped in front of the hotel, untying their horses' reins. Aaron grabbed Elmer's healthy arm and turned him, making a few steps toward the hotel door as though about to enter. What? Elmer whispered. Two marshals just rode by. When they were gone, Aaron and Elmer stepped back to their mounts. This place is crawling with him. Aaron muttered. That'll make it harder to get him out. Elmer commented. Lacing his fingers together, Aaron boosted Elmer into his saddle. Mounting his own and leading the spares, Aaron walked down the street, Elmer riding behind him. Not wanting to attract attention by going faster, despite the nervous itch that crawled up and down his spine, Aaron craved to gallop and get out of this town. PSSD Aaron Stop Obeying Elmer, Aaron halted the horses and turned in his saddle, impatient. What? Elmer pointed to a drunk lying passed out on the sidewalk not far from the edge of town and safety. Grab his hat and his clothes. What for? Aaron demanded in a loud whisper. I have an idea. Just do it. Dismounting, leading the horses in a dark area away from the lights and the noise, Aaron grabbed the man's broad-brimmed straw hat and handed it up to Elmer. Now his clothes. Aaron took a whiff and wrinkled his nose. They reek. Elmer's grin flashed in the faint light. Exactly. Rolling the drunk back and forth, trying to hold his breath, Aaron stripped him of his overalls and his shirt, and left him laying on the sidewalk in his stained long underwear. I hope you have a good reason for this. Aaron grumbled, stuffing the foul-smelling clothes in his saddle bags. I do. Mount up, let's go. Riding a short way out of town, Aaron and Elmer reined in at a small creek and dismounted. It'll work. Elmer said after another of Aaron's protests, sliding down, wincing, from his saddle. You better hope it does, or you're next to get tossed in there. Aaron replied crossly. I can't get you both out by myself. Just do what I say, all right? In the deepest hours of the night, when the world slept, Aaron and Elmer rode back into San Antonio. The lamps had burned down into nothing, the saloon stood silent, houses lay dark as their occupants streamed. Aaron tried to cover his nose with his sleeve, turned his face away from Elmer, who rode upwind of him. He dared not speak, even in a whisper, to demand Elmer ride back a few steps. Dismounting in an alley, they left the horses to stand, then strode quietly down toward the jail. It took them a few wrong turns, but they eventually found the barn where the federal marshals stabled their horses. Nearly a dozen mounts stirred restlessly, eyeing the strangers, but none of them whinnied or kicked the wall of a stall. Locating the saddle and bridles by feel, Aaron held each bridle up for Elmer to cut with his knife. Leaving them to fall into a pile, they cut the latigo straps on each saddle, then removed each cinch to toss in the pile of damage tack. Now out the window. Aaron whispered, gathering as much as he could into his arms. Throwing it all out into the muck heap behind the barn. It'll take them hours to get new tack. He muttered with a grin. Now we hit the livery stable. Elmer hissed, leading the way out of the barn. Once again, they slashed bridles and latigos, cut cinches to pieces, leaving the marshals no way to ride on the chase. They might commandeer citizens' horses. Aaron said as they left the livery. 
but even then they have to face argument if the owner doesn't let them take their animals. Now to find a poster with our faces on it. Elmer replied. They found one on the wall outside the jail where George slept oblivious of their rescue plans, and they quickly hid in the shadows as they hurried back to where they left their own horses. Finding a small dilapidated barn off the main street that appeared to have been abandoned, they hid their mounts inside it. Aaron took a stick of dynamite from Elmer's saddlebags, stuck a fuse in it, then put it in an inner pocket of his coat. Now we wait. He said. Dawn tinged the eastern horizon pink and purple, long rays from the coming sun striking the distant clouds. Elmer took the bottle of whiskey from his stolen overalls and poured a little down the front of his shirt. Do I still stink? He asked with a grin. Aaron eyed him sidelong and edged away from him. Like a dead skunk. Good. Life in San Antonio started early, and within an hour of the sun rising, the streets were busy, people hurrying on their business, women rushing to markets before others got there first. Elmer stuck out his hand. Good luck. See you soon. Aaron shook it. You, too. Taking the back alleys, Elmer headed back to the jail while Aaron crossed the street and walked more sedately down the side. He found his target. A wide open air market with fruits, vegetables, herbs, and spices that tended to attract women. It was also located not far from the jail, and Aaron could see everything clearly. Standing back from it, he watched people ignore him as they passed by. With satisfaction, he watched as several women gathered around it to inspect the goods and waited for Elmer to start. He didn't wait long. Elmer staggered out from behind the jail, the bottle of whiskey in one hand, the wanted poster in the other. Dirt and dust concealed his red hair, his unshaven face hid who he was. His potent odor prevented anyone from getting too close. Waving both in the air, he stumbled into the path of a federal marshal. I seen him. Elmer yelled, his voice high-pitched and piercing. I seen him. Go get him. People paused to look, to stare, to point. The marshal turned his face away as Elmer tried to get closer. Aaron Dawson. He shrieked, waving the poster and pointing at it. Down that way, I just seen him. The marshal went on point like a hound dog. Where, old man? That way. I seen him. I get the reward, don't I? I seen him, I did. Where's my reward? The marshal opened the jail and yelled something to those inside, but Aaron couldn't hear what it was. Instantly, Lawman roiled out of the jail, guns in hand and ran in the direction Elmer pointed. That was Aaron's cue. Stepping behind the women, he said loudly. If Aaron Dawson is in town, he's gonna attack women. He does that. He creeps into town and finds women in the night. Between the proclaimed Aaron Dawson sighting and his words, the women began to shriek. Like sheep before a storm, they scattered, running in all directions, yelling at the top of their lungs. Even as Elmer continued to yell that he saw Aaron Dawson, Aaron himself told people that the man, and his murdering brothers, had come to kill and slay. Men, as well as women, panicked, creating mass hysteria in the street. Ducking amid them, Aaron ran across to the jail and found the door open. No marshal remained inside to guard the prisoners. Running to the cells, pulling out his dynamite and a match, Aaron yelled. George. Aaron? Get back, cover yourselves. Aaron barked, lighting the stick of dynamite. George rolled under his cot, pulling his mattress down to shield him from the blast. Many others did the same as Aaron set the sizzling stick into the gate, then bolted from the room. The detonation hurtled pieces of metal, and wood and flames into the main office, smoke poured through the opening in the roof, the windows. George. Aaron yelled, coughing as he ran back into the cell area. Come on. We got to go. Prisoners fled past him through the shattered wall, escaping into the street. George scrambled out from under his cot coughing, grabbing Aaron by the arm. Where's Elmer? Outside. Go. Running with his brother and the rest of the former inmates, Aaron found Elmer just outside the blasted jail. 
The blast attracted their attention. He gasped, grabbing George's arm. It's chaos, but we got to get to the horses now. We don't want too many eyes on us. Retreating back down the alleys, Aaron led his brothers to the half-fallen barn, shoving the door open. Their horses blinked at the sudden bright daylight beaming into their eyes but didn't fuss as Aaron awkwardly tossed Elmer into his saddle. George mounted up and grabbed the fourth animal by the reins. They took mine. He groused. Don't know where he is. Don't matter. Aaron hissed. We ride. Keeping to the back alleys and streets, Aaron led the way westward out of town, passing behind the old Alamo Mission and the open-air markets in front of it. Behind them, he could still hear the shouts and yells of the near riot going on in the center of town. Those marshals are having a time of it. He said over his shoulder, grinning. Without gear, they can't chase us. As Elmer quickly told George how they sabotaged the tack and distracted the lawmen, George laughed out loud. You boys are geniuses. He crowed. We're not clear yet. Aaron warned, cautiously leading them across side streets until they crossed the town line and hit a hard gallop west. With constant glances back over his shoulder, Aaron saw no signs of a pursuit. He slowed their pace, spearing the horses in the rising heat. We need a place to hole up for a while. He said gazing around at the dark green hills around the region, west of San Antonio. I heard of a town. George said. It's not far from here. Quiet little place, mostly ranchers. It's in the hills, so there are plenty of places to hide. That sounds like a good place to go while we figure out our next move. Elmer said, rubbing his shoulder. I know I still need to rest up a bit. What's the name of this place? Aaron asked. Bandera. Chapter 29 By morning Olivia's weeping fit had passed, and she emerged from her bedroom pale but with a smile. She cooked breakfast with Charlene's help without explanation or apology, insisted Tyler eat with him, and shoved more food on Tosa Hui than he could possibly eat in one sitting. Tyler's head ached where Johnson's gun had split it open yet he could not find it in him to complain. After breakfast, Olivia insisted on clearing the dishes while chatting with Toh Sahui, so Tyler and Charlene had a few minutes before she needed to go to work. Taking her by the hand, he led her onto the front porch. I don't think I said thank you. He said, his voice low. Charlene grinned up at him. You didn't. I intend to rectify that right now. Bending. Tyler kissed her, parting her lips, pouring all his feelings into that single gesture of tenderness and love. Her arms climbed up to clasp his neck as his own held her tiny waist within them, holding her close. Of her own volition, Charlene stepped into his embrace, her own emotions flooding into him as though from a broken dam. Breaking from her, Tyler gazed down into her white hazel eyes, smiling a little. He rubbed his nose against hers. You know. I discovered something lately. He said dot her arm still around his neck, Charlene gazed back, slightly puzzled. What would that be? That I have fallen in love with you. At first, he thought he had made a mistake, had spoken too soon, for he felt her stiffen in his arms, her expression growing still. He cursed himself for not waiting until a more romantic moment presented itself and braced himself for her denial. She didn't love him in return. An instant later, her heart-shaped face lit with love and joy and happiness. It's about time you said so. She declared, trying to hide her grin. I was starting to think you really liked that awful Marsha Taylor. Tyler rubbed the side of his nose, his brows furrowed. Well. He drawled. She is awful pretty. Charlene's smile faded. Her draw matched his. Well, sir. If your taste runs to an empty-headed, conceited, flashy hussy, then by all means, court her. Tyler grinned, bending to gaze into her eyes. Fortunately, mine runs to smart-mouthed redheads who run toward danger instead of away from it. Her eyes widened. You actually know someone like that? Rubbing her nose with his own, 
he kissed her briefly. I do. And I'd like to walk her to her job at the general store, if she'd let me. She will. Charlene opened the door and called. I'm going to work, mother. Tyler heard Olivia's fainter voice reply. Do try to behave yourself, Charlene. Charlene rolled her eyes. Yes, mother. As they walked down the steps and through the yard gate, Charlene asked. How's your head? Sore. Tyler admitted. I can't seem to avoid getting my noggin busted open these days. Will you start the hunt for Johnson now? Perhaps. I'll have to fetch Dennis Miller out of the old jail first, put him in with his brothers, then consult with Victor on running him down. Consider places where he might hide. Don't go alone. Charlene said, taking his hand to squeeze it. That man is crazy, he might do anything. Tyler nodded. I won't. Opening the door to the apple tree, Tyler walked her in, finding Harold and Mrs. Mabel inside, already beginning preparations for receiving customers. Mrs. Mabel came around the counter at the sight of the stark bruise and slash over his eye, her lips pursed in consternation. Harold told me what happened. She exclaimed, peering up at his forehead. That awful Harvey Johnson nearly killed you. Uncomfortable under her scrutiny, Tyler fidgeted, his hat in his hand. He observed Charlene's amused smirk as she took her bonnet to the back room, and Harold shaken head. I'm fine, ma'am, really. He said, taking a step back. Uh, Harold, would you come with me to fetch Dennis from the old jail? Happy to. He replied with a small grin. I'll start saddling the horses, as I know you need to check on the others we caught last night. That I do. Tyler said, inching away from Mrs. Maple with a respectful nod in her direction. Ma'am. With relief, Tyler left the general store and headed down the street. The mud created by the storm had begun to dry, and he easily avoided the puddles that remained. Stepping into the sheriff's office, he found, not Josiah as he expected but Victor sitting behind the desk. Someone had done some sweeping and cleaned up the shattered wood, but the place still looked as though a gunfight had taken place there. What are you doing here? Tyler asked up Victor gazed around, his eyes wide. This is my office, ain't it? You're supposed to be resting. You mean like them boys in there? Victor's grin was feral. Old Josiah just walked in there and took the kid's rifle, easy as plucking an apple from a tree. They be sleeping like little angels. Grinning, Tyler walked back through the bullet-riddled door and observed Kevin and Ian Miller sound asleep on the narrow cot. Kevin lay on his back, snoring, while Ian curled up at one end with his head pillowed on his brother's shoulder. He returned to the front, pulling the cell keys from his pocket. Placing them on the desk, he said. I'm headed up to get Dennis from the old jail. He'll need to be fed, along with those two. I'll take care of it. Victor replied. You taking someone with you? Harold. Victor nodded. Good man. See you when you get back. Tyler found Harold awaiting in front of the store, his Pinto and Tyler's bay saddled and waiting. His rifle lay in its scabbard, and he checked his ammunition before mounting up. Have any idea where Johnson might hide? He asked as Harold also swung into his saddle. No idea. He replied. There are so many places, old mines, abandoned houses around these hills. Then I expect it'll be tough smoking him out. Sure will. Nearly an hour later. The heat not yet as fierce as it soon would be, Tyler and Harold rode into the tiny canyon where they had put Dennis in the old jail. Fishing out the key Victor had given him, Tyler hoped it would open the heavy steel gate. He saw the kid inside, leaning against the bars, watching them come. Harold suddenly drew rein. Wait. He said, raising his hand. Tyler found him staring at the ground and followed his eyes. Then he saw them. Hoof prints in the still damp earth. The storm had arrived after they put Dennis in the cell. Johnson! Tyler muttered. He's been here. 
those are fresh. Harold pulled his gun from its scabbard, gazing around at the ridge line above them. Not more than an hour old. Tyler yanked his rifle out, the hair on his neck standing at attention. He's here, watching us. Move, don't make a sitting target. Wheeling their horses, Tyler and Harold loped toward the entrance to the canyon and the cover of rocks and trees. Instantly, gunfire echoed through it, bullets ricocheting off the granite stones with shrill screams, burying themselves in mesquite trunks. Under cover of the huge blocks, Tyler reined in, dismounting. Did you see where he is? Harold swung down as well, tying his horse to a thick branch. No. Let's hope he sticks his head up. Creeping back into the canyon, listening to Dennis's yells to shoot them dead, Harvey, Tyler and Harold kept rocks and trees between them and Johnson, who no doubt fired upon them from above. He knew he'd come for him. Tyler said, peering out. Wait it. Kill us, then use the key to spring the boy. But where the hell is he? He'll show himself. Sure enough, long minutes later. Tyler saw Johnson peek around a tree above them, sighting down the barrel of a rifle. Unable to see his target, Johnson came out a little further, seeking Tyler and Harold. His gun turned this way and that, searching. Stealing himself, Tyler waited, holding his breath, hoping Johnson was foolish enough to expose a little more of his body. Keeping himself hidden behind the trunk of a thick mesquite, its branches concealing his rifle, Tyler aimed carefully up. Johnson, still trying to see them, took a tiny step out from behind his cover. Tyler fired. With a short cry, Johnson tumbled down from his perch to land with a dull thud on the ground in the canyon. Dennis screamed from inside the cell, yelling no, 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 no. Tyler swallowed hard. It had been a long time since he had killed a man. He never liked it but knew it sometimes had to happen in order to save others. Harold stood up his hand on Tyler's shoulder. Nice shot. He said, his tone wandering. Tyler also stood. Yeah. They found the horse Johnson had stolen hidden atop the canyon and brought it down to load Johnson's body over the saddle. After tying it down securely, Tyler and Harold walked to the cell in the defiant, yet silent Dennis. Tyler gazed in at him with sorrow. Your brothers are caught, kid, your friend there is dead. It's over. Dennis spat at Tyler's feet and didn't answer. With a sigh, Tyler unlocked the gate, feeling glad the key actually worked. He didn't want to go back to town to fetch the dynamite it would take to get the kid out. Dennis offered little fight, his hands still shackled, as Tyler put him onto his bay. Mounting up behind him, Harold leading the stolen horse, they rode back to town. Daydreaming about Tyler as she walked back to the store after her midday meal with Olivia and Tosahui, Charlene half smiled to herself. His declaration that morning that he was falling in love with her warmed her through and through. Though she had yet to speak the words aloud to Tyler, she knew she had fallen in love with him, too. I am so in love. She said under her breath as she reached the door to the apple tree. A horse snorting behind her caused her to turn. Tyler and Harold rode at a quiet walk toward the store, Harold leading a horse with a man's body draped across the saddle. Dennis sat in Tyler's saddle, with Tyler mounted on his bay's rump. Relief and joy filled her as the two men reined in beside her. It's over then. She breathed. Johnson set an ambush. Tyler replied, his tone weary. He didn't make it. As long as you're both all right. Charlene said, her eyes roving to Johnson's body. She ignored Dennis's malicious glare down at her, unperturbed. With the boys in custody, we can have peace once again. Dennis snarled a curse at her. Charlene set her hands on her hips, staring at him without any obvious reaction. After a long moment, Dennis dropped his eyes and turned his sullen face away. I'll take this fellow to the undertaker. Harold said clicking his tongue at his horse. Tyler slid down from the bay, his reins in his hand and stepped toward her. He smiled sadly. I had to shoot him. He said softly. I had no choice. If you think I'm going to blame you or judge you. 
Charlene replied, her voice just as quiet. Then you're wrong. You acted with the town's best interests in mind, and to save lives. You're the deputy. Johnson made his choices, and died by them. Tyler cupped her cheek in his hand. I love you. He whispered. Charlene reached up on her toes to kiss him lightly on his mouth. And I love you. Now that all this excitement is over, he said, smiling. Maybe I can step out with you proper. I think I might just let you. Good. Now I need to get my prisoner into a proper jail cell. I'll be back soon. Tyler tipped her a wink and a grin as he turned to lead the horse down the street toward the jail. Charlene watched them go, breathing in a deep sigh of happiness and contentment. Before heading into the store and returning to work, she observed three riders and four horses approaching from the east end of town, from the same direction Tyler and Harold had just ridden in from. Though strangers in town were rare enough to be a novelty, they did wander in from time to time. Suspecting they may need to stop in for supplies, Charlene went into the store and joined Jean behind the counter. Jean eyed her sidelong, a faint smile on her thin face. I saw that she said. Kissing Tyler Price in front of everybody in town. Charlene grinned as she began folding shirts to place on the shelf. It's what you wanted, isn't it? You all but pushed me into the man's arms. And it worked, didn't it? Jean gave her a quick hug. I'm so happy for you, dear. He's a good man and will stand by you through anything. We're not exactly engaged to be married. Charlene informed her. We're just... in love. Charlene stopped folding to gaze happily at Jean. Yes, we're in love. I can't believe it happened so fast. Because it was meant to be, dear. The bell over the door jingled as it opened, bringing Charlene's attention from Jean's smile to the customers walking in. Her pleasant greeting died in her throat at the sight of the three men entering the store. From the corner of her eye, she saw Jean's smile fade. Though the men merely gazed around curiously, Charlene's instincts screamed a warning. Though she had never met an outlaw in her life, she had no doubt at all that these three were just that. They looked tired and dirty, guns at their hips, all with mops of reddish hair that made her suspect they were related. The man in the rear of the trio had his right arm in a makeshift sling, all but rendering the revolver at his hip useless. The man in front approached the counter, making Charlene want to step back, away from him and put distance between them. He had the coldest eyes she had ever seen. He tipped his hat to her and Jean. Afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon. Jean replied, her voice steady. How can we help you, gentlemen? Though he spoke to Jean, the man's gaze stayed on Charlene. The other two stepped up to flank him also looking at her with appraisal and admiration. Standing her ground, Charlene kept her expression impassive, neutral, not letting them see how much she feared them and how much she wanted Tyler back in the store. We need supplies. The stranger said, coffee, flour, beans, salt, sugar. Yes, sir. Jean replied, writing it all down and adding up the prices. We have all that. Charlene. Will you go to the storeroom and start fetching what the gentlemen need? Charlene nodded. Yes. Of course. One of the other men's voice stopped her when she made to turn. You sure are a pretty little thing. He said, his voice as admiring as his eyes. That your name? Charlene? Charlene nodded, her mouth dry. The one who placed the order frowned, glancing from her to the other. Let her be, George he ordered. She needs to get the supplies we need. That'll be twelve dollars, sir. Jean said. Is there anything else you want? Before he answered, the bell over the door chimed. Glancing past the men, Charlene felt relief course through her, making her feel as limp as a wet rag. It was Tyler. And he had his rifle in his hand. The men also turned to view the newcomer. Tyler froze for an instant, his face growing pale with shock, his jaw slack. The men, too, half turned away from her, 
also went as still as statues. What she could see of the leader's face had darkened with rage in that brief instant of time, his brows lowering in fury. The man named George started to reach for his revolver when Tyler's rifle snapped down. You. The leader gritted out. Charlene had seen Tyler annoyed and irritated since she had met him but had begun to think he never got truly angry. His temperament seemed so easygoing, mild, humorous. None of those traits fit him now as he stared at the men, his gray eyes flat, his lip curled in a snarl. Dawson. Even his voice had changed into that of a very dangerous man, holding a thick growl within it. Real fear shot through Charlene. She edged carefully away, pushing Jean away from the three men. Jean let herself be pushed, also stepping aside, out of the way if they started shooting at one another. I'm going to kill you, Price. The first man grated, his hand hovering over his weapon. You got Benji killed. I arrested him for the murder of my fiancé. Tyler shot back. I didn't kill him. Charlene choked on a gasp. Tyler had a fiancé who was murdered? Her belly roiled in fear, her body trembling. Still, she continued to push Jean away, trying to inch toward the door, feeling Jean's body shaking in terror. Charlene cast around, seeking something, anything, she might use as a weapon, yet she saw nothing. He died with a bullet in his back when we sprang him from the prison you sent him to. Dawson yelled. It's your fault he was in there. You boys chose your own fates when you decided to rob banks and kill people. Tyler growled, stepping toward the men. You got him killed, Dawson, not me. If I could have, I would have killed Benji for what he did to Mary. She got caught in the crossfire, Price. Dawson roared. That weren't Benji's fault. If you hadn't robbed the bank in El Paso. Tyler retorted, keeping his rifle trained on the outlaws. There would be no shootout, and Mary would be alive. Charlene saw it. A sharp double-edged knife that Harold often used to cut open boxes and had forgotten to put away. Snatching it up, she held it against her wrist, hidden by her sleeve. Jean watched her conceal it, visibly shaking, her face pale. Still trying to move toward the door, Charlene kept her eyes on the trio. Instantly, Dawson drew his gun and fired at Tyler. His men scattered, also pulling guns as Tyler shot back, his bullet shattering the wood of the counter. Jacking the shell out, he pulled the trigger again as Dawson leapt back and over the counter, lunging for Charlene, yet his bullet still missed. Knowing she was trapped between Jean and the outlaw, Charlene shoved Jean hard toward the door. Jean ran at the same instant Dawson grabbed Charlene by the arm, yanking her close to him. The man named George tried to cover the injured outlaw, shielding him with his body and raising his revolver as Tyler, aiming his rifle from his hip, fired two quick rounds. Choked off cries told how they were both struck. The men collapsed on the floor, George's gun falling from his limp hand. Before they even finished dropping, Tyler had his rifle aimed at Dawson. Hidden behind Charlene, his gun pointed at her head, Dawson sneered. Do it, Price. Kill me, and the girl dies, too. Tyler lifted the gun from his hip to his shoulder, peering down the sight. I'll put a bullet between your eyes before you can pull the trigger. He said, his voice flat, his eyes behind the rifle as cold as Dawson's. Charlene knew he intended to shoot. If she didn't want to die alongside this outlaw, she had to move and fast. Twisting her body slightly, she lifted her right arm crossing it across her body, and slashed the knife across Dawson's gun hand. Caught by surprise at her sudden movement, he yelped as the blade cut across the tendons of his thumb and wrist. The gun went off. Deafened by the incredible explosion so close to her face, Charlene finished her body twist, and backhanded Dawson across his mouth with the knife. Then she dropped below the counter an instant before Tyler fired his rifle. The outlaw crashed backward into the tidy shelving, bringing the shelves and goods down with him as he collapsed on top of Charlene. She covered her head with her arms, the knife falling from her hand, as Dawson's heavy weight crushed her under it. Panic filled her as she floundered, fearing he was still alive and would yet shoot her in the head. Distantly, 
she heard Tyler scream her name. A thudding sound followed, then shirts, shelves and finally Dawson's body was flung from her. Charlene. Tyler gasped, nearly sobbing. Charlene. He pulled her up with him, holding her to his chest, his arms wrapped around her so tight she almost couldn't draw breath. Charlene, oh, Lord, he was going to kill you. Shaking, trembling, Charlene clung to him, tears of fear and reaction wetting his shirt. Tyler. She sobbed. Tyler. It's all right, sweetie, it's gonna be all right. She felt Tyler kiss the top of her head, murmuring soothing words in her ringing ears, stroking her back. She didn't know how long she hung on to him, but voices raised in shock and horror came to her as men filled the small store. What happened? yelled a man. Recognizing the voice as Harold's, Charlene finally lifted her face from Tyler's chest. Harold, a crying jean under his arm, gazed around at the dead men, the shattered store. Josiah and three others, all armed, stood near him, staring. The Dawson Gang Tyler replied simply. Even Charlene had heard of the notorious Dawson Gang, who romped through towns all across Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, and Arizona. Turning her head, she, too, stared at the bodies of the most dangerous outlaws to ride the West. Harold's face went slack. The Dawsons? Yeah. Tyler replied, his voice weary. Their brother Benji killed my fiancé in El Paso. He gazed down at Charlene, brushing a tendril of hair from her face. During a bank robbery, Mary was too close when the Dawsons burst from the bank, shooting. Benji and I fired at one another. I took him down with a bullet in his leg, the others rode off. I arrested him, and only then did I realize Mary had been shot. She was gone before I got to her. Tyler. Charlene whispered. I am so sorry. Were you the sheriff? Harold asked. Tyler shook his head, his eyes still on Charlene, caressing her cheeks. A bounty hunter. Seeing the pain and grief in his eyes, Charlene took his face in her hands. You did what you had to do, Tyler. You saved me, you saved Jean. And I love you for it. Two days later, Tyler, stripped to the waist, hammered shingles onto the roof of his house. Winton and his companion snoozed in the shade of the cedar trees. Taking a breather, he drank water from the pail he brought up with him, thinking of how he had run like a coward. After the dust of the Dawson gang's demise had settled, Victor notifying the federal marshals of their deaths, Tyler had escorted Charlene home to her mother. He had then left her there without a word and gone home to his ranch. She can't possibly want me now. A natural hunter, Tyler had killed men and been paid for it. True, he did bring some outlaws in alive and turned them over to justice. But there was blood on his hands, and Charlene should have no part of it. Yet, in trying to leave his bloody past behind him, he nearly got Charlene killed. It's best if I stay out of her life. He muttered, dumping cool water over his head and bare shoulders. She can do far better than me. In his love for her, he would leave her safely alone. Movement caught his attention and woke the Comanches. They stood, their rifles in their hands as Harold rode his pinto into the yard. Recognizing him, they relaxed, and sat back down, yawning. Tyler climbed down the ladder as Harold dismounted by the porch. Harold wasted no time. Scowling, he snapped, get back to town and tell that girl how you feel. Tyler stared at his burnt bunkhouse. She should find someone else. She doesn't want anyone else, you idiot, Harold roared. She loves you. Has been pining for you. Now must I knock you over the head and drag you back? Harold. Tyler began. I'm a killer. A bounty hunter. Harold corrected. And from what I hear a damn good one. Now saddle your horse and let's go. Defeated, thinking he would find the guts to tell Charlene to her face that she should not love him, that he would only bring grief down on her, Tyler reluctantly put on his shirt and saddled his horse. Waving to Wintenta, 
he followed Harold out of the yard and down his lane toward town. He found Charlene in the store, busy stocking the replaced shelves, the bullet holes in the counter not yet repaired. But the place still looked as neat and tidy as ever. Charlene turned as he and Harold walked in, giving him a cold stare from the ladder she stood upon. Come on. Harold called to Jean. These two children need to have a private chat without us interfering. Also giving him the icy shoulder as she passed him, Jean frowned darkly, and went out with Harold. As the door closed behind him, Tyler gazed up at Charlene. I'm sorry. He said simply. You're sorry? She asked, her voice tied as Charlene stepped down from the ladder. You take off with your tail between your legs and you're sorry? I'm sorry for involving you in my sordid life. Tyler replied, his tone even. I shouldn't have. You sound as though you planned for the Dawsons to ride in here with vengeance on their minds. Charlene stood in the middle of the floor, her hands on her hips, glaring at him. No, of course not. But I always knew my past would catch up with me someday. If I hadn't have fallen in love with you, you wouldn't have come close to being killed. Charlene stepped up close, staring into his eyes. You don't know that Tyler. You don't know that they still wouldn't have ridden in and shot the town up, and me with it. Ever think that because we fell in love that you were there to save my life? Tyler shunted his eyes away. Well, no. Perhaps you would have been at your secluded ranch while they rode in and shot us all. Charlene's hard glare softened. I know what you're trying to do. But you need to give me the choice. The choice to love me? Yes. He gazed into her huge hazel eyes. The choice to marry me? Charlene's face went still for a long moment before a silly grin etched its slow way across her mouth. Is that a marriage proposal, mister? It certainly is. Hope and happiness wormed its way into his heart as Charlene gazed up into his face, her grin increasing. Taking her in his arms, Tyler kissed her, her arms around his neck, moving his lips over hers. Well? He asked, his brow up. Breathless, Charlene gasped, I have to think about it. Tyler kissed her again, a long, loving, tender gesture that he poured into all his powerful emotions for her feeling her heart race within her chest. Releasing her lips but not her body, he stared into her wide hazel eyes. Now? Yes, she burst out. Keep doing that, and I'll marry you a hundred times over. Tyler chuckled, briefly kissing her again. You make it sound as though I'm blackmailing you into marriage. You are. By kissing me into submission. The door opened with its bell chiming musically, Harold and Jean stepping partway in. Oh, look. Harold marveled. They kissed and made up. Isn't that just sweet? Jean clapped her hands. I hope there's a wedding in our future. Are you marrying them? Harold asked, gazing down at her. I rather think three is a crowd. Tyler and Charlene laughed as the Maples began yet another husband-slash-wife argument. Gazing into one another's eyes Tyler nuzzled her nose with his own. I love you, the future Mrs. Price. And I love you, Mr. Former Bounty Hunter Price. More than anything. Epilogue Arguing with Jean over which cloth to purchase from the catalog for her wedding dress, Charlene glanced up from the counter as the front door opened. Her mouth dropped open in shock. Mother, what's wrong? Olivia, on her first venture from the house since the funerals of her husband and sons, wept as she walked in, her thin face swollen from her crying. Oh, Charlene. Olivia sobbed as Charlene ran around the counter to take her mother in her arms. Tosahui is going home. The Comanche are here to take him back with them. Holding Olivia close, Charlene tried not to laugh. Mother, mother. She murmured, rocking back and forth. That doesn't mean you're losing him. He loves you. He'll come back for a visit. But what if he doesn't? Olivia wailed. What if I never see him again? Come on. 
Charlene said firmly, steering Olivia back toward the door. Let's go talk to his father. Outside, she found the Comanche dismounting their horses, Tosahui sliding down from a black and white pinto, his splints gone. It had been four weeks since Tyler brought him into town, and while Charlene knew Tosahui shouldn't walk on it too much for a while longer, at least he could ride home. Looking further, she found Tyler had ridden down from his ranch with the Indians. Winton and Tosahui walked toward them, Tosahui limping, but with a big grin. Olivia. He said, taking her from Charlene and hugging her, Charlene had no idea the boy was so tall, thinking that perhaps he had grown under all the food Olivia stuffed down his throat. Thank you. I come back. I love. You. His English is improving. Tyler commented, standing beside Charlene. I will teach him your language. Winton said, his tone serious. It will be good for them to learn from one another. At last Olivia patted Tosahui's cheek. Now you rest that leg Tosahui. It won't be fully healed for another two to three weeks. And you eat. You are still far too skinny. As though he understood, Tosahui kissed her cheek. I will. Olivia. Limping away, he vaulted aboard his pony, gazing long at the woman who had cared for him. Charlene took Wintenta's hand. We want you to come back for our wedding. She said. You, Tosahui and your friends. Wintenta smiled. We will be honored. Mounting his horse, he led his son and his companions down the street toward the hills. Olivia sobbed into her kerchief, watching them go. Charlene put her arm around her shoulders. See? You aren't losing him, mother. Oh. What am I going to do? Olivia wept, still sobbing. With you getting married, I have nothing. Oh, yes, you have plenty to do. You are going to come inside and help me and Jean plan this wedding. With a smile for Tyler, Charlene led her mother into the store where she put Jean and Olivia into arguing over lace and satin, veils and flowers, Olivia blowing her nose into the handkerchief. Strolling back to Tyler, Charlene grinned, slipping her arm around his waist. Phew. She said, watching her mother and Jean. That was tougher than I thought it would be. Your mother needs purpose in her life. Tyler observed. She's lost without it. We'll have to think of something for her to do. I can think of a few things. Turning at the sound of Victor's voice coming through the still open door, Charlene and Tyler watched him limp across the threshold, then close it behind him. Should you be walking already? Charlene asked. Victor scowled. I ain't staying on crutches forever, young missy. I came with news for our Tyler here. What would that be? Tyler asked. I told you I'm not staying on as deputy. But you are still a bounty hunter, retired or not. Victor replied, taking the stool to sit on with a gust of breath. That means you get the reward money for them Dawson boys. Pert near ten thousand dollars. Charlene's jaw dropped. Ten thousand? Yup. Victor nodded. Them three were worth a lot, more if Franklin Dawson had been with them. No one seems to know what happened to him, though. No one's seen him. He must be dead. Tyler commented. The Dawsons would never split up. Victor agreed. The federal marshals wired back the same opinion. He was seen a few weeks back, then poof. Gone. And the cash and gold we found in their saddlebags will go back to the bank in Gonzales. By the way, you can keep them four horses. They're yours. We'll help you on that ranch. Tyler shrugged. I reckon I can always use them. Victor turned his gaze to Charlene. Now I have a question for you, Missy. Me? Charlene glanced at Tyler, then back to Victor. What sort of question? Yes, ma'am. I want your blessing to court your ma. Astounded, Charlene stared from Victor to her mother then recognized the look on both their faces when she caught them gazing at one another across the room. The very same look she shared with Tyler. 
too busy with her own love affair, she had obviously missed the signs of affection growing between Olivia and Victor. I'd be proud for you to pay court to my mother, Victor. Charlene said, impulsively hugging the sheriff. Hey, now. He squawked, patting her shoulder, obviously embarrassed. No need to get all emotional on me. Your ma is a fine woman, and I seem to have gotten a bit attached. Charlene kissed his cheek. So that's what you meant about keeping her busy. She said. Like I said. Victor admitted, stroking his mustache. I've grown rather fond of her. But I ain't going behind your back. No, ma'am. Tyler shook Victor's hand. Very happy for you, you old geezer. I ain't that old, boy. Victor flared. Don't you be calling me no geezer. Watching Olivia and Jean Bicker, Charlene asked absently. What will happen to the Miller boys now they've been tried and convicted? The prison will be coming to pick them up by next week. Victor replied. Kevin and Dennis will be there for a long while. Ian will go to a boy's farm. Maybe he'll learn some manners in there. He might. Tyler said quietly. If he's lucky. But the world is a hard place, and I fear he'll only grow as hard as it is. Is there any hope for the others? Charlene asked. They're just boys, they don't belong in prison. They'll come out as men. Tyler replied. And meaner than ever. Your man's right. Victor said. They'll be out someday, and then people better look to themselves. A month later, Tyler stood in front of the church, Victor and Harold beside him, as his glowing bride walked down the aisle to become his wife. Olivia, clad in a bright blue gown and glowing almost as much as her daughter, carried a bouquet of flowers to Charlene's right. To her left, also in bright blue, strode Jean. The small church, filled to capacity, also held seven tall Comanche warriors at the back, observing the ceremony that joined Tyler and Charlene in matrimony. While perhaps only Winton understood it, his friends smiled as they watched. And Tosahui stood on two solid legs beside his father. Speaking his vows, promising to love, honor and cherish his bride till death do them part, Tyler slid the small gold ring onto Charlene's finger. Behind her veil, he saw her brilliant smile, the faint flush of her cheeks. Then she spoke her own vows. To love, honor and obey him, Tyler wondered absently if Charlene fully grasped that part. Until death do them part. You may now kiss your bride. The preacher said to him. Grinning, Tyler lifted her veil, revealing her hazel eyes, her beautiful face. Bending, he kissed her tenderly, only half listening as the church exploded in applause. Both Victor and Harold bumped his back, forcing him to break away from her. Wife. He breathed. Husband. She answered, her smile of happiness lighting the entire church. Walking down the aisle, arm in arm with his wife, listening to the congratulations from the townspeople he had come to know, Tyler grinned, feeling as though he walked on air. A new life, a new ranch, a new wife. He didn't think things could ever be better for him. Outside the church, the crowd gathered, waiting for Charlene to throw her bouquet. Turning around so no one could accuse her of tossing it to someone in particular, Tyler watched as she threw it high and over her shoulder. Everyone turned to see where it would fall. Disappointed groans filled the air from those young women who attended the ceremony as Olivia Quinn found the flowers falling into her arms. I don't believe it. She said clearly over the applause of the crowd of well-wishers. I reckon we're next. Victor said, thumping Tyler on the back. Charlene laughed. Have you asked her yet? Planning on it. Victor said, gazing across the townsfolk at his new love, his heart shining in his eyes. Charlene kissed his cheek. I can't wait to start calling you father. Now you hold on there, young lady. Victor retorted, glaring. I ain't your pa and I ain't about to take his place. I just want to marry your ma. Well, you better go ask her. Charlene said, giving him a small shove. 
this is the perfect time. After accepting the congratulations of the guests, Tyler walked with his wife toward the buggy garbed in bright ribbons and bows, a single black horse hitched to it. Holding her hand to his mouth to kiss, Tyler asked, Are you ready to go home? Charlene smiled up at him. Home. It has such a nice ring to it. Our home. With the ranch next door up for sale. Tyler said, smiling, maybe we need to buy it. Make ourselves a real cattle ranch. I'd be happy with what you already have. She said, lifting herself up to kiss him. But if that's what you want, then that's what I want. He helped her up into the buggy's seat, piling her wedding train in with her, then climbed up himself. Picking up the reins, Tyler clucked to the horse, setting it into a quick trot up the street past the people still waving and yelling. They passed Victor, who cupped his hands around his mouth and shouted. She said yes, the end, extended epilogue. Six months later. This town needs you boy. Tyler eyed Victor sourly as he drank his beer in the saloon, sitting across the table from him. Outside, a cold drizzling rain fell, turning the street into a quagmire. Horses and people splashed through the muck, hurrying to get out of the weather. The town has done quite well without me before I came. He said. Victor stroked his mustache, his bright blue eyes penetrating. All right. I need you. I need your help, not every day, I'll say right up front. But I need a deputy I can count on. It's just part of the time, boy. Tyler sighed and gazed out into the dreary daylight. I have my ranch and Charlene to consider, Vic. I know. You live only a couple miles out of town. Bandera is growing, and that comes with more trouble. Victor leaned forward, his beer in his hand. You have the know-how that can help me. Just Friday and Saturday nights, Tyler, when this here saloon gets to brawling. All right. Tyler sat back in his chair. You sure know how to twist me around your finger. I don't have to twist hard. Victor grinned. Being a lawman is in your blood. Them marshals told me you were the best bounty hunter they'd ever seen. Tyler shook his head. It's been six months since we caught the Miller boys. Why haven't they come to get them? The wheels of justice turn slow sometimes. Victor replied, taking a gulp of his beer. It's been three since they were convicted. I know I'm sure sick of feeding them. But the marshals got in late yesterday. Want to meet them? Sure. Why not? The chilly December rain leaked down the neck of Tyler's heavy coat as he and Victor dashed through the mud to the sheriff's office. Outside it, stood a heavy enclosed wagon, steel bars over the windows, a team of four horses hitched to it. Tyler slowed a moment to take a closer look, remembering one similar that took Benji Dawson from El Paso to his prison. Wicked looking thing, ain't it? Victor asked. It is. It's sickening that it's taking boys this time around. The law is the law, boy. Victor said, opening the door to his office. Even kids have to abide by them. Five marshals clad in long black overcoats, black hats and silver stars pinned to their lapels stood inside the office, apparently waiting for Victor. Heavy shackles and chains were hanging from the hands of three of them. With a short smile, one stepped forward to shake Victor's hand. We're ready to take these prisoners off your hands now, Sheriff. Victor gestured toward Tyler. This here be Tyler Price, formerly a bounty hunter, now my deputy. This is Marshal Westbourne. Tyler shook his hand, recalling the man's name and reputation in his past life, but he'd never had the chance to meet him before. A real honor, Marshal. Westbourne grinned. No sir. The honor is mine to meet the man who brought down the Dawson gang. Your reputation was stellar even before that. I was happy enough at having caught Benji Dawson. Tyler replied with a small smile. I had retired from hunting to buy my ranch and run cattle. But they came here with evil intentions. Yes. 
Westbourne nodded soberly. That's what the sheriff told us. Even so, you took down three armed killers by yourself. That's no mean feat. If ever you want to quit ranching and become a marshal, you let me know. Sorry. Westbourne accepted it without arguing. Congratulations on your marriage, by the way. Sheriff Barker, we have a long way to go. Might we collect our prisoners and be on our way? You bet. Taking the cell keys, Victor led the way into the back where the jail cells were kept. Tyler leaned against the desk and folded his arms across his chest, listening to the sounds of the cells being unlocked, Ian Miller's crying, Kevin Miller's harsh cursing. Yet, he heard no noises of a struggle as the steel cuffs were clamped onto ankles and wrists. Shortly, the marshals led the boys out, dragging their chains. Kevin and Dennis carried defiant, stony expressions while Ian sobbed, tears running down his face. Tyler's heart wrenched in his chest to see him, knowing there was still hope for the kid. If life on the boys' farm didn't turn him into a hardened criminal. None of them met his eyes as the marshals filed out the door to load the Millers into the wagon. Once inside, they attached the chains to rings on the floor. Three marshals remained inside with him, rifles in their hands as Westbourne and one other climbed to the high seat and picked up the reins. Westbourne tipped his hat to Tyler and Victor gentlemen. Standing in the cold rain, the two watched the wagon rumble down the muddy street, those few townsfolk outside also watching it pass them by. You want to know what's really sad about them boys? Victor asked as the wagon vanished from sight. What? Their ma never came to see them. Victor gazed into Tyler's eyes. Not once. Standing behind her mother, braiding her fine hair into a tidy coif. Do you really love him, mother? Olivia smiled. He's a cranky old thing, that's for certain. But yes, I do love him. Turning on the stool she sat upon, she gazed into Charlene's eyes, her happy expression fading. I hope you don't think Victor is taking your father's place, dear. Of course not. Charlene embraced her, holding Olivia close to her bosom. All I want is for you to be happy, mother. No one can take father's place, or those of Dan or Russell. Victor will look after me. Mother. Charlene pushed her away, but still held on to her mother's arms, staring sternly into her eyes. You're not marrying him because he will take care of you, are you? If so, tell me and we'll call this wedding off. You are more than welcome to live with Tyler and me at the ranch. There's plenty of room. Olivia squeezed her hands together, avoiding Charlene's eyes. It's part of it, yes. I can't be a burden to you anymore. Mother, you dash. Olivia's finger over Charlene's lips cut her off. I can make my own decisions about this, Charlene. She said firmly. Yes, I do love Vic, and he loves me. We need each other. I can take care of him as much as he looks after me. Olivia smiled. We suit each other perfectly. Sitting back, Charlene offered her mother a wry grin. I just worry about you, mother. I know you do, dear, and I appreciate it. It's time for you to live your own life with your husband, start your own family. Charlene turned her mother around to complete the attractive coif in her hair. Tyler wants lots of children. That's so sweet, dear. With you and he expanding the ranch and buying more cattle, you'll need strong sons to help. We're also thinking of buying our old ranch, mother. Charlene told her, her voice quiet. It will be back in the family. I hope that will please you. Olivia turned around fast and seized hold of Charlene, her eyes wide. The bank never sold it? No. Never found a buyer. The manager all but fell at Tyler's feet with joy at his offer. You are happy about this, aren't you? Tears welled in Olivia's eyes. Yes. She swallowed hard, then smiled broadly, Yes, I am Charlene. I am very happy. 
Your father would be so proud of you. This time it was Charlene's turn to walk her mother down the aisle of the small church. The walk truly wasn't the true definition of the gait Charlene managed. Heavily pregnant, she knew she waddled down the center toward where Olivia's fiancé, Victor Barker, stood to marry her. Tyler stood up for him at the small wedding, while Charlene would be Olivia's matron of honor. Under Victor's loving attention, Olivia had blossomed, gaining back much needed weight, her cheeks rosy with happiness. Tosahui sat in the front row beside Jean and Harold, his English and understanding of white men's customs having expanded tremendously. As the ceremony continued, the preacher intoned the lecture of life, love and marriage, Charlene watched her mother's face. Joy as well as happiness filled it as Olivia listened to the holy man drone on. Charlene knew Olivia had adored her husband and had mourned him, and now deserved a second chance to love and be loved again. Though if Charlene had been forced to guess as to whom her mother fell in love with, Victor was the last one she might have suspected. But never once did she doubt the crusty man's adoration for Olivia. In many ways, they were perfect for each other. After the ceremony, Charlene stood with Tyler as Victor and Olivia spoke to the guests. I'm really happy for your mother. Tyler murmured in her ear. She won't grow old alone now. Charlene replied. Neither will Vic. Olivia will be good for him. Charlene suddenly felt the baby kick her in the spine. Oh. Instantly anxious, Tyler took her arm. Is it the baby? Yes. Your son has the strength of ten Comanche warriors. And is making himself be felt. Tyler guided her toward their buckboard wagon drawn by his gray mules. I think it's a daughter, and she is impatient for a wedding of her own. With Tyler helping her awkward body up to the seat, Charlene relaxed as the baby settled down. She rested her hands on her bulging stomach. Well, if she loves weddings, and I do believe she is a he, she won't be married for a long time. Tyler climbed up to the seat with her, taking a moment to gaze at the happy couple as they stepped into a buggy for the short journey to Victor's small house. It's a new start for more than just me, isn't it? He asked turning to kiss Charlene's lips. A new life for us, one beginning in your belly. And one over there for Vic and Olivia. Isn't it amazing? Charlene asked, following his gaze. A new life for many here. She took his hand. I am so glad you left your old life behind and wandered into mine Tyler. I love you. Tyler grinned down into her eyes. Me too. Little lady. On both counts. The end. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube.